Section 32 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 15, From the Kurdish Camp to Yuzgat. From the Kurdish encampment, my route leads over a low mountain spur by easy gradients and by a winding, unridable trail down into the valley of the eastern fork of the Dalija Irmak. The road improves as this valley is reached, and noon finds me the wonder and admiration of another Kurdish camp, where I remain a couple of hours in deference to the powers of the midday sun. One has no scruples about partaking of the hospitality of the nomad Kurds, for they are the wealthiest people in the country, their flocks covering the hills in many localities. They are, as a general thing, fairly well dressed, are cleaner in their cooking than the villagers, and hospitable to the last degree. Like the rest of us, however, they have their faults as well as their virtues. They are born freebooters, and in unsettled times when the Turkish government, being handicapped by weightier considerations, is compelled to relax its control over them, they seldom fail to respond promptly to their plundering instincts and make no end of trouble. They still retain their hospitableness, but after making a traveller their guest for the night, and allowing him to depart with everything he has, they will intercept him on the road and rob him. They have some objectionable habits, even in these peaceable times, which will better appear when we reach their own Kurdistan, where we shall doubtless have better opportunities for criticising them. Whatever their faults or virtues, I leave this camp hoping that the termination of the day may find me the guest of another sheikh for the night. An hour after leaving this camp, I pass through an area of vineyards, out of which people come running with as many grapes among them as would feed a dozen people. The road is rideable, and I hurry along to avoid their bother. Verily it would seem that I am being hounded down by retributive justice for sundry evil thoughts and impatient remarks, associated with my hungry experiences of early morning. Then I was wondering where the next mouthful of food was going to overtake me. This afternoon finds me pedalling determinedly to prevent being overtaken by it. The afternoon is hot, and with scarcely a breath of air moving, the little valley terminates in a region of barren, red hills, on which the sun glares fiercely. Some toughish climbing has to be accomplished in scaling a ridge, and then I emerge into an upland lava plateau, where the only vegetation is sun-dried weeds and thistles. Here a herd of camels are contentedly browsing, munching the dry, thorny herbage, with a satisfaction that is evident a mile away. From casual observations along the route, I am inclined to think a camel not far behind a goat in the depravity of its appetite. A camel will wander uneasily about over a green sword of moist, succulent grass, scanning his surroundings in search of giant thistles, frost-bitten tumbleweeds, tough, spriggy camel-thorns, and odds and ends of unpalatable vegetation generally. Of course, the ship of the desert never sinks to such total depravity as to hanker after old gum overshoes and circus posters, but if permitted to forage around human habitations for a few generations, I think they would eventually degenerate to the goat's disreputable level. The expression of utter astonishment that overspreads the angular countenance of the camels browsing near the roadside at my appearance is one of the most ludicrous sights imaginable. 
they seem quite intelligent enough to recognize in a wheelman and his steed something inexplicable and foreign to their country, and their look a timid inquiry seems ridiculously unsuited to their size and the general ungainliness of their appearance, producing a comical effect that is worth going miles to see. It is approaching sundown when, ascending a ridge overlooking another valley, I am gratified at seeing it occupied by several Kurdish camps, their clusters of black tents being a conspicuous feature of the landscape. With a fair prospect of hospitable quarters for the night before me, and there being no distinguishable signs of a road, I make my way across country toward one of the camps that seems to be nearest my proper course. I have arrived within a mile of my objective point, when I observe, at the base of a mountain about half the distance to my right, a large, white, two-storied building, the most pretentious structure by long odds that has been seen since leaving Angora. My curiosity is, of course, aroused concerning its probable character. It looks like a bit of civilization that has, in some unaccountable manner, found its way to a region where no other human habitations are visible, save the tents of wild tribesmen, and I at once shape my course toward it. It turns out to be a rock-salt mine or quarry that supplies the whole region for scores of miles around with salt, rock-salt being the only kind obtainable in the country. It was from this mine that the donkey party from whom I first obtained bread this morning fetched their loads. Here I am invited to remain overnight, and provided with a substantial supper the menu including boiled mutton with cucumbers for dessert. The managers and employees of the quarry make their cucumbers tasteful by rubbing the end with a piece of rock salt each time it is cut off or bitten, each person keeping a select little square for the purpose. The salt is sold at the mine, and owners of transportation facilities in the shape of pack animals make money by purchasing it here at six paras an oak, and selling it at a profit in distant towns. Two young men seem to have charge of transacting the business. One of them is inordinately inquisitive. He even wants to try and unstick the envelope containing a letter of introduction to Mr. Tiftik Gioglu's father in Yuzgat, and read it out of pure curiosity to see what it says and he offers me a lira for my Waterbury watch, notwithstanding its alafranga face, is beyond his Turkish comprehension. The loud, confident tone in which the Waterbury ticks impresses the natives very favourably toward it, and the fact of its not opening at the back like other timepieces creates the impression that it is a watch that never gets cranky and out of order, quite different from the ones they carry, since their curiosity leads them to be always fooling with the works. American clocks are found all through Asia Minor, fitted with oriental faces, and there is little doubt but the Waterbury, with its resonant tick, if similarly prepared, would find here a ready market. The other branch of the managerial staff is a specimen of humanity, particularly Asiatic-Turkish, a melancholy-faced, contemplative person who spends nearly the whole evening in gazing in silent wonder at me and the bicycle, now and then giving expression to his utter inability to understand how such things can possibly be by shaking his head and giving utterance to a peculiar clucking of astonishment. He has heard me mention, having come from Stamboul, which satisfies him to a certain extent, for, like a true Turk, he believes that at Stamboul all wonderful things originate, whether the bicycle was made there, or whether it originally came from somewhere else doesn't seem to enter into his speculations, 
the simple knowledge that I have come from Stamboul is all sufficient for him. So far as he is concerned, the bicycle is simply another wonder from Stamboul, another proof that the earthly paradise of the Mussulman world on the Bosphorus is all that he has been taught to believe it. When the contemplative young man ventures away from the dreamy realms of his own imaginations and from the society of his inmost thoughts, far enough to make a remark, it is to ask me something about Stamboul, but being naturally taciturn and retiring, and moreover anything but an adept in pantomimic language, he prefers mainly to draw his own conclusions in silence. He manages to make me understand, however, that he intends before long making a journey to see Stamboul for himself. Like many another Turk from the barren hills of the interior, he will visit the Ottoman capital. He will recite from the Koran under the glorious mosaic dome of St. Sophia, wander about that wonder of the Orient, the Stamboul Bazaar, gaze for hours on the matchless beauties of the Bosphorus, ride one of the steamboats, see the railway, the tramway, the sultan's palaces, and the shipping, and return to his native hills, thoroughly convinced that in all the world there is no place fit to be compared with Stamboul, no place so full of wonders, no place so beautiful, and wondering how even the land of the Karaguzkis, the material paradise of the Mohammedans, can possibly be more lovely. The contemplative young man is tall and slender, has large, dreamy, black eyes, a downy upper lip, a melancholy cast of countenance, and wears a long print wrapper of neat dotted pattern, gathered at the waist with a girdle a la dressing gown. The inquisitive partner makes me up a comfortable bed of quilts on the divan of a large room, which is also occupied by several salt traders remaining overnight, and into which their own small private apartments open. A few minutes after they have retired to their respective rooms, the contemplative young man reappears with silent tread, and with a scornful glance at my surroundings, both human and inanimate, gathers up my loose effects, and bids me bring bicycle and everything into his room. Here, I find, he has already prepared for my reception quite a downy couch, having contributed, among other comfortable things, his wolfskin overcoat. After seeing me comfortably established on a couch more appropriate to my importance as a person recently from Stamboul than the other, he takes a lingering look at the bicycle, shakes his head and clucks, and then extinguishes the light. Sunrise on the following morning finds me wheeling eastward from the salt quarry, over a trail well worn by salt caravans, to Yuzgat. The road leads for some distance down a grassy valley, covered with the flocks of the several Kurdish camps round about. The wild herdsmen come galloping from all directions across the valley toward me, their uncivilized garb and long swords giving them more the appearance of a ferocious gang of cutthroats advancing to the attack than shepherds. Hitherto nobody has seemed in any way inclined to attack me. I have almost wished somebody would undertake a little devilment of some kind, for the sake of livening things up a little and making my narrative more stirring. After venturing everything, I have so far nothing to tell but a story of being everywhere treated with the greatest consideration, and much of the time even petted. I have met armed men far away from any habitations, whose appearance was equal to our most ferocious conception of bashi bazooks, and merely from a disinclination to be bothered, perhaps being in a hurry at the time, have met their curious inquiries with imperious gestures to be gone, and have been guilty of really inconsiderate conduct on more than one occasion. 
but under no considerations have I yet found them guilty of anything worse than casting covetous glances at my effects. But there is an apparent churlishness of manner, and an overbearing demeanour, as of men chafing under the restraining influences that prevent them gratifying their natural freebooting instincts about these Kurdish herdsmen whom I encounter this morning, that forms quite a striking contrast to the almost childlike harmlessness and universal respect toward me observed in the disposition of the villagers. It requires no penetrating scrutiny of these fellows' countenances to ascertain that nothing could be more uncongenial to them than the state of affairs that prevents them stopping and looting me of everything I possess. A couple of them order me, quite imperatively, to make a detour from my road to avoid approaching too near their flock of sheep, and their general behaviour is pretty much as though seeking to draw me into a quarrel that would afford them an opportunity of plundering me. Continuing on the even tenor of my way, affecting a lofty unconsciousness of their existence, and wondering whether, in case of being molested, it would be advisable to use my Smith and Wesson in defending my effects, or taking the advice received in Constantinople, offer no resistance whatever, and trust to being able to recover them through the authorities, I finally emerge from their vicinity. Their behaviour simply confirms what I have previously understood of their character, that while they will invariably extend hospitable treatment to a stranger visiting their camps, like unreliable explosives they require to be handled quite gingerly when encountered on the road to prevent disagreeable consequences. Passing through a low, marshy district, peopled with solemn-looking storks and croaking frogs, I meet a young sheikh and his personal attendants returning from a morning's outing at their favourite sport of hawking. They carry their falcons about on small perches, fastened by the leg with a tiny chain. I try to induce them to make a flight, but for some reason or other they refuse. An Osmanli Turk would have accommodated me in a minute. Soon I arrive at another Kurdish camp, fording a stream in order to reach their tents, for I have not yet breakfasted, and I know full well that no better opportunity of obtaining one will be likely to turn up. Entering the nearest tent, I make no ceremony of calling for refreshments, knowing well enough that a heaping dish of pilau will be forthcoming, and that the hospitable Kurds will regard the ordering of it as the most natural thing in the world. The pilau is of rice, mutton, and green herbs, and is brought in a large pewter dish, and together with sheet bread and a bowl of excellent yaourt, is brought on a massive pewter tray, which has possibly belonged to the tribe for centuries. These tents are divided into several compartments, one end is a compartment where the men congregate in the daytime and the younger men sleep at night, and where guests are received and entertained. The central space is the commissary and female industrial department. The others are female and family sleeping places. Each compartment is partitioned off with a hanging carpet partition, light portable railing of small upright willow sticks bound closely together protects the central compartment from a horde of dogs hungrily nosing about the camp, and small coops of the same material are usually built inside as a further protection for bowls of milk, yaourt, butter, cheese, and cooked food. They also obtain fowls from the villages, which they keep cooped up in a similar manner until the hapless prisoners are required to fulfil their destiny in chicken pilau. The capacious covering over all is strongly woven goat's hair material of a black or smoky brown colour. In a wealthy tribe, the tent of their sheikh is often a capacious affair, twenty-five by one hundred feet, containing among other compartments stabling and hayroom for the sheikh's horses 
in winter. My breakfast is brought in from the culinary department by a young woman of most striking appearance, certainly not less than six feet in height. She is of slender, willowy build, and straight as an arrow. A wealth of auburn hair is surmounted by a small, gay-coloured turban. Her complexion is fairer than common among Kurdish women, and her features are the queenly features of a Juno. The eyes are brown and lustrous, and were the expression but of ordinary gentleness, the picture would be perfect. But they are the round, wild-looking orbs of a newly caged panther, Grimalkin eyes that would most assuredly turn green and luminous in the dark. Other women come to take a look at the stranger, gathering round and staring at me, while I eat, with all their eyes, and such eyes. I never before saw such an array of wild animal eyes. No, not even in the zoo. Many of them are magnificent types of womanhood in every other respect, tall, queenly, and symmetrically perfect. But the eyes, oh, those wild tigress eyes. Travellers have told queer, queer stories about bands of these wild-eyed Kurdish women waylaying and capturing them on the roads through Kurdistan and subjecting them to barbarous treatment. I have smiled and thought them merely travellers' tales, but I can see plain enough this morning that there was no improbability in the stories. For, from a dozen pair of female eyes, behold, there gleams not one single ray of tenderness. These women are capable of anything that tigresses are capable of, beyond a doubt. Almost the first question asked by the men of these camps is whether the English and Muscovs are fighting. They have either heard of the present summer of 1885, crisis, over the Afghan boundary question, or they imagine that the English and Russians maintain a sort of desultory warfare all the time. When I tell them that the Muscov is fena, bad, they invariably express their approval of the sentiment by eagerly calling each other's attention to my expression. It is singular with what perfect faith and confidence these rude tribesmen accept any statement I choose to make, and how eagerly they seem to dwell on simple statements of facts that are known to every schoolboy in Christendom. I entertain them with my map, showing them the position of Stambul, Mecca, Erzurum, and towns in their own Kurdistan, which they recognize joyfully as I call them by name. They are profoundly impressed at the extent of my knowledge, and some of the more deeply impressed stoop down and reverently kiss Stambul and Mecca as I point them out. While thus pleasantly engaged, an aged sheikh comes into the tent and straightway begins kicking up a blooming row about me. It seems that the others have been guilty of trespassing on the sheikh's prerogative in entertaining me themselves, instead of conducting me to his own tent. After upbraiding them in unmeasured terms, he angrily orders several of the younger men to make themselves beautifully scarce forthwith. The culprits, some of them abundantly able to throw the old fellow over their shoulders, instinctively obey, but they move off at a snail's pace with lowering brows and muttering angry growls that betray fully their untamed, intractable dispositions. A two hours road experience among the constantly varying slopes of rolling hills, and then comes a fertile valley, abounding in villages, wheat fields, orchards, and melon gardens. These days I find it incumbent on me to turn washerwoman occasionally, and halting at the first little stream in this valley, I take upon myself the onerous duties of Wall Lung in Sacramento City, having for an interested and interesting audience two evil-looking kleptomaniacs. 
buffalo herders dressed in next to nothing, who eye my garments drying on the bushes with lingering covetousness. It is scarcely necessary to add that I watch them quite as interestingly myself, for while I pity the scantiness of their wardrobe, I have nothing that I could possibly spare among mine. A network of irrigating ditches, many of them overflowed, render this valley difficult to transverse with a bicycle, and I reach a large village about noon, myself and wheel plastered with mud, after traversing a section where the normal condition is three inches of dust. Bread and grapes are obtained here, a light, airy dinner that is seasoned and made interesting by the unanimous worrying of the entire population. Once I make a desperate effort to silence their clamorous importunities and obtain a little quiet by attempting to ride over impossible ground and reap the well-merited reward of permitting my equanimity to be thus disturbed in the shape of a header and a slightly bent handlebar. While I am eating the gazing stock of a wondering, commenting crowd, a respectably dressed man elbows his way through the compact mass of humans around me, and announces himself as having fought under Osman Pasha at Plevna. What this has to do with me is a puzzler, but the man himself, and every Turk of patriotic age in the crowd, is evidently expecting to see me make some demonstration of approval, so, not knowing what else to do, I shake the man cordially by the hand, and modestly inform my attentively listening audience that Osman Pasha and myself are brothers, and Osman yielded only when the overwhelming numbers of the Muzkovs proved that it was his kismet to do so, and that the Russians would never be permitted to occupy Constantinople, a statement that probably makes my simple auditors feel as though they were inheriting a new lease of national life. Anyhow, they seem not a little gratified at what I am saying. After this, the people seem to find material for no end of amusement among themselves, by contrasting the marifet of the bicycle with the marifet of their creaking arabas, of which there seems to be quite a number in this valley. They are used chiefly in harvesting, are roughly made, used, and worn out in these mountain environed valleys, without ever going beyond the hills that encompass them in on every side. From these villages the people begin to evince an alarming disposition to follow me out some distance on donkeys. This undesirable trait of their character is, of course, easily counteracted by a short spurt where spurting is possible. But it is a soul-harrowing thing to trundle along a mile of unridable road, in company with twenty importuning katirjis, their diminutive donkeys filling the air with suffocating clouds of dust. There is nothing on all this mundane sphere that will so effectually subdue the proud, haughty spirit of a wheelman, or that will so promptly and completely snuff out his last flickering ray of dignity. It is one of the pleasantries of cycling through a country where the people have been riding donkeys and camels since the flood. A few miles from the village I meet another candidate for medical treatment. This time it is a woman, among a merry company of donkey riders, bound from Yuzgat to the salt mines. They are laughing, singing, and otherwise enjoying themselves, after the manner of a New England burying party. The woman's affliction, she says, is fenagouz, which, it appears, is the term used to denote ophthalmia, as well as the evil eye. But, of course, not being a guz hakim, I can do nothing more than express my sympathy. The fertile valley gradually contracts to a narrow, rocky defile, leading up into a hilly region, and at five o'clock I reach Tuzgat, a city claiming a population of 30,000, that is situated in a depression among the mountains that can scarcely be called a valley. I have been three and a half days making the 130 miles from Angora. 
Everybody in Yozgat knows Yuvanaki Effendi Tiftik Gioglu, to whom I have brought a letter of introduction, and shortly after reaching town I find myself comfortably installed on the cushioned divan of honour in that worthy old gentleman's large reception room, while half a dozen serving men are almost knocking each other over in their anxiety to furnish me coffee, vishnirsu, cigarettes, etc., they seem determined upon interpreting the slightest motion of my hand or head into some want which I am unable to explain, and, fancying thus, they are constantly bobbing up before me with all sorts of surprising things. Tevik Bey, general superintendent of the E.G., a company having the monopoly of the tobacco trade in Turkey, for which they pay the government a fixed sum per annum, is also a guest of Tiftik Gioglu Effendi's hospitable mansion, and he at once dispatches a messenger to his Yuzgat agent, Mr. G. O. Chechian, a vivacious Greek, who speaks English quite fluently. After that gentleman's arrival, we soon come to a more perfect understanding of each other all round, and a very pleasant evening is spent in receiving crowds of visitors in a ceremonious manner, in which I really seem to be holding a sort of a levy, except that it is evening instead of morning. Open door is kept for everybody, and mine host's retinue of pages and serving men are kept pretty busy supplying coffee right and left. Beggars in their rags are even allowed to penetrate into the reception room, to sip a cup of coffee, and take a curious peep at the Ingalizin and his wonderful Araba, the fame of which has spread like wildfire through the city. Mine host himself is kept pretty well occupied in returning the salams of the more distinguished visitors, besides keeping his eye on the servants, by way of keeping them well up to their task of dispensing coffee in a manner satisfactory to his own liberal ideas of hospitality but he presides over all with a bearing of easy dignity that it is a pleasure to witness. The street in front of the Tiftik Gioglu residence is swarmed with people next morning. Keeping open house is, under the circumstances, no longer practicable. The entrance gate has to be guarded and none permitted to enter but privileged persons. During the forenoon, the Kaimakan and several officials call round and ask me to favour them by riding along a smooth piece of road opposite the municipal Konak. As I intend remaining over here today, I enter no objections and accompany them forthwith. The rabble becomes wildly excited at seeing me emerge with the bicycle in company with the Kaimakan and his staff for they know that their curiosity is probably on the eve of being gratified. It proves no easy task to traverse the streets, for like in all oriental cities they are narrow and are now jammed with people. Time and again the Kaimakan is compelled to supplement the exertions of an inadequate force of Zaptes with his authoritative voice to keep down the excitements and the wild shouts of Bin Bakalem, Bin Bakalem, hide so that we can see, an innovation on Bin Bin that has made itself manifest since crossing the Kizilurmak River, that are raised, gradually swelling into the tumultuous howl of a multitude. The uproar is deafening, and long before reaching the place, the Kaimakan repents having brought me out. As for myself, I certainly repent having come out, and have still better reasons for doing so before reaching the safe retreat of Tiftik Gioglu Effendi's house an hour afterward. The most that the inadequate squad of Zaptes present can do when we arrive opposite the municipal Konak is to keep the crowd from pressing forward and overwhelming me and the bicycle. They attempt to keep open a narrow passage through the surging sea of humans blocking the street for me to ride down, but ten yards ahead the lane terminates in a mass of fez-crowned heads. 
under the impression that one can mount a bicycle on the stand, like mounting a horse, the Kaimakan asks me to mount, saying that when the people see me mounted and ready to start, they will themselves yield a passageway. Seeing the utter futility of attempting explanations under existing conditions, amid the deafening clamour of Bin Bakalem, Bin Bakalem, I mount and slowly pedal along a crooked fissure in the compact mass of people, which the Zaptes manage to create by frantically flogging right and left before me. Gaining at length more open ground, and the smooth road continuing on, I speed away from the multitude, and the Kaimakan sends one fleet-footed Zapte after me, with instructions to pilot me back to Tifchik Dioglus by a roundabout way, so as to avoid returning through the crowds. The rabble are not to be so easily deceived and shook off as the Kaimakan thinks, however. By taking various shortcuts, they manage to intercept us, and as though considering the having detected and overtaken us in attempting to elude them, justifies them in taking liberties, their bin bakalem now develops into the imperious cry of a domineering majority, determined upon doing pretty much as they please. It is the worst mob I have seen on the journey so far. Excitement runs high, and their shouts of bin bakalem can most assuredly be heard for miles. We are enveloped by clouds of dust raised by the feet of the multitude. The hot sun glares down savagely upon us. The poor Zapte, in heavy top boots and a brand new uniform, heavy enough for winter, works like a beaver to protect the bicycle, until with perspiration and dust his face is streaked and tattooed like a South Sea Islander's. Unable to proceed, we come to a standstill, and simply occupy ourselves in protecting the bicycle from the crush, and reasoning with the mob. But the only satisfaction we obtain in reply to anything we say is, Bin Bakalem, one or two pig-headed, obstreperous young men near us, emboldened by our apparent helplessness, persist in handling the bicycle. After being pushed away several times, one of them even assumes a menacing attitude toward me the last time I thrust his meddlesome hand away. Under such circumstances, retributive justice, prompt and impressive, is the only political course to pursue. So leaving the bicycle to the Zapte a moment, in the absence of a stick, I feel justified in favouring the culprit with a brief pointed lesson in the noble art of self-defence, the first boxing lesson ever given in Tuzgat. In a western mob this would have been anything but an act of discretion, probably. But with these people it has a salutary effect. The idea of attempting retaliation is the farthest of anything from their thoughts, and in all the obstreperous crowd there is, perhaps, not one but what is quite delighted at either seeing or hearing of me having thus chastised one of their number, and involuntarily thanks Allah that it didn't happen to be himself. It would be useless to attempt a description of how we finally managed, by the assistance of two more Zaptes, to get back to Tifti Gioglu Effendi's. Both myself and the Zapte simply unrecognisable from dust and perspiration. The Zapte, first having washed the streaks and tattooing off his face, now presents himself with the broad, honest smile of one who knows he well deserves what he is asking for, and says, Effendi, Bakshish. There is nothing more certain than that the honest fellow merits Bakshish from somebody, it is also equally certain that I am the only person from whom he stands the ghost of a chance of getting any. Nevertheless, the idea of being appealed to for bakshish, after what I have just undergone, merely as an act of accommodation, strikes me as just a trifle ridiculous, and the opportunity of engaging the grinning, good-humoured Zapte in a little banter concerning the abstract preposterousness of his expectations 
is too good to be lost. So assuming an air of astonishment, I reply, Bakshish? Where is my Bakshish? I should think it's me that deserves Bakshish if anybody does. This argument is entirely beyond the Zaple's childlike comprehension. However, he only understands by my manner that there is a hitch somewhere, and never was there a more broadly good-humoured countenance, or a smile more expressive of meritoriousness, nor an utterance more coaxing in its modulation than his Effendi Bakshish, as he repeats the appeal. The smile and the modulation is well worth the Bakshish. In the afternoon, an officer appears with a note saying that the Mutasarif and a number of gentlemen would like to see me ride inside the municipal Konak grounds. This I very naturally promise to do, only under conditions that an adequate force of Zaptes be provided. This the Mutasarif readily agrees to, and once more I venture into the streets, trundling along under a strong escort of Zaptes, who form a hollow square around me. The people accumulate rapidly as we progress, and by the time we arrive at the Konak gate there is a regular crush. In spite of the frantic exertions of my escort, the mob press determinedly forward in an attempt to rush inside when the gate is opened. Instantly I find myself and bicycle wedged in among a struggling mass of natives. A cry of Sakin Araba, Sakin Araba, take care, the bicycle is raised. The Zaplays make a supreme effort. The gate is opened, I am fairly carried in, and the gate is closed. A couple of dozen happy mortals have gained admittance in the rush. Hundreds of the better class natives are in the enclosure and the walls and neighbouring housetops are swarming with an interested audience. There is a small plat of decently smooth ground, upon which I circle for a few moments, to as delighted an audience as ever collected in Barnum's circus. After the exhibition, the Mutasarif eyes the swarming multitude on the roofs and wall, and looks perplexed. Someone suggests that the bicycle be locked up for the present, and when the crowds have dispersed, it can be removed without further excitement. The Mutaserif then places the municipal chamber at my disposal, ordering an officer to lock it up and give me the key. Later in the afternoon, I am visited by the Armenian pastor of Yuzgat and another young Armenian, who can speak a little English and together we take a strolling peep at the city. The American missionaries at Caesarea have a small bookstore here, and the pastor kindly offers me a New Testament to carry along. We drop in on several Armenian shopkeepers, who are introduced as converts of the mission. Coffee is supplied wherever we call. While sitting down a minute in a tailor's stall, a young Armenian peeps in, smiles, and indulges in the pantomime of rubbing his chin. Asking the meaning of this, I am informed by the interpreter that the fellow belongs to the barber shop next door, and is taking this method of reminding me that I stand in need of his professional attentions, not having shaved of late. There appears to be a large proportion of Circassians in town, a group of several wild-looking bipeds armed a la Anatolia, ragged and unkempt haired for Circassians, who are generally respectable in their personal appearance, approach us and want me to show them the bicycle, on the strength of their having fought against the Russians in the late war. I think they are liars, says the young Armenian, who speaks English. They only say they fought against the Russians because you are an Englishman, and they think you will show them the bicycle. Someone comes to me with old coins for sale, another brings a stone with hieroglyphics on it, and the inevitable genius likewise appears. This time it is an Armenian. The tremendous ovation I have received has filled his mind with exaggerated ideas of making a fortune, 
by purchasing the bicycle and making a two piastre show out of it. He wants to know how much I will take for it. Early daylight finds me astir on the following morning, for I have found it a desirable thing to escape from town ere the populace is out to crowd about me. Tiftik Gioglu Effendi's better half has kindly risen at an unusually early hour to see me off, and provides me with a dozen circular rolls of hard bread rings the size of rope quoits aboard an Atlantic steamer, which I string on Igali's cerulean waist-scarf and sling over one shoulder. The good lady lets me out of the gate and says, Bin Bakalem, Effendi. She hasn't seen me ride yet. She is a motherly old creature, of Greek extraction, and I naturally feel like an ingrate of the meanest type at my inability to grant her modest request. Stealing along the side streets, I manage to reach rideable ground, gathering by the way only a small following of worthy early risers and two katirjis, who essay to follow me on their long-eared chargers. But the road being smooth and level from the beginning, I at once discourage them by a short spurt, a half-hour's trundling up a steep hill, and then comes a coastable descent into lower territory, a conscription party collected from the neighbouring Musulman villages, en route to Samsun, the nearest Black Sea port, is met while riding down this declivity. In anticipation of the Sultan's new uniforms awaiting them at Constantinople, they have provided themselves for the journey with barely enough rags to cover their nakedness. They are in high glee at their departure for Stamboul, and favour me with considerable good-natured chaff as I wheel past. Human nature is everywhere pretty much alike the world over, I think to myself. There is little difference between this regiment of ragamuffins chaffing me this morning and the well-dressed troopers of Kaiser William bantering me the day I wheeled out of Strasbourg. End of section 15「Through the Sivas Villette into Armenia」Section 33 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mariana Fuss Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens Chapter 16, Part 1 through the Sivas Villette into Armenia. It is six hours distant from Yuzgat to the large village of Kolmi, as distance is measured here, or about 23 English miles. But the road is mostly rideable, and I roll into the village in about three hours and a half. Just behind Kona, the roads fork, and the mule deer kindly sends a mounted zapti to guide me aright, for fear I shouldn't quite understand, by his pantomimic explanations. I understand well enough, though, and the road just here happened to be excellent wheeling. To the delight of the whole village, I spurt ahead, outdistancing the Zapti's not over-sprightly animal, and bowling briskly along the right road within their range of vision for over a mile. Soon after leaving Kona, my attention is attracted by a small cluster of civilized-looking tents, pitched on the bank of a running stream near the road, and from whence issues the joyous sounds of mirth and music. The road continues rideable, and I am wheeling leisurely along, hesitating about whether to go and investigate or not, when a number of persons in holiday attire present themselves outside the tents, and by shouting and gesturing, invite me to pay them a visit. It turns out to be a reunion of the Yuzgat branch of the Pampasian Pamparzin family, an Armenian name whose representatives in Armenia and Anatolia, it appears, correspond in comparative numerical importance to the great and illustrious family of Smiths in the United States. Following, 
or doubtless more properly setting, a worthy example, they likewise have their periodical reunions, where they eat, drink, spin yarns, sing, and twang the tuneful lyre in frolicsome consciousness of always having a howling majority over their less prolific neighbors. Refreshments in abundance are tendered, and the usual pantomimic explanations exchanged between us. Some of the men have been honoring the joyful occasion by a liberal patronage of the flowing bowl, and are already mildly hilarious. Stringed instruments are twanged by the musical members of the great family, while several others, misinterpreting the inspiration of racky punch for ter terpsichorean talent, are prancing wildly about the tent. Middle-aged matrons are here in plenty, housewifely persons, finding their chief enjoyment in catering to the gastronomic pleasures of the others, while a score or two of blooming maidens stand coyly aloof, watching the festive merrymaking of the men. Their heads and necks are resplendent with bands and necklaces of gold coins, it still being a custom of the East to let the female members of a family wear the surplus wealth about them in the shape of gold ornaments and jewels a custom resulting from the absence of safe investments and the instability of national affairs. Yuzgat enjoys, among neighboring cities, a reputation for beautiful women, and this auspicious occasion gives me an excellent opportunity for drawing my own conclusions. It is not fair, perhaps, to pass judgment on Yuzgat's pretensions by the damsels of one family connection, not even the great and numerous Pampasian Pamparsan family, but still they ought to be at least a fair average. They have beautiful large black eyes, and usually a luxuriant head of hair. But their faces are, on the whole, babyish and expressionless. The Yuzgat maiden of Sweet Sixteen is a coy, babyish creature, possessed of a certain doll-like prettiness, but at twenty-three is a rapidly fading flower, and at thirty is already beginning to get wrinkled and old. Happening to fall in with this festive gathering this morning is quite a gratifying and enlivening surprise. Besides the music and dancing and a substantial breakfast of chicken, boiled mutton, and rice pilau, it gives me an opportunity of witnessing an Armenian family reunion under primitive conditions. Watching over this peaceful and gambling flock of Armenian lambkins is a lone Circassian watchdog. He is of a stalwart, warlike appearance, and although wearing no arms, except a cavalry sword, a shorter broadsword, a dragoon revolver, a two-foot horse pistol, and a double-barreled shotgun slung at his back, the Armenians seem to feel perfectly safe under his protection. They probably don't require any such protection, really. They are nevertheless wise in employing a Circassian to guard them, if for nothing else, for the sake of freeing their own unwarlike minds of all disquieting apprehensions, and enjoying their family reunion in the calm atmosphere of perfect security. Some lawless party passing along the road might peradventure drop in and abuse their hospitality, or partaking too freely of Raki, make themselves obnoxious, were they unprotected. But with one Circassian patrol in the camp, they are doubly sure against anything of the kind. These people invite me to remain with them until tomorrow, but of course I excuse myself from this, and, after spending a very agreeable hour in their company, take my departure. The country develops into an undulating plateau, which is under general cultivation, as cultivation goes in Asiatic Turkey. A number of Circassian villages are scattered over this upland plain. Most of them are distant from my road, but many horsemen are encountered. They ride the finest animals in the country, and one naturally falls to wondering how they manage to keep so well-dressed and well-mounted, while rags and poverty and diminutive donkeys seem to be well-nigh universal rule among their neighbors. The Circassians betray more interest in my purely personal affairs, whether I am Russian or English, whither I am bound, etc., and less interest in the bicycle than either Turks or Armenians, and seem altogether of a more reserved disposition. I generally have as little conversation with them as possible, confining myself to letting them know I am English and not Russian, and replying, Turkchi binmus, I don't understand, to other questions. They have a look about them that makes me apprehensive as to the disinterestedness of their wanting to know whither I am bound, apprehensive that their object is to find out where three or four of them could see me later, I see but few Circassian women, what few I approach sufficiently near to observe, 
are all more or less pleasant-faced, prepossessing females. Many have blue eyes, which is very rare among their neighbors. The men average quite as handsome as the women, and they have a peculiar daredevil expression of countenance that makes them distinguishable immediately from either Turk or Armenian. They look like men who wouldn't hesitate about undertaking any devilment they felt themselves equal to for the sake of plunder. They are very like their neighbors, however, in one respect. Such among them as take any great interest in my extraordinary outfit find it entirely beyond their comprehension. The bicycle is a Gordian knot too intricate for their semi-civilized minds to unravel, and there are no Alexanders among them to think of cutting it. Before they recover from their first astonishment, I have disappeared. The road continues for the most part rideable until about 2 p.m., when I arrive at a mountainous region of rocky ridges, covered chiefly with a growth of scrub oak. Upon reaching the summit of one of these ridges, I observe some distance ahead what appears to be a tremendous field of large cabbages, stretching away in a northeasterly direction, almost to the horizon of one's vision. The view presents the striking appearance of large, compact cabbage heads thickly dotting a well-cultivated area of clean black loam, surrounded on all sides by rocky, uncultivatable wilds. Fifteen minutes later, I am picking my way through this cultivated field, which upon closer acquaintance proves to be a smooth lava bed, and the cabbages are nothing more or less than boulders of singular uniformity. And what is equally curious, they are all covered with a growth of moss, while the volcanic bed they repose on is perfectly naked. Beyond this singular area, the country continues wild and mountainous, with no habitations near the road, and thus it continues until some time after nightfall, when I emerge upon a few scattering wheat fields. The baying of dogs in the distance indicates the presence of a village somewhere around, but having plenty of bread on which to sup, I once again determine upon studying astronomy behind a wheat shock. It is a glorious moonlit night, but the altitude of the country hereabouts is not less than 6,000 feet, and the chilliness of the atmosphere, already apparent, bodes ill for anything like a comfortable night. But I scarcely anticipate being disturbed by anything safe atmospheric conditions. I am rolled up in my tent instead of under it, slumbering as lightly as men are wont to slumber under these unfavorable conditions. When, about eleven o'clock, the unearthly creaking of native Erebus approaching arouses me from my lethargical condition. Judging from the sounds, they appear to be making a beeline for my position. But not caring to voluntarily reveal my presence, I simply remain quiet and listen. It soon becomes evident that they are a party of villagers coming to load up their buffalo Erebus by moonlight with these very shocks of wheat. One of the Erebus now approaches the shock which conceals my recumbent form, and where the pale moonbeams are coquettishly ogling the nickel-plated portions of my wheel, making it conspicuously scutilent by their attentions. Hoping the Ereba may be going to pass by, and that my presence may escape the driver's notice, I hesitate even yet to reveal myself, but the Ereba stops, and I can observe the driver's frightened expression as he suddenly becomes aware of the presence of strange, supernatural objects. At that same moment, I rise up in my winding, sheet-like covering. The man utters a wild yell, and abandoning the Araba, vanishes like a deer in the direction of his companions. It is an unenviable situation to find oneself in. If I boldly approach them, these people, not being able to ascertain my character in the moonlight, would be quite likely to discharge their firearms at me in their fright. If, on the contrary, I remain under cover, they might also try the experiment of a shot before venturing to approach the deserted buffaloes, who are complacently shooting the cud on the spot where their chicken-hearted driver took to his heels. Under the circumstances, I think it best to strike off toward the road, leaving them to draw their own conclusions as to whether I am Shaitan himself or merely a plain, inoffensive hobgoblin. But while gathering up my effects, one heroic individual ventures to approach partway and open up a shouting inquiry. My answers, though unintelligible to him in the main, satisfy him that I am at all events a human being. There are six of them, and in a few minutes after the ignominious flight of the driver, they are all gathered around me, as much interested and nonplussed at their appearance of myself and bicycle, 
as a party of Nebraska homesteaders might be, had they, under similar circumstances, discovered a turbaned old Turk complacently enjoying a nargila. No sooner do their apprehensions concerning my probable warlike character and capacity become allayed than they get altogether too familiar and inquisitive about my packages, and I detect one venturesome kleptomaniac surreptitiously unfastening a strap when he fancies I am not noticing. Moreover, laboring under the impression that I don't understand a word they are saying, I observe they are commenting in language smacking unmistakably of covetousness as to the probable contents of my White House leather case. Some think it is sure to contain chokpara, much money, while others suggest that I am a postaya, courier, and that it contains letters. Under these alarming circumstances, there is only one way to manage these overgrown children, that is, to make them afraid of you forthwith. So, shoving the strap and fastener roughly away, I imperatively order the whole covetous crew to hide Without a moment's hesitation, they betake themselves off to their work, it being an inborn trait of their character to mechanically obey an authoritative command. Following them to their other Arabus, I find they have brought quilts along, intending, after loading up, to sleep in the field until daylight. Selecting a good heavy quilt with as little ceremony as though it were my own property, I take it and the bicycle to another shock and curl myself up warm and comfortable. Once or twice the owner of the coverlet approaches quietly, just near enough to ascertain that I am not intending making off with his property, but there is not the slightest danger of being disturbed or molested in any way till morning. Thus, in this curious, roundabout manner, does fortune provide me with the wherewithal to pass a comparatively comfortable night. Rather arbitrary proceedings to take a quilt without asking permission, some might think, but the owner thinks nothing of the kind. It is quite customary for travelers of their own nation to help themselves in this way, and the villagers have come to regard it as quite a natural occurrence. At daylight I am again on the move, and sunrise finds me busy making an outline sketch of the ruins of an ancient castle that occupies, I should imagine, one of the most impregnable positions in all Asia Minor, a regular Gibraltar. It occupies the summit of a precipitous detached mountain peak, which is accessible only from one point, all the other sides presenting a sheer precipice of rock. It forms a conspicuous feature of the landscape for many miles around, and situated as it is amid a wilderness of rugged brush-covered heights, admirably suited for ambuscades. It was doubtless a very important position at one time. It probably belongs to the Byzantine period, and if the number of old graves scattered among the hills indicate anything, it has in its day been the theater of stirring tragedy. An hour after leaving the frowning battlements of the grim old relic behind, I arrive at a cluster of four rock houses, which are apparently occupied by a sort of a patriarchal family consisting of a turbaned old Turk and his two generations of descendants. The old fellow is seated on a rock, smoking a cigarette and endeavoring to coax a little comfort from the slanting rays of the morning sun, and I straightway approach him and broach the all-important subject of refreshments. He turns out to be a fanatical old gentleman, one of those old-school Muslims who have neither eye nor ear for anything but the Mohammedan religion. I have irreverently interrupted him in his morning meditations, it seems, and he administers a rebuke in the form of a sidewise glance, such as a Pharisee might be expected to bestow on a cannibal islander venturing to approach him, and delivers himself of two deep-fetched sighs of Allah, Allah. Anybody would think from his actions that the sanctimonious old mannequin, five feet three, has made the pilgrimage to Mecca a dozen times, whereas he has evidently not even earned the privilege of wearing a green turban. He has neither been to Mecca himself during his whole unprofitable life, nor sent a substitute, and he now thinks of gaining a nice numerous harem, and a walled-in garden with trees and fountains, cucumbers and carpooses in the land of the Hara Fuj Keys, by cultivating the spirit of fanaticism at the eleventh hour. I feel too independent this morning to sacrifice any of the well-nigh invisible remnant of dignity remaining from the respectable quantity with which I started into Asia, for I still have a couple of the wheaten quats I brought from Yuzgat. 
So, leaving the ancient Mussulman to his meditations, I push on over the hills, when, coming to a spring, I eat my frugal breakfast, soaking the unbiteable quoits in the water. After getting beyond this hilly region, I emerge upon a level plateau of considerable extent, across which very fair wheeling is found. But before noon, the inevitable mountains present themselves again, and some of the acclivities are trundleable only by repeating the stair-climbing process of the Karasu Pass. Necessity forces me to seek dinner at a village where abject poverty beyond anything hitherto encountered seems to exist. A decently large fig leaf, without anything else, would be eminently preferable to the tattered remnants hanging about these people, and among the smaller children, purus naturalis is the rule. It is also quite evident that few of them ever take a bath, as there is plenty of water about them, this doubtless comes of the pure contrariness of human nature in the absence of social obligations. Their religion teaches these people that they ought to bathe every day. Consequently, they never bathe at all. There is a small threshing floor handy, and, taking pity on their wretched condition, I hesitate not to drive dull care away from them for a few minutes, by giving them an exhibition. Not that there is any dull care among them, though, after all. For, in spite of desperate poverty, they know more contentment than the well-fed, respectably dressed mechanic of the Western world. It is, however, the contentment born of not realizing their own condition, the bliss that comes of ignorance. They search the entire village for eatables, but nothing is readily obtainable but bread. A few gaunt, angular fowls are scratching about, but they have a beruffled, disreputable appearance, as though their lives had been a continuous struggle against being caught and devoured. Moreover, I don't care to wait around three hours on purpose to pass judgment on these people's cooking. Eggs there are none. They are devoured, I fancy, almost before they are laid. Finally, while making the best of bread and water, which is hardly made more palatable by the appearance of the people watching me feed, a woman in an airy fairy costume that is little better than no costume at all, comes forward and contributes a small bowl of yaourt. But unfortunately, this is old yaourt, Yaourt that is in the sear and yellow stage of its usefulness as human food, and although these people doubtless consume it thus, I prefer to wait until something more acceptable and less odoriferous turns up. I miss the genial hospitality of the gentle cords today. Instead of heaping plates of pilau and bowls of wholesome new yaourt, fickle fortune brings me nothing but an exclusive diet of bread and water. My road this afternoon is a torturous donkey trail, intersecting ravines with well-nigh perpendicular sides and rocky ridges, covered with a stunted growth of cedar and scrub oak. The higher mountains round about are heavily timbered with pine and cedar. A large forest on a mountain slope is on fire, and I pass a camp of people who have been driven out of their permanent abode by the flames. Fortunately, they have saved everything except their naked houses and their grain. They can easily build new houses, and their neighbors will give or lend them sufficient grain to tide them over till the, another harvest. Toward sundown, the hilly country terminates, and I descend into a broad cultivated valley, through which is a very good wagon road, and I have the additional satisfaction of learning that it will so continue clear into Sivas, a wagon road having been made from Sivas into this forest to enable the people to haul wood and building timber on their arabus. Arriving at a good-sized and comparatively well-to-do Muslim village, I obtain an ample supper of eggs and pilau, and, after binning over and over again until the most unconscionable Turk among them all can bring himself to importune me no more, I obtain a little peace. Supper for two, together with a tough hill-climbing today and insufficient sleep last night, produces its natural effect. I quietly doze off to sleep while sitting on the divan of a small khan, which might very appropriately be called an open shed. Soon I'm awakened. They want me to accommodate them by binning once more before they retire for the night. As the moon is shining brightly, I offer no objections, knowing that to grant the request will be the quickest way to get rid of their worry. They then provide me with quilts, and I spend the night in the con alone. I'm soon asleep, but one habitually sleeps lightly under these strange and ever-varying conditions, and several times I'm awakened by dogs invading the con and sniffing about my couch. 
My daily experience among these people is teaching me the commendable habit of rising with the lark. Not that I'm an enthusiastic student or even a willing one, be it observed that few people are, but as a case of either turning out and sneaking off before the inhabitants are astir, or to be worried from one's waking moments to the departure from the village, and of the two evils, one comes finally to prefer the early rising. One can always obtain something to eat before starting by waiting till an hour after sunrise, but I have had quite enough of these people's importunities to make breakfasting with them a secondary consideration, and so pull out at early daylight. The road is exceptionally good, but an east wind rises with the sun and quickly develops into a stiff breeze that renders riding against it anything but child's play. No rose is to be expected without a thorn. Nevertheless, it is rather aggravating to have the good road and the howling headwind happen together, especially in traversing a country where good roads are the exception instead of the rule. About eight o'clock, I reach a village situated at the entrance to a rocky defile, with a babbling brook dancing through the space between its two divisions. Upon inquiring for refreshments, a man immediately orders his wife to bring me Palau. For some reason or other, perhaps the poor woman has none prepared, who knows, the woman, instead of obeying the command like a good wifey, enters upon a wordy demure, whereupon her husband borrows a hoe handle from a bystander and advances to chastise her for daring to thus hesitate about his obeying his orders. The woman retreats precipitately into the house, heaping Turkish epithets on her devoted husband's head. This woman is evidently a regular termagant, or she would never have used such violent language to her husband in the presence of a stranger in the whole village. Some day, if she doesn't be more reasonable, her husband, instead of satisfying his outraged feelings by chastising her with a hoe handle, will, in a moment of passion, bid her be gone from his house, which in Turkish law constitutes a legal separation. If the command be given in the presence of a competent witness, it is irrevocable. Seeing me thus placed, as it were, in an embarrassing situation, another woman, dear thoughtful creature, fetches me enough wheat pilau to feed a mule and a nice bowl of yaourt, off which I make a substantial breakfast. Nearby where I am eating are five industrious maidens, preparing cracked or broken wheat by a novel and interesting process that has hitherto failed to come under my observation. Perhaps it is peculiar to the Sivas Villette, which I have now entered. A large rock is hollowed out like a shallow druggist's mortar. Wheat is put in, and several girls, sometimes as many as eight, I am told, by the American missionaries at Sivas, gather in a circle about it and pound the wheat with light, long-headed mauls or beetles, striking in regular succession, as the reader has probably seen a gang of circus roustabouts driving tent pins. When I first saw circus tent pins driven in this manner a few years ago, I remember hearing onlookers remarking it is quite novel and wonderful how so many could be striking the same peg without their swinging sledges coming into collusion. But that very same performance has been practiced by the maidens hereabout, it seems, from time immemorial. Another proof that there is nothing new under the sun. Ten miles of good riding, and I wheel into the considerable town of Yenikan, a place sufficiently important to maintain a public coffee con and several small shops. Here I take aboard a pocket full of fine large pears, and after wheeling a couple of miles to a secluded spot, halt for the purpose of shifting the pears from my pocket to where they will be better appreciated. Ere I have finished the second pear, a gentle goatherd, who from an adjacent hill observed me alight, appears upon the scene and waits around, with the laudable intention of further enlightening his mind when I remount. He is carrying a musical instrument, something akin to a flute. It is a mere hollow tube with the customary finger holes, but it is blown at the end. Having neither reed nor mouthpiece of any description, it requires a peculiar sidewise application of the lips, and is not to be blown readily by a novice. When properly played, it produces soft, melodious music, that, to say nothing else, must exert a gentle, soothing influence on the wild, turbulent souls of a herd of goats. The goat herd offers me a cake of ekmek out of his wallet, as a sort of peace offering, but thanks to a generous breakfast, music hath more charms at present than dry ekmek, and, handing him a pear, 
I strike up a bargain by which he is to entertain me with a solo until I am ready to start, when, of course, he will be amply recompensed by seeing me bin. The bargain is agreed to, and the solo duly played. East of Yenikon, the road develops into an excellent macadamized highway, on which I find plenty of genuine amusement by electrifying the natives whom I chance to meet or overtake. Creeping noiselessly up behind an unsuspecting donkey driver until quite close, I suddenly reveal my presence. Looking around and observing a strange, unearthly combination apparently swooping down upon him, the affrighted Katirji's first impulse is to seek refuge in flight, not infrequently bolting clear off the roadway, before venturing upon taking a second look. Sometimes I simply put on a spurt and whisk past at a fifteen-mile pace. Looking back, the Katirji generally seems rooted to the spot with astonishment, and his utter inability to comprehend. These men will have marvelous tales to tell in their respective villages concerning what they saw. Unless other bicycles are introduced, the time the Ingilisu went through the country with his wonderful Araba will become a red-letter event in the memory of the people along my route through Asia Minor. Crossing the Yeldaz Irmek River on a stone bridge, I follow along the valley of the headwaters of our old acquaintance, the Kazil Irmak, and at three o'clock in the afternoon roll into Sivas, having wheeled nearly fifty miles today, the last forty of which will compare favorably in smoothness, though not in levelness, with any forty-mile stretch I know of in the United States. Prom Angora, I have brought a letter of introduction to Mr. Ernest Weekly, a young Englishman engaged, together with Mr. Kodigus, a Belgian gentleman, for the Ottoman government, in collecting the Sivas Villiette's proportion of the Russian indemnity, and I am soon installed in hospitable quarters. Sivas artisans enjoy a certain amount of celebrity among their compatriots of other Asia Minor cities for unusual skillfulness, particularly in making filigree silver work. Toward evening, myself and Mr. Weekly take a stroll through the silversmith's quarters. The quarters consist of twenty or thirty small wooden shops, surrounding an oblong court. Spreading willows and a tiny rivulet running through it give the place a semi-rural appearance. In the little open-front workshops, which might more appropriately be called stalls, Armenian silversmiths are seated cross-legged, some working industriously at their trade, others gossiping and sipping coffee with friends or purchasers. Doesn't it call up the ideas of what you conceive the quarters of the old alchemists to have been hundreds of years ago? asks my companion. Sivas was also formerly a seat of learning. The imposing gates with portions of the fronts of the old Arabic universities are still standing, with sufficient beautiful arabesque designs in glazed tile work, still undestroyed, to proclaim eloquently of departed glories. The squalid mud hovels of refugees from the Caucasus now occupy the interior of these venerable edifices. Ragged urchins romp with dogs and baby buffaloes, where Pasha's sons formerly congregated to learn wisdom from the teachings of their prophet. And now what remains of the intricate arabesque designs, worked out in small bright-colored tiles, that once formed the glorious ceiling of the dome, seems to look down reproachfully, and yet sorrowfully, upon the wretched heaps of Tezik, place beneath it for shelter. End of section. Section 34 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 16, Part 2 Through the Silas Velayet into Armenia. I am remaining over one day at Sivas, and in the morning we call on the American missionaries. Mr. Perry is at home and hopes I am going to stay a week so that they can sort of make up for the discomforts of journeying through the country. Mr. Hubbard and the ladies of the mission are out of town, but will be back this evening. After dinner we go round to the government Konak and call on the valley, Halil Eifat Pasha, whom Mr. Weekly describes beforehand as a very practical man, 
fond of mechanical contrivances, and who would never forgive him if he allowed me to leave Sivas with the bicycle without paying him a visit. The usual rigmarole of salams, cigarettes, coffee, compliments, and questioning are gone through with. The valley is a jolly-faced, good-natured man, and is evidently much interested in my companion's description of the bicycle and my journey. Of course, I don't forget to praise the excellence of the road from Yeni Khan. I can conscientiously tell him that it is superior to anything I have wheeled over south of the Balkans. The Pasha is delighted at hearing this, and beaming joyously over his spectacles, his fat, jolly face a rotund picture of satisfaction, he says to Mr. Wheatley, You see, he praises up our roads, and he ought to know. He has travelled on wagon roads halfway round the world. The interview ends by the valley inviting me to ride the bicycle out to his country residence this evening, giving the order for a squad of Zaptes to escort me out of town at the appointed time. The valley is one of the most energetic pashas in Turkey, says Mr. Wheatley, as we take our departure. You would scarcely believe that he has established a small weekly newspaper here, and makes it self-supporting into the bargain, would you? I confess I don't see how he manages it among these people, I reply quite truthfully, for these are anything but newspaper-supporting people. How does he manage to make it self-supporting? Why, he makes every employee of the government subscribe for a certain number of copies, and the subscription price is kept back out of their salaries. For instance, the mulazim of Zaptes would have to take half a dozen copies, the mutaserif a dozen, etc., if from any unforeseen cause the current expenses are found to be more than the income, a few additional copies are saddled on each subscriber. Before leaving Sivas, I arrive at the conclusion that Halil Efat Pasha knows just about what's what, while administering the affairs of the Sivas Vilayet in a manner that has gained him the goodwill of the population at large, he hasn't neglected his opportunities at the Constantinople end of the rope. More than one beautiful Circassian girl has, I am told, been forwarded to the Sultan's harem by the enterprising and sagacious Sivas Valley. Consequently, he holds trump cards, so to speak, both in the province and the palace. Promptly at the hour appointed, the squad of Zaptes arrive. Mr. Weakley mounts his servant on a prancing Arab charger and orders him to manoeuvre the horse so as to clear the way in front. The Zaptes commence their flogging, and in the middle of the cleared space I trundle the bicycle. While making our way through the streets, Mr. Hubbard, who with the ladies has just returned to the city, is encountered on the way to invite Mr. Weakley and myself to supper. As he pushes his way through the crowd and reaches my side, he pronounces it the worst rabble he ever saw in the streets of Sivas, and he has been stationed here over twelve years. Once clear of the streets, I mount and soon outdistance the crowd, though still followed by a number of horsemen. Part way out we wait for the valley's state carriage in which he daily rides between the city and his residence. While waiting, a terrific squall of wind and dust comes howling from the direction we are going, and while it is still blowing great guns, the valley and his mounted escort arrive. His Excellency alights and examines the Columbia with much interest, and then requests me to ride on immediately in advance of the carriage. The grade is slightly against me, and the whistling wind seems to be shrieking a defiance. But, by superhuman efforts, almost, I pedal ahead and manage to keep in front of his horses all the way. The distance from Sivas is four and a quarter miles by the cyclometer. 
This is the first time it has ever been measured. We are ushered into a room, quite elegantly furnished, and light refreshments served. Observing my partiality for Vishnu Su, the governor kindly offers me a flask of the syrup to take along, which I am, however, reluctantly compelled to refuse, owing to my inability to carry it. Here also we meet Javed Bey, the pasha's son, who has recently returned from Constantinople, and who says he saw me riding at Principo. The valley gets down on his hands and knees to examine the route of my journey on a map of the world which he spreads out on the carpet. He grows quite enthusiastic and exclaims, Wonderful, very wonderful, says Javed Bey. When you get back to America, they will build you a statue. Mr. Hubbard has mounted a horse and followed us to the valley's residence, and at the approach of dusk we take our departure. The wind is favourable for the return, as is also the gradient. Ere my two friends have unhitched their horses, I mount and am scudding before the gale half a mile away. Hey, 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 hey! You'll never overtake him! The valley shouts enthusiastically to the two horsemen as they start at full gallop after me and which they laughingly repeat to me shortly afterward. A very pleasant evening is spent at Mr. Hubbard's house. After supper, the ladies sing, Sweet by and by, and home sweet home, and other melodious reminders of the land of liberty and song that gave them birth. Everything looks comfortable and homelike, and they have English ivy inside the dining room trained up the walls and partly covering the ceiling, which produces a wonderfully pleasant effect. The usual extraordinary rumours of my wonderful speeding ability have circulated about the city during the day and evening, some of which have happened to come to the ears of the missionaries. One story is that I came from the port of Samsun, a distance of nearly three hundred miles, in six hours, while an imaginative Katirji, whom I whisked past on the road, has been telling the Sivas people an exaggerated story of how a genie had ridden past him with lightning-like speed on a shining wheel. But whether it was a good or evil genie, he said he didn't have time to determine, as I went past like a flash and vanished in the distance. The missionaries have 400 scholars attending their school here at Sivas, which would seem to indicate a pretty flourishing state of affairs. Their recruiting ground is, of course, among the Armenians, who, though professedly Christians, really stand in more need of regeneration than their Mohammedan neighbours. The characteristic condition of the average Armenian villager's mind is deep dense ignorance, and moral gloominess. It requires more patience and perseverance to engraft a new idea on the unimpressionable trunk of an Armenian villager's intellect than it does to put up second-hand stovepipe, and it is a generally admitted fact, i.e. west of the Missouri Elver, that anyone capable of setting up three joints of second-hand stovepipe without using profane language deserves a seat in paradise. Come in here a minute, says Mr. Hubbard, just before our departure for the night, leading the way into an adjoining room. Here's shirts, underclothing, socks, handkerchiefs, everything. Help yourself to anything you require. I know something about travelling through this country myself. But not caring to impose too much on good nature, I content myself with merely pocketing a strong pair of socks that I know will come in handy. I leave the bicycle at the mission overnight, and in the morning, at Miss Chamberlain's request, I ride round the schoolhouse yard a few times for the edification of the scholars. The greatest difficulty, I am informed, 
with Armenian pupils is to get them to take sufficient interest in anything to ask questions. It is mainly because the bicycle will be certain to awaken interest and excite the spirit of inquiry among them that I am requested to ride for their benefit. Thus is the bicycle fairly recognized as a valuable aid to missionary work. Moral. Let the American and Episcopal boards provide their Asia Minor and Persian missionaries with nickel-plated bicycles. Let them wheel their way into the empty wilderness of the Armenian mind, and light up the impenetrable moral darkness lurking therein with the glowing and mist dispelling orbs of cycle lamps. Messrs. Perry, Hubbard, and Weekly accompany me out some distance on horseback, and at parting I am commissioned to carry salams to the brethren in China. This is the first opportunity that has ever presented of sending greetings overland to far-off China, they say, and such rare occasions are not to be lightly overlooked. They also promise to send word to the Ezerum mission to expect me. The chances are, however, that I shall reach Ezerum before their letter. There are no lightning mail trains in Asia Minor. The road eastward from Sivas is an artificial highway and affords reasonably good wheeling, but is somewhat inferior to the road from Yeni Kao. Before long I enter a region of low hills, dales and small lakes, beyond which the road again descends into the valley of the Kizilurmak. All day long the roadway averages better wheeling than I ever expected to find in Asiatic Turkey, but the prevailing east wind offers strenuous opposition to my progress every inch of the way along the hundred miles or so of rideable road from Yeni Khan to Zara a town at which I arrive near sundown. Zara is situated at the entrance to a narrow passage between two mountain spurs, and although the road is here a dead level and the surface smooth, the wind comes roaring from the gorge with such tremendous pressure that it is only by extraordinary exertions that I am able to keep the saddle. Tiftik Gioglu Effendi was a gentleman of Greek descent. At Zara I have an opportunity of seeing and experiencing something of what hospitality is like among the better-class Armenians, for I have brought from Sivas a letter of introduction to Kirkor Aga Tartarion, the most prominent Armenian gentleman in Zara. I have no difficulty whatever in finding the house, and am at once installed in the customary position of honour, while five serving men hover about, ready to wait on me. Some take a hand in the inevitable ceremony of preparing and serving coffee and lighting cigarettes, while others stand watchfully by, waiting word or look from myself or mine host, or from the privileged guests that immediately begin to arrive. The room is of cedar planking throughout, and is absolutely without furniture, save the carpeting and the cushioned divan on which I am seated. Mr. Tartarian sits cross-legged on the carpet to my left, smoking a nargile. His younger brother occupies a similar position on my right, rolling and smoking cigarettes, while the guests, as they arrive, squat themselves on the carpet in positions varying in distance from the divan according to their respective rank and social importance. No one ventures to occupy the cushioned divan alongside myself, although the divan is fifteen feet long, and it makes me feel uncomfortably like the dog in the manger to occupy its whole length alone. In a farther corner, and off the slightly raised and carpeted floor on which are seated the guests, is a small brick fireplace, on which a charcoal fire is brightly burning, and here Mr. Vartarian's private caveji is kept busily employed in brewing tiny cups of strong black coffee. Another servant constantly visits the fire to ferret out pieces of glowing charcoal, 
with small pipe-lighting tongs, with which he circulates among the guests, supplying a light to the various smokers of cigarettes. A third youth is kept pretty tolerably busy performing the same office for Mr. Vartarian's Nargile, for the gentleman is an inveterate smoker, and in all Turkey there can scarcely be another Nargile requiring so much tinkering with as his. All the live-long evening something keeps getting wrong with that wretched pipe. Mine host himself is continually rearranging the little pile of live coals on top of the dampened tobacco. The tobacco, smokened in an argile, is dampened, and live coals are placed on top. Taking off the long, coiled tube and blowing down it, or prying around in the tobacco receptacle with an awl-like instrument in his efforts to make it draw properly, but without making anything like a success, while his nargile boy is constantly hovering over it with a new supply of live coals. Job himself could scarcely have been possessed of more patience, I think, at first. But before the evening is over, I come to the conclusion that my worthy host wouldn't exchange that particular hubble-bubble with its everlasting contrariness for the most perfectly drawing nargile in Turkey. Like certain devotees of the weed among ourselves, who never seem to be happier than when running a broom-straw down the stem of a pipe that chronically refuses to draw, so Kirkur Aga Varterian finds his chief amusement in thus tinkering from one week's end to another with his nargile. At the supper-table, mine host and his brother both lavish attentions upon me. Knives and forks, of course, there are none, these things being seldom seen in Asia Minor, and to a cycler who has spent the day in peddling against a stiff breeze, their absence is a matter of small moment. I am ravenously hungry, and they both win my warmest esteem by transferring choice morsels from their own plates into mine with their fingers. From what I know of strict hot ton zaran etiquette, I think they should really pop these titbits into my mouth, and the reason they don't do so is perhaps because I fail to open it in the customary hot ton manner. However, it is a distasteful thing to be always sticking up for one's individual rights. A pile of quilts and mattresses, three feet thick, and feather pillows galore are prepared for me to sleep on. An attendant presents himself with a wonderful nightshirt, on the ample proportions of which are displayed bewildering colours and figures, and following the custom of the country, shapes himself for undressing me and assisting me in to bed. This, however, I prefer to do without assistance, owing to a large stock of native modesty. I never fell among people more devoted in their attentions. Their only thought during my stay is to make me comfortable. But they are very ceremonious and great sticklers for etiquette. I had intended making my usual early start, but mine host receives with open disapproval, I fancy even with a showing of displeasure, my proposition to depart without first partaking of refreshments, and it is nearly eight o'clock before I finally get started. Immediately after rising comes the inevitable coffee and early morning visitors. Later, an attendant arrives with breakfast for myself on a small wooden tray. Mr. Vartarian occupies precisely the same position, and is engaged in precisely the same occupation as yesterday evening, as is also his brother. No sooner does the hapless attendant make his appearance with the eatables than these two persons spring simultaneously to their feet, apparently in a towering rage, and chase him back out of the room, meanwhile pursuing him with a torrent of angry words. They then return to their prospective positions and respective occupations. Ten minutes later the attendant reappears, but this time bringing a larger tray with an ample spread for three persons. This, 
it afterward appears, is not because mine host and his brother intends partaking of any, but because it is Armenian etiquette to do so, and Armenian etiquette therefore becomes responsible for the spectacle of a solitary feeder, seated at breakfast with dishes and everything prepared for three, while of the other two one is smoking a nargile, the other cigarettes, and both of them regarding my evident relish of scrambled eggs and cold fowl with intense satisfaction. Having by this time determined to merely drift with the current tide of mine host's intentions concerning the time of my departure, I resume my position on the divan after breakfasting, simply hinting that I would like to depart as soon as possible. To this Mr. Vartarian complacently nods assent, and his brother with equal complacency rolls me a cigarette, after which a good half-hour is consumed in preparing for me a letter of introduction to their friend Muduragana in the village of Kachahurda, which I expect to reach somewhere near noon. Mine host dictates while his brother writes. Visitors continue coming in, and I am beginning to get a trifle impatient about starting, and beginning, in fact, to wish all their nonsensical ceremonious at the bottom of the deep blue sea, or some equally unfathomable quarter, when at a signal from Mr. Vartarian himself, his brother and the whole roomful of visitors rise simultaneously to their feet, and equally simultaneously put their hands on their respective stomachs, and, turning toward me, salam, mine host then comes forward, shakes hands, gives me the letter to Muduragana, and permits me to depart. He has provided two zaptes to escort me outside the town, and in a few minutes I find myself bowling briskly along a beautiful little valley. The pellucid waters of a purling brook dance merrily alongside an excellent piece of road. Birds are singing merrily in the willow trees, and dark rocky crags tower skyward immediately around. The lovely little valley terminates all too soon, for in fifteen minutes I am footing it up another mountain, but it proves to be the entrance gate of a region containing grander pine-clad mountain scenery than anything encountered outside the Sierra Nevadas. In fact, the famous scenery of Cape Horn, California, almost finds its counterpart at one particular point I traverse this morning, only instead of a central Pacific railway winding around the grey old crags and precipices, the enterprising Sivas Valley has built an Araba road. One can scarce resist the temptation of wheeling down some of the less precipitous slopes, but it is sheer indiscretion, for the roadway makes sharp turns at points where to continue straight ahead a few feet too far would launch one into eternity. A broken break, a wild coast of a thousand feet through mid-air into the dark depths of a rocky gorge, and the tour around the world would abruptly terminate. For a dozen miles I traverse a tortuous road winding its way among wild mountain gorges and dark pine forests. Circassian horsemen are occasionally encountered. It seems the most appropriate place imaginable for robbers, and I have again been cautioned against these freebooting mountaineers at Sivas. They eye me curiously and generally halt after they have passed, and watch my progress for some minutes. Once I am overtaken by a couple of them, they follow close behind me up a mountain slope. They are heavily armed and look capable of anything, and I plod along, mentally calculating how to best encompass their destruction with the Smith and Wesson, without coming to grief myself, should their intentions toward me prove criminal. It is not exactly comfortable or reassuring to have two armed horsemen, of a people who are regarded with universal fear and mistrust by everyone around them, following close upon one's heels, 
with the disadvantage of not being able to keep an eye on their movements. However, they have little to say, and as none of them attempt any interference, it is not for me to make insinuations against them on the barren testimony of their outward appearance and the voluntary opinions of their neighbours. My route now leads up a rocky ravine, the road being fairly under cover of overarching rocks at times, thence over a billowy region of mountain summits, an elevated region of pine-clad ridges and rocky peaks, to descend again into a cultivated country of undulating hills and dales checkered with fields of grain. These low rolling hills appear to be in a higher state of cultivation than any district I have traversed in Asia Minor. From points of vantage the whole country immediately around looks like a swelling sea of golden grain. Harvesting is going merrily on, men and women are reaping side by side in the fields, and the songs of the women come floating through the air from all directions. They are Armenian peasants, for I am now in Armenia proper. The inhabitants of this particular locality impress me as a light-hearted, industrious people. They have an abundant harvest, and it is a pleasure to stand and see them reap, and listen to the singing of the women. Moreover, they are more respectably clothed than the lower-class natives round about them barring, of course, our unfathomable acquaintances, the Circassians. Toward the eastern extremity of this peaceful, happy scene is the village of Kachahurda, which I reach soon after noon, and where resides Muduragana, to whom I bring a letter. Picturesquely speaking, Kachahurda is a disgrace to the neighborhood in which it stands, its mud hovels are combined cow pens, chicken coops, and human habitations, and they are bunched up together without any pretense to order or regularity. Yet the light-hearted, decently clad people, whose songs come floating from the harvest fields, live contentedly in this and other equally wretched villages round about. Muduragana provides me with a repast of bread and yaourt, and endeavours to make my brief halt comfortable. While I am discussing these refreshments, himself and another unwashed, unkempt old party come to high, angry words about me. But whatever it is about, I haven't the slightest idea. Mine host seems a regular old savage when angry, he is the happy possessor of a pair of powerful lungs, which are ably seconded by a foghorn voice, and he howls at the other man like an enraged bull. The other man doesn't seem to mind it, though, and keeps up his end of the controversy, or whatever it is, in a comparatively cool and aggravating manner. That seems to feed Mudoragana's righteous wrath, until I quite expect to see that outraged person reach down one of the swords off the wall and hack his opponent into sausage meat. Once I venture to inquire, as far as one can inquire by pantomime, what they are quarrelling so violently about me for, being really inquisitive to find out. They both immediately cease hostilities to assure me that it is nothing for which I am in any way personally responsible, and then they straightway fall to glaring savagely at each other again, and renew their vocal warfare more vigorously, if anything, from having just drawn a peaceful breath. Mine host of Cachahorda can scarcely be called a very civilized or refined individual. He has neither the gentle kindliness of Kirkorada Vartarian, nor the dignified gentlemanly bearing of Tiftik Gioglu Effendi. But he grabs a club, and roaring like the hoarse whistle of a Mississippi steamboat, chases a crowd of villagers out of the room who venture to come in on purpose, to stare rudely at his guest. And for this charitable action alone, 
he deserves much credit. Nothing is so annoying as to have these unwashed crowds standing, gazing, and commenting while one is eating. A man is sent with me to direct me aright where the road forks, a mile or so from the village. From the forks it is a newly made road, in fact unfinished. It resembles a ploughed field for looseness and depth. And when, in addition to this, one has to climb a gradient of twenty metres to the hundred, a bicycle is anything but a comforting thing to possess. The country becomes more broken and more mountainous than ever, and the road winds about fearfully. Often a part of the road that is but a mile away as the crow flies requires an hour's steady going to reach it, but the mountain scenery is glorious. Occasionally I round a point or reach a summit, from whence a magnificent and comprehensive view bursts upon the vision, and it really requires an effort to tear oneself away, realizing that in all probability I shall never see it again. At one point I seem to be overlooking a vast amphitheatre which encompasses within itself the physical geography of a continent. It is traversed by whole mountain ranges of lesser degree. It contains tracts of stony desert and fertile valley, lakes and a river, not excepting even the completing element of a fine forest and encompassing it round about like an impenetrable palisade protecting it against invasion are scores of grand old mountains grim sentinels that nothing can overcome the road though still among the mountains is now descending in a general way from the elevated divide down toward enderes and the valley of the gevmeili chai river and toward evening I enter an Armenian village. The custom from here eastward appears to be to have the threshing floors in or near the village. There are sometimes several different floors, and when they are winnowing the grain on windy days, the whole village becomes covered with an inch or two of chaff. I am glad to find these threshing floors in the villages, because they give me an excellent opportunity to ride and satisfy the people, thus saving me no end of worry and annoyance. The air becomes chilly after sundown, and I am shown into a close room containing one small air hole, and am provided with a quilt and pillow. Later in the evening a Turkish bay arrives with an escort of Zaptes and occupies the same apartment, which would seem to be a room especially provided for the accommodation of travellers. The moment the officer arrives, behold, there is a hurrying to and fro of the villagers to sweep out the room, kindle a fire to brew his coffee, and to bring him water and a vessel for his ablutions before saying his evening prayers. Cringing servility characterizes the demeanor of these Armenian villagers toward the Turkish officer, and their hurrying hither and thither to supply him ere they are asked, looks to me wonderfully like a propitiating of the gods. The bey himself seems to be a pretty good sort of a fellow, offering me a portion of his supper, consisting of bread, olives, and onions, which, however, I decline, having already ordered eggs and pilau of a villager. The bay's company is highly acceptable, since it saves me from the annoyance of being surrounded by the usual ragged, unwashed crowd during the evening, and secures me a refreshing sleep, undisturbed by visions of purloined straps or moccasins. He appears to be a very pious Musulman, after washing his head, hands, and feet, he kneels toward Mecca on the wet towel and prays for nearly twenty minutes by my timepiece, and his sighs of Allah are wonderfully deep-fetched, 
coming apparently from clear down in his stomach. While he is thus devotionally engaged, his two zaptes stand respectfully by and divide their time between eyeing myself and the bicycle with wonder and the bay with mingled reverence and awe. At early dawn I steal noiselessly away to avoid disturbing the peaceful slumbers of the bay. For several miles my road winds around among the foothills of the range I crossed yesterday, but following a gradually widening depression which finally terminates in the Gevmeili Chai Valley, and directly ahead and below me lies the considerable town of Enderes, surrounded by a broad fringe of apple orchards and walnut and jujube groves. Here I obtain a substantial breakfast of Turkish kebabs, tidbits of mutton spitted on a skewer and broiled over a charcoal fire, at a public eating khan, after which the mudir kindly undertakes to explain to me the best route to Erzingan, giving me the names of several villages to inquire for as a guidance. While talking to the mudir, Mr. Pronati, an Italian engineer in the employ of the Sivas Valley, makes his appearance, shakes hands, reminds me that Italy has recently volunteered assistance to England in the Sudan campaign, and then conducts me to his quarters in another part of the town. Mr. Pronati can speak almost any language but English. I speak next to nothing but English. Nevertheless, we manage to converse quite readily, for besides proficiency in pantomimic language acquired by daily practice, I have necessarily picked up a few scattering words of the vernacular of the several countries traversed on the tour. While discussing a nice ripe watermelon with this gentleman, several respectable-looking people enter and introduce themselves through Mr. Pronati as Osmanli Turks, not Armenians, expecting me to regard them more favorably on that account. Soon afterward a party of Armenians arrive and take labored pains to impress upon me that they are not Turks but Christian Armenians. Both parties seem desirous of winning my favorable opinion. One party thinks the surest plan is to let me know that they are Turks, the others to let me know that they are not Turks. I have told both parties to go to Gehenna, says my Italian friend. These people will worry you to death with their foolishness if you make the mistake of treating them with consideration. Donning an Indian pith helmet that is three sizes too large, and well-nigh conceals his features, Mr. Pronati orders his horse, and accompanies me some distance out to put me on the proper course to Erzingan. My route from Enderes leads along a lovely fertile valley, between lofty mountain ranges, an intricate network of irrigating ditches, fed by mountain streams, affords an abundance of water for wheat fields, vineyards, and orchards. It is the best, and yet the worst watered valley I ever saw, the best because the irrigating ditches are so numerous, the worst because most of them are overflowing and converting my road into mud holes and shallow pools. In the afternoon I reach somewhat higher ground where the road becomes firmer, and I bowl merrily along eastward, interrupted by nothing save the necessity of dismounting and shedding my nether garments every few minutes to ford a broad, swift feeder to the lesser ditches lower down the valley. In this fructiferous vale, my road sometimes leads through areas of vineyards surrounded by low mud walls, where grapes can be had for the reaching and where the proprietor of an orchard will shake down a shower of delicious yellow pears for whatever you like to give him, or for nothing, if one wants him to. I suppose these villagers have established prices for their commodities when dealing with each other, but they almost invariably refuse to charge me anything. 
some will absolutely refuse any payment, and my only plan of recompensing them is to give money to the children. Others accept with as great a show of gratitude as if I were simply giving it to them without having received an equivalent, whatever I choose to give. The numerous irrigating ditches have retarded my progress to an appreciable extent today, so that, notwithstanding the early start and the absence of mountain climbing, my cyclometer registers but a gain of thirty-seven miles, when having continued my eastward course for some time after nightfall, and failing to reach a village, I commence looking around for somewhere to spend the night. The valley of the Gevmeli Chai has been left behind, and I am again traversing a narrow, rocky pass between the hills. Among the rocks I discover a small open cave, in which I determine to spend the night. The region is elevated and the night air chilly, so I gather together some dry weeds and rubbish and kindle a fire. With something to cook and eat, and a pair of blankets, I could have spent a reasonably comfortable night, but a pocket full of pears has to suffice for supper, and when the unsubstantial fuel is burned away, my airy chamber on the bleak mountainside and the thin cambric tent affords little protection from the insinuating chilliness of the night air. Variety is said to be the spice of life. No doubt it is under certain conditions, but I think it all depends on the conditions whether it is spicy or not spicy. For instance, the vicissitudes of fortune that favour me with bread and sour milk for dinner, a few pears for supper and a wakeful night of shivering discomfort in a cave, as the reward of wading fifty irrigating ditches and traversing thirty miles of ditch bedeviled donkey trails during the day, may look spicy and even romantic from a distance. But when one wakes up in a cold shiver about one thirty a.m. and realizes that several hours of wretchedness are before him, his waking thoughts are apt to be anything but thoughts complimentary of the spiciness of the situation. Inshallah, fortune will favor me with better dues tomorrow, and if not tomorrow, then the next day or the next. End of section 34. Section 35 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 17, Part 1. Through Erzingham and Erzurum. Chapter 17. Through Erzingen and Erzurum. For mile after mile on the following morning, my route leads through broad areas strewn with boulders and masses of rock that appear to have been brought down from the adjacent mountains by the annual spring floods. Caused by the melting winter snows, scattering wheat fields are observed here and there on the higher patches of ground which look like small yellow oases amid the desert-like area of loose rocks surrounding them. Squads of diminutive donkeys are seen picking their weary way through the boulders, toiling from the isolated fields to the village threshing floors beneath small mountains of wheat sheaves. Sometimes the donkeys themselves are invisible below the general level of the boulders, and nothing is to be seen but the head and shoulders of a man, persuading before him several animated heaps of straw. Small lakes of accumulated surface water are passed in depressions having no outlet. Thickets and bulrushes are growing around the edges, and the surfaces of some are fairly black with multitudes of wild ducks. Soon I reach an Armenian village. After satisfying the popular curiosity by riding around their threshing floor, they bring me some excellent wheat bread, 
thick oval cakes that are quite acceptable, compared with the wafer-like sheets of the past several days, and five boiled eggs. The people providing these will not accept any direct payment, no doubt thinking my having provided them with the only real entertainment most of them ever saw, a fair equivalent for their breakfast. But it seems too much like robbing paupers to accept anything from these people without returning something, so I give money to the children. These villagers seem utterly destitute of manners, standing around and watching my efforts to eat soft-boiled eggs with a pocket-knife with undisguised merriment. I inquire for a spoon, but they evidently prefer to extract amusement from watching my interesting attempts with a pocket-knife. One of them finally fetches a clumsy wooden ladle, three times broader than an egg, which, of course, is worse than nothing. Now I traverse a mountainous country with a remarkably clear atmosphere. The mountains are of a light, cream-colored, shaly composition. Wherever a living stream of water is found, there also is a village, with clusters of trees. From points where a comprehensive view is obtainable, the effect of these dark green spots, scattered here and there among the whitish hills, seen through the clear, rarefied atmosphere, is most beautiful. It seems a peculiar feature of everything in the East, not only the cities themselves, but even of the landscape, to look beautiful and enchanting at a distance. But, upon a closer approach, all its beauty vanishes like an illusory dream. Spots that from a distance look, amid their barren, sun-blistered surroundings, like lovely bits of fairyland, upon closer investigation degenerate into wretched habitations of ragged, poverty-stricken people having about them a few neglected orchards and vineyards and a couple of dozen straggling willows and jujubes for many hours again to-day i am traversing mountains mountains nothing but mountains following tortuous camel paths far up their giant slopes sometimes these camel paths are splendidly smooth and make most excellent riding at one place particularly, where they wind horizontally around the mountainside, hundreds of feet above a village immediately below, it is as though the villagers were in the pit of a vast amphitheater, and myself were wheeling around a semicircular platform five hundred feet above them, but in plain view of them all. I can hear the wonderstruck villagers calling each other's attention to the strange apparition, and can observe them swarming upon the housetops. What wonderful stories the inhabitants of this particular village will have to recount to their neighbors, of this marvelous sight, concerning which their own unaided minds can give no explanation. Noontide comes and goes without bringing me any dinner, when I emerge upon a small, cultivated plateau and descry a coterie of industrious females reaping together in a field nearby and straightway turn my footsteps thitherward with a view of ascertaining whether they happen to have any eatables. No sooner do they observe me trundling toward them than they ingloriously flee the field, thoughtlessly leaving bag and baggage to the tender mercies of a ruthless invader. Among their effects I find some bread and a cucumber, which I forthwith confiscate, leaving a two-and-a-half piaster metallic piece in its stead. The affrighted women are watching me from the safe distance of three hundred yards. When they return and discover the coin, they will wish some cycler would happen along and frighten them away on similar conditions every day. Later in the afternoon, I find myself wandering along the wrong trail, not a very unnatural occurrence hereabout, for since leaving the valley of the Jivmaili Kai, it has been difficult to distinguish the Erzingan Trail from the numerous other trails intersecting the country in every direction. On such a journey as this one seems to acquire a certain amount of instinct concerning roads. Certain it is that I never traverse a wrong trail any distance these days ere, without any tangible evidence whatever, I feel instinctively that I am going astray. A party of camel drivers direct me toward the lost Erzingen Trail, and in an hour I am following a tributary of the ancient Lycus River, along a valley where everything looks marvelously green and refreshing. It is as though I have been suddenly transferred into an entirely different country. 
This innovation from barren rocks and sun-baked shale to a valley where the principal crops seem to be alfalfa and clover, and which is flanked on the south by dense forests of pine encroaching downward from the mountain slopes clear on to the level greensward, is rather an agreeable surprise. The secret of the magic change does not remain a secret long. It reveals itself in the shape of sundry broad snow patches still lingering on the summits of a higher mountain range beyond. These pine forests, the pleasant green sward, and the lingering snow banks tell an oft repeated tale. They speak eloquently of forests preserved and the winter snowfall thereby increased they speak all the more eloquently because of being surrounded by barren parched-up hills which under like conditions might produce similar happy results but which now produce nothing while traversing this smiling valley i meet a man asleep on a buffalo araba an irrigating ditch runs parallel with the road and immediately alongside the meek-eyed buffaloes swerve into the ditch in deference to their awe of the bicycle ere it upset a drowsy driver into the water. The male evidently stands in need of a bath, but somehow he doesn't seem to appreciate it. Perhaps it happened a trifle too impromptu, as it were, to suit his easy-going Asiatic temperament. He returns my rude, unsympathetic smile with a prolonged stare of bewilderment, but says nothing. Soon I meet a boy riding on a donkey and ask him the postaya distance to Erzingen. The youth looks frightened, half out of his senses, but manages to retain sufficient presence of mind to elevate one finger, by which I understand him to mean that it is one hour, or about four miles. Accordingly, I pedal perseveringly ahead, hoping to reach the city before dusk, at the same time feeling rather surprised at finding it so near as I haven't been expecting to reach there before tomorrow. Five miles beyond where I met the boy, and just after sundown, I overtake some Katirjis en route to Erzingen with donkey loads of grain, and ask them the same question. From them I learn that instead of one, it is not less than twelve hours distant, also that the trail leads over a fearfully mountainous country. Nestling at the base of the mountains, a short distance to the northward, is the large village of Merisarif, and not caring to tempt the fates into giving me another supperless night in a cold, cheerless cave, I wend my way thither. Fortune throws me into the society of an Armenian, whose chief anxiety seems to be, first, that I shall thoroughly understand that he is an Armenian, and not a Mussulman and secondly, to hasten me into the presence of the Mudir, who is a Mussulman, and a Turkish Bey, in order that he may bring himself into the Mudir's favorable notice by personally introducing me as a rare novelty on to his, the Mudir's, threshing floor. The official and a few friends are sipping coffee in one corner of the threshing floor, and although I don't much relish my position of the Armenian's puppet show, I give the mudir an exhibition of the bicycle's use, in the expectation that he will invite me to remain his guest overnight. He proves uncourteous, however, not even inviting me to partake of coffee. Evidently, he has become so thoroughly accustomed to the abject servility of the Armenians about him, who would never think of expecting reciprocating courtesies from a social superior, that he has unconsciously come to regard everybody else, save those whom he knows as his official superiors, as tarred, more or less, with the same feather. In consequence of this belief, I am not a little gratified when, upon the point of leaving the threshing floor, an occasion offers of teaching him different. Other friends of the Mudirs appear upon the scene just as I am leaving, and he beckons me to come back and bin for the enlightenment of the new arrivals. The Armenian's countenance fairly beams with importance at thus being, as it were, encored, and the collected villagers murmur their approval. But I answer the Mudirs' beckoned invitation by a negative wave of the hand, signifying that I can't bother with him any further. The common herd around regard this self-assertive reply with open-mouthed astonishment, as though quite too incredible for belief. It seems to them an act of almost criminal discourtesy, 
and those immediately about me seem almost inclined to take me back to the threshing floor like a culprit. But the Moodir himself is not such a blockhead, but that he realizes the mistake he has made. He is too proud to acknowledge it, though. Consequently, his friends miss, perhaps, the only opportunity in their uneventful lives of seeing a bicycle ridden. Owing to my ignorance of the vernacular, I am compelled to drift, more or less, with the tide of circumstances about me. Upon entering one of these villages, for accommodation, and make the best of whatever capricious chance provides, my Armenian manager now delivers me into the hands of one of his compatriots, from whom I obtain supper and a quilt, sleeping, from a not over-extensive choice, on some straw beneath the broad eaves of a long granary adjoining the house. I am for once quite mistaken in making an early breakfastless start, for it proves to be eighteen weary miles over a rocky mountain pass before another human habitation is reached a region of jagged rocks deep gorges and scattered pines fortunately however i am not destined to travel the whole eighteen miles in a breakfastless condition not quite a breakfastless condition perhaps half the distance is traversed when while trundling up the ascent i meet a party of horsemen a turbaned old turk with an escort of three zaptias and another traveller who is keeping pace with them for company and safety the old turk asks me to bin bekalim supplementing the request by calling my attention to his turban a gorgeously spangled affair that would seem to indicate the wearer to be a personage of some importance i observe also that the butt of his revolver is of pearl inlaid with gold another indication of either rank or opulence having turned about and granted his request i in turn call his attention to the fact that mountain climbing on an empty stomach is anything but satisfactory or agreeable and give him a broad hint by inquiring how far it is before ekmek is obtainable for a reply he orders a zaptia to produce a wheaten cake from his saddle-bags and the other traveller voluntarily contributes three apples which he ferrets out from the ample folds of his cummerbund and off this I make a breakfast. Toward noon, the highest elevation of the pass is reached, and I commence the descent toward the Erzingen Valley, following for a number of miles the course of a tributary of the western fork of the Euphrates, known among the natives in a general sense as the Frat. This particular branch is locally termed the Karasu, or Black Water. The stream and my road lead down a rocky defile between towering hills of rock and slaty formation, whose precipitous slopes vegetable nature seems to shun, and everything looks black and desolate, as though some blighting curse had fallen upon the place. Up this same rocky passageway, eight summers ago, swarmed thousands of wretched refugees from the seat of war in eastern Armenia small oblong mounds of loose rocks and boulders are frequently observed all down the ravine mournful reminders of one of the most heart-rendering phases of the armenian campaign green lizards are scuttling about among the rude graves making their habitations in the oblong mounds about two o'clock i arrive at a roadside khan where an ancient osmanli dispenses feeds of grain for travellers animals and brews coffee for the travellers themselves, besides furnishing them with whatever he happens to possess in the way of eatables to such as are unfortunately obliged to patronize his cuisine or go without anything. Among this latter class belongs, unhappily, my hungry self. Upon inquiring for refreshments, the kanji conducts me to a rear apartment and exhibits for my inspection the contents of two jars, one containing the native idea of butter, and the other the native conception of a soft variety of cheese. What difference is discoverable between these two kindred products is chiefly a difference in the degree of rancidity and odoriferousness, in which respect the cheese plainly carries off the honors. In fact, these venerable and estimable qualities of the cheese are so remarkably developed that after one cautious peep into its receptacle, I forbear to investigate their comparative excellencies any further. 
but obtaining some bread and a portion of the comparatively mild and inoffensive butter, I proceed to make the best of circumstances. The old Kanji proves himself a thoughtful, considerate landlord, for as I eat he busies himself picking the most glaringly conspicuous hairs out of my butter with the point of his dagger. One is usually somewhat squeamish regarding hirsute butter, but all such little refinements of civilized life as hairless butter or strained milk have to be winked at to a greater or less extent in Asiatic traveling, especially when depending solely on what happens to turn up from one meal to another. The narrow, lonely defile continues for some miles eastward from the Khan, and ere I emerge from it altogether I encounter a couple of ill-starved natives who venture upon an effort to intimidate me into yielding up my purse. A certain Mahmoud Ali and his band of enterprising freebooters have been terrorizing the villagers and committing highway robberies of late around the country. But from the general appearance of these two, as they approach, I take them to be merely villagers returning home from Erzingen afoot. They are armed with Circassian guardless swords and flintlock horse pistols. Upon meeting, they address some question to me in Turkish, to which I make my customary reply of Takchi Binmus. One of them then demands para, money, in a manner that leaves something of a doubt whether he means it for begging or is ordering me to deliver. In order to better discover their intentions, I pretend not to understand, whereupon the spokesman reveals their meaning plain enough by reiterating the demand in a tone meant to be intimidating, and half unsheathes his sword in a significant manner. Intuitively, the precise situation of affairs seems to reveal itself in a moment. They are but ordinarily inoffensive villagers returning from Erzingen, where they have sold and squandered even the donkeys they rode to town, meeting me alone, and, as they think in the absence of outward evidence that I am unarmed, they have become possessed of the idea of retrieving their fortunes by intimidating me out of money. Never were men more astonished and taken aback at finding me armed, and they both turn pale and fairly shiver with fright as I produce the Smith & Wesson from its inconspicuous position at my hip and hold it on a level with the bold spokesman's head. They both look as if they expected their last hour had arrived, and both seem incapable either of utterance or of running away. In fact, their embarrassment is so ridiculous that it provokes a smile, and it is with anything but a threatening or angry voice that I bid them Haiti. The bold highwaymen seem only too thankful of a chance to Haiti, and they look quite confused and I fancy even ashamed of themselves as they betake themselves off up the ravine. I am quite as thankful as themselves at getting off without the necessity of using my revolver, for had I killed or badly wounded one of them, it would probably have caused no end of trouble or vexatious delay, especially in case they prove to be what I take them for, instead of professional robbers. Moreover, I might not have gotten off unscathed myself, for while their ancient flintlocks were in all probability not even loaded, being worn more for appearances by the native than anything else, these fellows sometimes do desperate work with their ugly and ever handy swords when cornered up, in proof of which we have the late dastardly assault on the British consul at Etzerum, of which we shall doubtless hear the particulars upon reaching that city. Before long, the ravine terminates, and I emerge upon the broad and smiling Erzingen Valley. At the lower extremity of the ravine, the stream has cut its channel through an immense depth of conglomerate formation, a hundred feet of boulders and pebbles cemented together by integrant particles which appear to have been washed down from the mountains, probably during the subsidence of the deluge. For even if that great catastrophe were a comparatively local occurrence, instead of a universal flood, as some profess to believe, we are now gradually creeping up toward Ararat, so that this particular region was undoubtedly submerged. What appear to be petrified chunks of wood are interspersed through the mass. There is nothing new under the sun, they say. Peradventure, they may be sticks of cooking stove wood indignantly cast out of the kitchen window of the ark by Mrs. Noah, because the absent minded patriarch habitually persisted in cutting them three inches too long for the stove. 
Who knows? I now wheel along a smooth, level road leading through several orchard-environed villages. General cultivation and an atmosphere of peace and plenty seems to pervade the valley, which, with its scattering villages amid the foliage of their orchards, looks most charming upon emerging from the gloomy environments of the rock-ribbed and verdureless ravine. A fitting background is presented on the south by a mountain chain of considerable elevation, upon the highest peaks of which still linger tardy patches of snow. Since the occupation of ears by the Russians, the military mantle of that important fortress has fallen upon Erzurum and Erzingen. The booming of cannon fired in honor of the Sultan's birthday is awakening the echoes of the rock-ribbed mountains as I wheel eastward down the valley. And within about three miles of the city, I pass the headquarters of the garrison. Long rows of hundreds of white field tents are ranged about the position on the level greensward. The place presents an animated scene, with the soldiers, some in the ordinary blue, trimmed with red, others in cool, white uniforms, especially provided for the summer, but which they are not unlikely to be found also wearing in winter, owing to the ruinous state of the Ottoman exchequer, and one and all wearing the picturesque but uncomfortable fez. Cannons are booming, drums beating, and bugles playing. From the military headquarters to the city is a splendid broad macadam, converted into a magnificent avenue by rows of trees. It is a general holiday with the military, and the avenue is alive with officers and soldiers going and returning between Erzingen and the camp. The astonishment of the valiant warriors of Islam, as they wheel briskly down the thronged avenue, can be better imagined than described. The soldiers whom I pass immediately commence yelling at their comrades ahead to call their attention while epauletted officers forget for the moment their military dignity and reserve as they turn their affrighted chargers around and gaze after me, stupefied with astonishment. Perhaps they are wondering whether I am not some supernatural being, connected in some way with the celebration of the Sultan's birthday. A winged messenger, perhaps, from the Prophet. Upon reaching the city, I repair at once to the large custom-house caravanserai and engage a room for the night. The proprietor of the rooms seems a sensible fellow, with nothing of the inordinate inquisitiveness of the average native about him, and instead of throwing the weight of his influence and his persuasive powers on the side of the importuning crowd, he authoritatively bids them hidey locks the bicycle in my room, and gives me the key. The Erzingen caravanserai, and all these caravanserais are essentially similar, is a square courtyard surrounded by the four sides of a two-storied brick building. The ground floor is occupied by the offices of the importers of foreign goods, and the custom house authorities. The upper floor is divided into small rooms for the accommodation of travelers and caravan men arriving with goods from Trebizond. Sallying forth in search of supper, I am taken in tow by a couple of Armenians, who volunteer the welcome information that there is an Americanish Hakim in the city. This intelligence is an agreeable surprise for Erzurum is the nearest place in which I have been expecting to find an English-speaking person. While searching about for the Hakim, we pass near the Zaptia headquarters. The officers are enjoying their nargile in the cool evening air outside the building, and, seeing an Englishman, beckon us over. They desire to examine my Tescari, the first occasion on which it has been officially demanded since landing at Izmit, although I have voluntarily produced it on previous occasions, and that Sivas requested the Vali to attach his seal and signature. This is owing to the proximity of Erzingen to the Russian frontier, and the suspicions that any stranger may be, subject of the Tsar, visiting the military centers for sinister reasons. They sent an officer with me to hunt up the resident Pasha. That worthy and enlightened personage is found busily engaged in playing a game of chess with a military officer, and barely takes the trouble to glance at the proffered passport. It is vised by the Sivas Valley, he says, and lackadaisically waves us adieu. 
upon returning to the Zaptia station, a quiet, unassuming American comes forward and introduces himself as Dr. Van Norden, a physician formerly connected with the Persian mission. The doctor is a spare-built and not over-robust man, and would perhaps be considered by most people as a trifle eccentric. Instead of being connected with any missionary organization, he nowadays wanders hither and thither, acquiring knowledge and seeking whom he can persuade from the error of their ways, meanwhile supporting himself by the practice of his profession. Among other interesting things spoken of, he tells me something of his recent journey to Kiva. The doctor pronounces it Kiva. He was surprised, he says, at finding the Kivans, a mild-mannered and harmless sort of people, among whom the carrying of weapons is as much the exception as it is the rule in Asiatic Turkey. Doubtless, the fact of Kiva being under the Russian government has something to do with the latter otherwise unaccountable fact. After supper, we sit down on a newly arrived bale of Manchester calico in the caravanserai court cross one knee, and whittle chips like Michigan Grangers at a crossroads post office, and spend two hours conversing on different topics. The good doctor's mind wanders as naturally into serious channels as water gravitates to its level. When I inquire if he has heard anything of the whereabouts of Mahmoud Ali and his gang lately, the pious doctor replies chiefly by hinting what a glorious thing it is to feel prepared to yield up the ghost at any moment and when I recount something of my experiences on the journey, instead of giving me credit for pluck, like other people, he merely inquires if I don't recognize the protecting hand of providence. Native modesty prevents me telling the doctor of my valuable missionary work at Sivas. After the doctor's departure, I wander forth into the bazaar to see what it looks like after dark. Many of the stalls are closed for the day the principal places remaining open being Kave Khans and Armenian wine shops, and before these petroleum lamps are kept burning, the remainder of the bazaar is in darkness. I have not strolled about many minutes before I am corralled, as usual, by Armenians. They straightway send off for a youthful compatriot of theirs who has been to the missionary school at Kaisaria and can speak a smattering of English. After the usual program of questions, they suggest, Being an Englishman, you are, of course, a Christian, by which they mean that I am not a Mussulman. Certainly, I reply, whereupon they lug me into one of their wine shops and tender me a glass of raki, a corruption of arak, raw, fiery spirits of the kind known among the English soldiers in India by the suggestive pseudonym of fixed bayonets. Smelling the rocky, I make a wry face and shove it away. They look surprised and order the waiter to bring cognac. To save the waiter the trouble, I make another wry face, indicative of disapproval, and suggest that he bring Vishner Sue. Vishner Sue! Two or three of them sing out in a chorus of blank amazement. Ingilis! Christian! Vishner Sue! they exclaim, as though such a preposterous and unaccountable thing as a Christian partaking of a non-intoxicating beverage like Vishnu's Sioux is altogether beyond their comprehension. The youth, who has been to the Kazaria school, then explains to the others that the American missionaries never indulge in intoxicating beverages. This seems to clear away the clouds of their mystification to some extent, and they order Vishnu's Sioux, eyeing me critically, however, as I taste it, as though expecting to observe me make yet another wry countenance, and acknowledge that in refusing the fiery, throat-blistering rocky, I had made a mistake. End of section 35 Recording by William Tomko Section 36 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 17, Part 2. 
through Erzingen and Erzeram. Nothing in the way of bedding or furniture is provided in the caravanserai rooms, but the proprietor gets me plenty of quilts, and I pass a reasonably comfortable night. In the morning I obtain breakfast and manage to escape from town without attracting a crowd of more than a couple of hundred people, a remarkable occurrence in its way, since Erzingen contains a population of about twenty thousand. The road eastward from Erzingen is level, but heavy with dust, leading through a low portion of the valley that earlier in the season is swampy, and gives the city an unenviable reputation for malarial fevers. To prevent the travelers drinking the unwholesome water in this part of the valley, some benevolent Mussulman or public-spirited pasha has erected at intervals, by the roadside, compact mud huts, and placed there, in huge earthenware vessels holding perhaps fifty gallons each, these are kept supplied with pure spring water and provided with a wooden drinking scoop. Fourteen miles from Erzingen, at the entrance to a ravine, whence flows the boisterous stream that supplies a goodly proportion of the irrigating water for the valley, is situated a military outpost station. My road runs within two hundred yards of the building, and the officers, seeing me evidently intending to pass without stopping, motion for me to halt. I know well enough they want to examine my passport, and also to satisfy their curiosity concerning the bicycle but determine upon spurting ahead and escaping their bother altogether. This movement at once arouses the official suspicion as to my being in the country without proper authority, and causes them to attach some mysterious significance to my strange vehicle, and several soldiers forthwith receive racing orders to intercept me. Unfortunately, my spurting receives a prompt check at the stream, which is not bridged, and here the doughty warriors intercept my progress, taking me into custody with broad grins of satisfaction, as though pretty certain of having made an important capture. Since there is no escaping, I conclude to have a little quiet amusement out of the affair, anyway, so I refuse point-blank to accompany my captors to their officer, knowing full well that any show of reluctance will have the very natural effect of arousing their suspicion still further. The bland and childlike soldiers of the Crescent received this show of obstinacy quite complacently, their swarthy countenances wreathed in knowing smiles. But they make no attempt at compulsion, satisfying themselves with addressing me deferentially as Effendi, and trying to coax me to accompany them. Seeing that there is some difficulty about bringing me, the two officers come down, and I at once affect righteous indignation of a mild order and desire to know what they mean by arresting my progress. They demand my tescari in a manner that plainly shows their doubts of my having one. The tescari is produced. One of the officers then whispers something to the other, and they both glance knowingly mysterious at the bicycle, apologize for having detained me, and want to shake hands. Having read the passport, and satisfied themselves of my nationality, they attach some deep mysterious significance to my journey in this incomprehensible manner up in this particular quarter, but they no longer wish to offer any impediment to my progress, but rather to render me assistance. Poor fellows! How suspicious they are of their great overgrown neighbor to the north! What good-humored fellows these Turkish soldiers are! What simple-hearted, overgrown children! What a pity that they are the victims of a criminally incompetent government that neither pays, feeds, nor clothes them a quarter as well as they deserve. In the fearful winters of Erzurum, they have been known to have no clothing to wear but the linen suits provided for the hot weather. Their pay, insignificant though it be, is as uncertain as gambling, but they never raise a murmur. Being by nature and religion fatalists, they cheerfully accept these undeserved hardships as the will of Allah. Today is the hottest I have experienced in Asia Minor, and soon after leaving the outpost I once more encounter the everlasting mountains. Follow now the Trebizond and Erzingen caravan trail. Once again I get benighted in the mountains, and push ahead for some time after dark. 
I am beginning to think of camping out supperless again when I hear the creaking of a buffalo araba some distance ahead. Soon I overtake it, and, following it for half a mile off the trail, I find myself before an enclosure of several acres, surrounded by a high stone wall with quite imposing gateways. It is the walled village of Hasobegan, one of those places built especially for the accommodation of the Trebizond caravans in the winter. I am conducted into a large apartment, which appears to be set apart for the hospitable accommodation of travellers. The apartment is found already occupied by three travellers, who, from their outward appearance, might well be taken for cutthroats of the worst description, and the villagers swarming in, I am soon surrounded by the usual ragged, flea-bitten congregation. There are various arms and warlike accoutrements hanging on the wall, enough of one kind or another to arm a small company. They all belong to the three travellers, however. My modest little revolver seems really nothing compared with the warlike display of swords, daggers, pistols, and guns hanging around. The place looks like a small armory. The first question is, as is usual of late, Russ or Ingilis? Some of the younger and less experienced men essay to doubt my word, and, on their own supposition that I am a Russian, begin to take unwarrantable liberties with my person. One of them steals up behind and commences playing a tattoo on my helmet with two sticks of wood, by way of bravado, and showing his contempt for a subject of the Tsar. Turning around, I take one of the sticks away and chastise him with it until he howls for Allah to protect him, and then, without attempting any sort of explanation to the others, resume my seat. One of the travellers then solemnly places his forefingers together and announces himself as Kardash, my brother, at the same time pointing significantly to his choice assortment of ancient weapons. I shake hands with him and remind him that I am somewhat hungry, whereupon he orders a villager to forthwith contribute six eggs, another butter to fry them in, and a third bread. A Tezek fire is already burning, and with his own hands he fries the eggs, and makes my ragged audience stand at a respectful distance while I eat. If I were to ask him, he would probably clear the room of them instanter. About ten o'clock my impromptu friend and his companion order their horses, and buckle their arms and accoutrement about them to depart. My brother stands before me and loads up his flintlock rifle. It is a fearful and wonderful process. It takes him at least two minutes. He does not seem to know on which particular part of his wonderful paraphernalia to find the slugs, the powder, or the patching, and he finishes by tearing a piece of rag off a bystanding villager to place over the powder in the pan. While he is doing all this, and especially when ramming home the bullet, he looks at me as though expecting me to come and pat him approvingly on the shoulder. When they are gone, the third traveller, who is going to remain overnight, edges up beside me, and, pointing to his own imposing armory, likewise announces himself as my brother. Thus do I unexpectedly acquire two brothers within the brief space of an evening. The villagers scatter to their respective quarters. Quilts are provided for me, and a ghostly light is maintained by means of a cup of grease and a twisted rag. In one corner of the room is a paunchy youngster of ten or twelve summers, whom I noticed during the evening as being without a single garment to cover his nakedness. He has partly inserted himself into a largo, coarse nose-bag, and lies curled up in that ridiculous position, probably imagining himself in quite comfortable quarters. O oh, wretched youth! I mentally exclaim. What will you do when that nose-bag has petered out? and soon afterward I fall asleep, in happy consciousness of perfect security beneath the protecting shadow of Brother Number Two and his formidable armament of ancient weapons. Ten miles of good rideable road from Housing Begham, I again descend into the valley of the west fork of the Euphrates, crossing the river on an ancient stone bridge, I left Hausenbeckon without breakfasting, preferring to make my customary early start and trust to luck. I am beginning to doubt the propriety of having done so, and find myself casting involuntary glances toward a Kurdish camp that is visible some miles to the north of my route, when, 
upon rounding a mountain spur jutting out into the valley, I descried the minaret of Mamakatun in the distance ahead. A minaret hereabout is a sure indication of a town of sufficient importance to support a public eating khan, where, if not a very elegant, at least a substantial meal is to be obtained. I obtain an acceptable breakfast of kebabs and boiled sheep's trotters. Killing two birds with one stone by satisfying my own appetite, and at the same time giving a first-class entertainment to a khan full of wondering-eyed people, by eating with a khanji's carving knife and fork in preference to my fingers. Here, as at Hausenbeck Khan, there is a splendid large caravanserai. Here it is built chiefly of hewn stone, and almost massive enough for a fortress. This is a mountainous elevated region, where the winters are stormy and severe, and these commodious and substantial retreats are absolutely necessary for the safety of Erzingen and Trebizond caravans during the winter. The country now continues hilly rather than mountainous. The road is generally too heavy with sand and dust, churned up by the Erzingen mule caravans, to admit of riding wherever the grade is unfavorable but much good wheeling service is encountered on long, gentle declivities and comparatively level stretches. During the forenoon I meet a company of three splendidly armed and mounted Circassians. They remain speechless with astonishment until I have passed beyond their hearing. They then conclude among themselves that I am something needing investigation. They come galloping after me, and having caught up, their spokesman gravely delivers himself of the solitary monosyllable, Rus? Ingles? I reply, and they resume the even tenor of their way without questioning me further. Later in the day, the hilly country develops into a mountainous region, where the trail intersects numerous deep ravines whose sides are all but perpendicular. Between the ravines, the riding is oft-times quite excellent, the composition being soft shale that packs down hard and smooth beneath the animal's feet deliciously cool streams flow at the bottom of these ravines at one crossing i find an old man washing his feet and mournfully surveying sundry holes in the bottom of his sandals the day is hot and i likewise halt a few minutes to cool my pedal extremities in the crystal water with that childlike simplicity I have so often mentioned, and which is nowhere encountered as in the Asiatic Turk, the old fellow blandly asks me to exchange my comparatively sound moccasins for his worn-out sandals, at the same time ruefully pointing out the dilapidated condition of the latter, and looking as dejected as though it were the only pair of sandals in the world. This afternoon I am passing along the same road where Mahmoud Ali's gang robbed a large party of Armenian harvesters who had been south to help harvest the wheat, and were returning home in a body with the wages earned during the summer. This happened but a few days before, and notwithstanding the well-known saying that lightning never strikes twice in the same place, one is scarcely so unimpressionable as not to find himself involuntarily scanning his surroundings half expecting to be attacked. Nothing startling turns up, however, and at five o'clock I come to a village which is enveloped in clouds of wheat chaff. Being a breezy evening, winnowing is going briskly forward on several threshing floors. After duly binning, I am taken under the protecting wing of a prominent villager who is walking about with his hand in a sling. The reason whereof is a crushed finger. He is a sensible, intelligent fellow, and accepts my reply that I am not a crushed finger Hakim with all reasonableness. He provides a substantial supper of bread and yaourt, and then installs me in a small, windowless, unventilated apartment adjoining the buffalo stall, provides me with quilts, lights a primitive grease lamp, and retires. During the evening, the entire female population visit my dimly lighted quarters to satisfy their feminine curiosity by taking a timid peep at their neighbor's strange guest and his wonderful araba. They imagine I am asleep and come on tiptoe part way across the room, craning their necks to obtain a view in the semi-darkness. An hour's journey from this village brings me yet again into the West Euphrates Valley. Just where I enter the valley, the river spreads itself over a wide stony bed, 
coursing along in the form of several comparatively small streams. There is, of course, no bridge here, and in the chilly, almost frosty morning I have to disrobe and carry clothes and bicycle across the several channels. Once across, I find myself on the great Trebizond and Persian caravan route, and in a few minutes am partaking of breakfast in a village thirty-five miles from Erzeran, where I learn with no little satisfaction that my course follows along the Euphrates Valley, with an artificial wagon road, the whole distance to the city. Not far from the village the Euphrates is recrossed on a new stone bridge. Just beyond the bridge is the camp of a road engineer's party, who are putting the finishing touches to the bridge. A person issues from one of the tents as I approach, and begins chattering away at me in French. The face and voice indicates a female, but the costume consists of jack boots, tight-fitting broadcloth pantaloons, an ordinary pilot jacket, and a fez. Notwithstanding the masculine apparel, however, it turns out not only to be a woman, but a Parisienne, the better half of the Erzurum road engineer, a Frenchman, who now appears upon the scene. They are both astonished and delighted at seeing a velocipede, a reminder of their own far-off France, on the Persian caravan trail, and they urge me to remain and partake of coffee. I now encounter the first really great camel caravans, en route to Persia with tea and sugar and general European merchandise. They are all camped for the day alongside the road, and the camels scattered about the neighboring hills in search of giant thistles and other outlandish vegetation, for which the patient ship of the desert entertains a partiality. Camel caravans travel entirely at night during the summer. Contrary to what, I think, is a common belief in the Occident, they can endure any amount of cold weather, but are comparatively distressed by the heat. Still, this may not characterize all breeds of camels any more than the different breeds of other domesticated animals. During the summer, when the camels are required to find their own sustenance along the road, a large caravan travels but a wretched eight miles a day, the remainder of the time being occupied in filling his capacious thistle and camel thorn receptacle. This comes of the scarcity of good grazing along the route compared with the number of camels and the consequent necessity of wandering far and wide in search of pasturage rather than because of the camel's absorbative capacity for he is a comparatively abstemious animal in the winter they are fed on balls of barley flour called nawala on this they keep fat and strong and travel three times the distance the average load of a full-grown camel is about seven hundred pounds before reaching Erzurum, I have a narrow escape from what might have proved a serious accident. I meet a buffalo araba carrying a long projecting stick of timber. The sleepy buffaloes pay no heed to the bicycle until I arrive opposite their heads, when they give a sudden lurch sidewise, swinging the stick of timber across my path. Fortunately, the road happens to be of good width, and by a very quick swerve I avoid a collision but the tail end of the timber just brushes the rear wheel as I wheel past. Soon after noon, I roll into Erzurum, or rather up to the Trebizond Gate, and dismount. Erzurum is a fortified city of considerable importance, both from a commercial and a military point of view. It is surrounded by earthwork fortifications, from the parapets of which large siege guns frown forth upon the surrounding country and forts are erected in several commanding positions round about, like watchdogs stationed outside to guard the city. Patches of snow linger on the Palantokan Mountains, a few miles to the south. The Dev Boyu Hills, a spur of the greater Palantokans, look down on the city from the east. The broad valley of the West Euphrates stretches away westward and northward, terminating at the north in another mountain range. Repairing to the English consulate, I am gratified at finding several letters awaiting me, and furthermore by the cordial hospitality extended by Yosef Effendi, an Assyrian gentleman, the charge d'affaires of the consulate for the time being. Colonel E., 
the consul, having left recently for Trebizond and England, in consequence of numerous sword wounds received at the hands of a desperado who invaded the consulate for plunder at midnight. The colonel was a general favorite in Erzurum, and is being tenderly carried, Thursday, September 3, 1885, to Trebizond on a stretcher by relays of willing natives, no less than forty accompanying him on the road. Yusuf Effendi tells me the story of the whole lamentable affair, pausing at intervals to heap imprecations on the head of the malefactor and to bestow eulogies on the wounded consul's character. It seems that the doorkeeper of the consulate, a native of a neighboring Armenian village, was awakened at midnight by an acquaintance from the same village, who begged to be allowed to share his quarters till morning. No sooner had the servant admitted him to his room than he attacked him with his sword, intending, as it afterward leaked out, to murder the whole family, rob the house, and escape. The servant's cries for assistance awakened Colonel E., who came to his rescue without taking the trouble to provide himself with a weapon. The man, infuriated at the detection and the prospect of being captured and brought to justice, turned savagely on the consul inflicting several severe wounds on the head, hands, and face. The consul closed with him and threw him down, and called for his wife to bring his revolver. The wretch now begged so piteously for his life, and made such specious promises, that the consul magnanimously let him up, neglecting, doubtless owing to his own dazed condition from the scalp wounds, to disarm him. Immediately he found himself released, he commenced the attack again cutting and slashing like a demon, knocking the revolver from the consul's already badly wounded hand. While he yet hesitated to pull the trigger and take his treacherous assailant's life. The revolver went off as it struck the floor and wounded the consul himself in the leg. Broke it. The servant now rallied sufficiently to come to his assistance, and together they succeeded in disarming the robber who, however, escaped and bolted upstairs, followed by the servant with the sword. The consul's wife, with praiseworthy presence of mind, now appeared with a second revolver, which her husband grasped in his left hand, the right being almost hacked to pieces. Dazed and faint with the loss of blood, and, moreover, blinded by the blood flowing from the scalp wounds, it was only by sheer strength of will that he could keep from falling. At this juncture, the servant, unfortunately, appeared on the stairs, returning from an unsuccessful pursuit of the robber. Mistaking the servant with the sword in his hand for the desperado returning to the attack, and realizing his own helpless condition, the consul fired two shots at him, wounding him with both shots. The would-be murderer is now, September 3, 1885, captured and in durance vile. The servant lies here in a critical condition, and the consul and his sorrowing family are en route to England. Having determined upon resting here until Monday, I spend a good part of Friday looking about the city. The population is a mixture of Turks, Armenians, Russians, Persians, and Jews. Here I first make the acquaintance of a Persian chai khan, tea drinking shop. With the exception of the difference in the beverage, there is little difference between a chai khan and a ikahve khan, although in the case of a swell establishment, the chai khan blossoms forth quite gaudily with scores of colored lamps. The tea is served scalding hot in tiny glasses, which are first half filled with loaf sugar. If the proprietor is desirous of honoring or pleasing a new or distinguished customer, he drops in lumps of sugar until it protrudes above the glass. The tea is made in a samovar, a brass vessel holding perhaps a gallon of water, with a hollow receptacle in the center for a charcoal fire. Strong tea is made in an ordinary queensware teapot that fits into the hollow. A small portion of this is poured into the glass, which is then filled up with hot water from a tap in the samovar. There is a regular Persian quarter in Erzurum, and I am not suffered to stroll through it without being initiated into the fundamental difference between the character of the Persians and the Turks. When an Osmanli is desirous of seeing me ride the bicycle, he goes honestly and straightforwardly to work at coaxing and worrying, except in very rare instances 
they have seemed incapable of resorting to deceit or sharp practice to gain their object. Not so childlike and honest, however, are our new acquaintances, the Persians. Several merchants gather around me, and pretty soon they cunningly begin asking me how much I will sell the bicycle for. Fifty liras, I reply, seeing the deep, deep scheme hidden beneath the superficial fairness of their observations, and thinking this will squash all further commercial negotiations. But the wily Persians are not so easily disposed of as this. Bring it round, and let us see how it is ridden, they say. And, if we like it, we will purchase it for fifty liras, and perhaps make you a present besides. A Persian would rather try to gain an end by deceit than by honest and above-board methods, even if the former were more trouble. Lying, cheating, and deception is the universal rule among them. Honesty and straightforwardness are unknown virtues. Anyone whom they detect telling the truth or acting honestly they consider a simpleton unfit to transact business. The missionaries and their families are at present tenting out, five miles south of the city, in a romantic little ravine called Kirk Dagaman, or the place of the forty mills, and on Saturday morning I receive a pressing invitation to become their guest during the remainder of my stay. The Erzurum mission is represented by Mr. Chambers, his brother now absent on a tour, their respective families, and Miss Powers. Yusuf Effendi accompanies us out of the camp on a splendid Arab steed that curvets gracefully the whole way. Myself and the other missionary people, bicycle work at Sivas and again at Erzurum, ride more sober and decorous animals. Kirk Dagaman is found to be near the entrance to a pass over the Paladtoken Mountains. Half a dozen small tents are pitched beneath the only grove of trees for many a mile around. A dancing stream of crystal water furnishes the camp with an abundance of that necessary, as also a lavish supply of such music as babbling brooks coursing madly over pebbly beds are wont to furnish. To this particular section of the little stream legendary lore has attached a story which gives the locality its name, Kirk Dagaman. Once upon a time, a worthy widow found herself the happy possessor of no less than forty small grist mills strung along the stream. Soon after her husband's death, the lady's amiable qualities, and not unlikely her forty mills into the bargain, attracted the admiration of a certain wealthy owner of flocks in the neighborhood and he sought her hand in marriage. No, said the lady, who, being a widow, had perhaps acquired wisdom. No, I have forty sons, each one faithfully laboring and contributing cheerfully toward my support. Therefore, I have no use for a husband. I will kill your forty sons and compel you to become my wife, replied the suitor, in a huff at being rejected. And he went and sheared all his sheep and, with the multitudinous fleeces, dammed up the stream, caused the water to flow into other channels, and thereby rendering the widow's forty mills useless and unproductive. With nothing but ruination before her, and seeing no alternative, the widow's heart finally softened, and she suffered herself to be wooed and won. The fleeces were removed, the stream returned to its proper channel, and the merry whirr of the forty mills henceforth mingled harmoniously with the bleeding of the sheep. Two days are spent at the quiet missionary camp, and thoroughly enjoyed. It seems like an oasis of home life in the surrounding desert of uncongenial social conditions. I eagerly devour the contents of several American newspapers and embrace the opportunities of the occasion, even to the extent of nursing the babies. Missionaries seem rare folks for babies, of which there are three in camp. The altitude of Erzurum is between 6,000 and 7,000 feet. The September nights are delightfully cool, and there are no bloodthirsty mosquitoes. I am assigned a sleeping tent close alongside a small waterfall, whose splashing music is a soporific that holds me in the bondage of beneficial repose until breakfast is announced, both mornings. And on Monday morning, I feel as though the hunger, the irregular sleep, and the rough and tumble dues generally of the past four weeks were but a troubled dream. 
Again, the bicycle contributes its curiosity-quickening and question-exciting powers for the benefit of the sluggish-minded pupils of the mission school. The Persian consul and his sons come to see me ride. He is highly interested upon learning that I am traveling on the wheel to the Persian capital, and he visas my passport and gives me a letter of introduction to the Pasha Khan of Ovajik, the first village I shall come to beyond the frontier. It is nearly 3 p.m. September 7th when I bid farewell to everybody and wheel out through the Persian gate, accompanied by Mr. Chambers on horseback, who rides part way to the Dev Boyu, Camel's Neck Pass. On the way out, he tells me that he has been intending taking a journey through the Caucasus this autumn, but the difficulties of obtaining permission, on account of his being a clergyman, are so great, a special permission having to be obtained from St. Petersburg, that he has about relinquished the idea for the present season. Dev Boyan Pass leads over a comparatively low range of hills. It was here where the Turkish army, in November 1877, made their last gallant attempt to stem the tide of disasters that had, by the fortunes of war and the incompetency of their commanders, set in irresistibly against them, before taking refuge inside the walls of the city. An hour after parting from Mr. Chambers, I am wheeling briskly down the same road on the eastern slope of the pass where Mukhtar Pasha's ill-fated column was drawn into the fatal ambuscade that suddenly turned the fortunes of the day against them. While rapidly gliding down the gentle gradient, I fancy I can see the Cossack regiments advancing toward the Turkish position. The unwary and overconfident Osmanlis leaping from their entrenchments to advance along the road and drive them back. Now I come to the Nabi Chai ravines where the concealed masses of Yuzhen infantry suddenly sprang up and cut off their retreat. I fancy I can see chug, whoop, thud, stars, and see them pretty distinctly, too. For while gazing curiously about, locating the Russian ambushment, the bicycle strikes a sand hole, and I am favored with the worst header I have experienced for many a day. I am, or rather was, a minute ago, bowling along quite briskly. The header treats me to a fearful shaking up. I am sore all over the next morning and present a sort of a stiff-necked, woe-begone appearance for the next four days. A bent handlebar and a slightly twisted rear-wheel fork likewise forcibly remind me that, while I am beyond the reach of repair shops, it will be Solomon-like wisdom on my part to henceforth survey battlefields with a larger margin of regard for things more immediately interesting. From the pass, my road descends into the broad and cultivated valley of the Passin Sioux. The road is mostly rideable, though heavy with dust. Part way to Hassan Kale, I am compelled to use considerable tact to avoid trouble with a gang of riotous Kalir Jis whom I overtake. As I attempt to wheel past, one of them wantonly essays to thrust his stick into the wheel. As I spring from the saddle for sheer self-protection, they think I have dismounted to attack him, and his comrades rush forward to his protection, brandishing their sticks and swords in a menacing manner. Seeing himself reinforced, as it were, the bold aggressor raises his stick as though to strike me, and peremptorily orders me to bin and hadi. Very naturally, I refuse to remount the bicycle while surrounded by this evidently mischievous crew. There are about twenty of them, and it requires much self-control to prevent a conflict in which, I am persuaded, somebody would have been hurt. However, I finally manage to escape their undesirable company and ride off amid a full assad of stones. This incident reminds me of Yusuf Effendi's warning that even though I had come thus far without a Zaptia escort, I should require one now, owing to the more lawless disposition of the people near the frontier. Near dark, I reach Hassan Kale, a large village nestling under the shadow of its former importance as a fortified town, and seek the accommodation of a Persian Chai Khan. It is not very elaborate or luxurious accommodation, consisting solely of tiny glasses of sweetened tea in the public room and a shakedown in a rough, unfurnished apartment over the stable, 
eatables have to be obtained elsewhere, but it matters little so long as they are obtainable somewhere. During the evening, a Persian troubadour and storyteller entertains the patrons of the Chai Khan by singing ribaldish songs, twanging a tambourine-like instrument, and telling stories in a sing-song tone of voice. In deference to the mixed nationality of his audience, the sagacious troubadour wears a Turkish fez, a Persian coat, and a Eusian metallic-faced belt. The burden of his songs are of Erzurum, Erzigan, and Ispahan. The Russians, it would appear, are too few and unpopular to justify risking the displeasure of the Turks by singing any Eusian songs. So far as my comprehension goes, the stories are chiefly of intrigue and love affairs among pashas, and would quickly bring the righteous retributions of the Lord Chamberlain down upon his ears, were he telling them to an English audience. I have no small difficulty in getting the bicycle up the narrow and crooked stairway into my sleeping apartment. There is no fastening of any kind on the door, and the proprietor seems determined upon treating every subject of the Shah in Hassan Kaleh to a private confidential exhibition of myself and bicycle, after I have retired to bed. It must be near midnight, I think, when I am again awakened from my uneasy, oft-disturbed slumbers by murmuring voices and the shuffling of feet, examining the bicycle by the feeble glimmer of a classic lamp, are a dozen meddlesome Persians. Annoyed at their unseemly midnight intrusion, and at being repeatedly awakened, I rise up and sing out at them rather authoritatively. I have exhibited the merifet of my Smith and Wesson during the evening, and these intruders seem really afraid I might be going to practice on them with it. The Persians are apparently timid mortals. They evidently regard me as a strange being of unknown temperament, who might possibly break loose and encompass their own destruction on the slightest provocation and the proprietor and another equally intrepid individual hurriedly come to my couch and pat me soothingly on the shoulders after which they all retire and i am disturbed no more till morning the rocky road to dublin is nothing compared to the road leading eastward from hassan Kaleh for the first few miles but afterward it improves into very fair wheeling eleven miles down to Pasiu Su Valley brings me to the Armenian village of Quipri Qui. Having breakfasted before starting, I wheel on without halting, crossing the Araxis River at the junction of the Pasin Su on a very ancient stone bridge known as the Chebankurpi, or the Bridge of Pastures, said to be over a thousand years old. Nearing Dele Baba Pass, a notorious place for robbers, I pass through a village of sedentary cords. Soon after leaving the village, a wild-looking cord, mounted on an angular sorrel, overtakes me and wants me to employ him as a guard while going through the pass. Backing up the offer of his presumably valuable services by unsheathing a semi-rusty sword and waving it valiantly aloft, he intimates, by tragically graphic pantomime, that unless I traverse the pass under the protecting shadow of his ancient and rusty blade, I will be likely to pay the penalty of my rashness by having my throat cut. Yusuf Effendi and the Erzurum missionaries have thoughtfully warned me against venturing through the Delhi Baba Pass alone, advising me to wait and go through with a Persian caravan. But this cord looks like anything but a protector. On the contrary, I am inclined to regard him as a suspicious character himself, interviewing me, perhaps, with ulterior ideas of a more objectionable character than that of faithfully guarding me through the Delhi Baba Pass. Showing him the shell-extracting mechanism of my revolver, and explaining the rapidity with which it can be fired, I give him to understand that I feel quite capable of guarding myself. Consequently, have no earthly use for his services. A tea caravan of some two hundred camels are resting near the approach to the pass, affording me an excellent opportunity of having company through by waiting and journeying with them in the night. But warnings of danger have been repeated so often of late, and they have proved themselves groundless so invariably, that I should feel the taunts of self-reproach were I to find myself hesitating to proceed on their account." 
passing over a mountain spur, I descend into a rocky cannon with perpendicular walls of rock towering skyward like giant battlements, enclosing a space not over fifty yards wide. Through this runs my road, and alongside it babbles the Delhi Baba Su. The cannon is a wild, lonely-looking spot, and looks quite appropriate to the reputation it bears. Professor Vambury, a recognized authority on Asiatic matters, and whose party encountered a gang of marauders here, says the Delhi Baba Pass bore the same unsavory reputation that it bears today, as far back as the time of Herodotus. However, suffice it to say, that I get through without molestation. Mountain men, armed to the teeth, like almost everybody else hereabouts, are encountered in the pass. They invariably halt and look back after me as though endeavoring to comprehend who and what I am. But that is all. Emerging from the cannon, I follow in a general course the tortuous windings of the Delhi Baba Su through another ravine riven battlefield of the late war and up toward its source in a still more mountainous and elevated region beyond. End of section 36. Recording by William Tomko. Section 37 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Richards. Chapter 18. Mount Ararat and Kurdistan. The shadows of evening are beginning to settle down over the wild, mountainous country round about. It is growing uncomfortably chilly for this early in the evening and the prospects look favorable for a supperless and most disagreeable night. When I descry a village perched in an opening among the mountains, a mile or thereabouts off to the right, repairing thither, I find it to be a Kurdish village, where the hovels are more excavations than buildings. Buffaloes, horses, goats, chickens, and human beings all find shelter under the same roof. Their respective quarters are nothing but a mere railing of rough poles, and as the question of ventilation is never even thought of, the effect upon one's olfactory nerves upon entering is anything but reassuring. The filth and rags of these people is something abominable. On account of the chilliness of the evening, they have donned their heavier raiment. These have evidently had rags patched on top of other rags for years past until they have gradually developed into a thick quilted garment, in the innumerable seams of which the most disgusting entomological specimens, bred and engendered by their wretched mode of existence, live and perpetuate their kind. However, repulsive as the outlook most assuredly is, I have no alternative but to cast my lot among them till morning. I am conducted into the sheikh's apartment, a small room partitioned off with a pole from a stable full of horses and buffaloes, and where darkness is made visible by the sickly glimmer of a grease lamp. The sheikh, a thin, sallow-faced man of about forty years, is reclining on a mattress in one corner smoking cigarettes. A dozen ill-conditioned ragamuffins are squatting about in various attitudes, while the ragtag and bobtail of the population crowd into the buffalo stable and survey me and the bicycle from outside the partition pole. A circular wooden tray containing abundance of bread, a bowl of yogurt, and a small quantity of peculiar stringy cheese that resembles chunks of dried codfish, warped and twisted in the drying, is brought in and placed in the middle of the floor. Everybody in the room at once gather around it and begin eating with as little formality as so many wild animals. The sheikh silently motions for me to do the same. The yogurt bowl contains one solitary wooden spoon, with which they take turns at eating mouthfuls. One is compelled to draw the line somewhere, even under the most uncompromising circumstances, and I naturally draw it against eating yogurt with the same wooden spoon, 
making small scoops with pieces of bread, I dip up yogurt and eat scoop and all together. These particular curds seem absolutely ignorant of anything in the shape of mannerliness, or of consideration for each other at the table. When the yogurt has been dipped into twice or thrice all around, the shake coolly confiscates the bowl, eats part of what is left, pours water into the remainder, stirs it up with his hand, and deliberately drinks it all up. One or two others seize all the cheese, utterly regardless of the fact that nothing remains for myself and their companions, who, by the by, seem to regard it as perfectly natural proceeding. After supper they return to their squatting attitudes around the room, and to a resumption of their never-ceasing occupation of scratching themselves. The eminent economists who lamented the wasted energy represented in the wagging of all dogs' tails in the world ought to have traveled through Asia on a bicycle and have been compelled to hobnob with the villagers. He would undoubtedly have wept with sorrow at beholding the amount of this same wasted energy represented by the above-mentioned occupation of the people. The most loathsome member of this interesting company is a wretched old hypocrite who rolls his eyes about and heaves a deep-drawn sigh of Allah every few minutes, and then looks furtively at myself and the sheikh to observe its effects. His sole garment is a roundabout mantle that reaches to his knees, and which seems to have been manufactured out of the tattered remnants of other tattered remnants tacked carelessly together without regard to shape, size, color, or previous condition of cleanliness. His thin, scrawny legs are bare. His long, black hair is matted and unkempt. His beard is stubby and unlovely to look at. His small, black eyes twinkle in the semi-darkness like ferret's eyes, while soap and water have, to all appearances, been altogether stricken from the category of his personal requirements. Probably it is nothing but the lively workings of my own imagination, but this wretch appears to me to entertain a decided preference for my society, constantly insinuating himself as near me as possible, necessitating constant watchfulness on my part to avoid actual contact with him. Eternal vigilance is, in this case, the price of what it is unnecessary to expatiate upon, further than to say that self-preservation becomes, under such conditions, preeminently the first law of occidental nature. Soon the sallow-faced sheikh suddenly bethinks himself that he is in the august presence of a hakim, and beckoning me to his side, displays an ugly wound on his knee, which has degenerated into a running sore, and which he says was done with a sword. Of course he wants me to perform a cure. While examining the sheikh's knee, another old party comes forward and unbears his arm, also wounded with a sword. This not unnaturally sets me to wondering what sort of company I have gotten into, and how they came by sword wounds in these peaceful times. But my inquisitiveness is compelled to remain in abeyance to my limited linguistic powers. Having nothing to give them for the wounds, I recommend an application of warm salt water twice a day, feeling pretty certain, however, that they will be too lazy and trifling to follow their advice. Before dispersing to their respective quarters, the occupants of the room range themselves in a row and go through a religious performance lasting fully half an hour. They make almost as much noise as howling dervishes, meanwhile exercising themselves quite violently. Having made themselves holier than ever by these exercises, some take their departure. Others make up couches on the floor with sheepskins and quilts. Thin ice covers the still pools of water when I resume my toilsome route over the mountains at daybreak. A raw wind comes whistling from the east, and until the sun begins to warm things up a little, it is necessary to stop and buffet occasionally to prevent benumbed hands. Obtaining small lumps of wheaten dough cooked crisp in hot grease, like unsweetened doughnuts from a horseman on the road, I push ahead toward the summit 
and then down the eastern slope of the mountains, rounding in a budding hill about 9.30, the glorious snow-crowned peak of Ararat suddenly bursts upon my vision. It is a good forty leagues away, but even at this distance it dwarfs everything else in sight. Although surrounded by giant mountain chains that traverse the country at every conceivable angle, Ararat stands alone in its solitary grandeur, a glistening white cone rearing its giant head proudly and conspicuously above surrounding eminences, about mountains that are insignificant only in comparison with the white-robed monarch that has been a beacon light of sacred history since sacred history has been in existence. Descending now toward the Alash Gird plain, a prominent theater of action during the war, I encounter splendid wheeling for some miles, but once fairly down on the level, cultivated plain, the road becomes heavy with dust. Villages dot the broad, expansive plain in every direction. Conical stacks of tezek are observable among the houses, piled high up above the roofs, speaking of commendable forethought for the approaching cold winter. In one of the Armenian villages, I am not a little surprised at finding a lone German. He says he prefers an agricultural life in this country, with all its disadvantages, to the hard, grinding struggle for existence and the compulsory military service of the fatherland. Here, he goes on to explain, there is no foamy lager, no money, no comfort, no amusement of any kind, but there is individual liberty and it is very easy making a living. Therefore, it is for me a better country than Deutschland. Everybody to their liking, I think, as I continue on across the plain. But for a European to be living in one of these little agricultural villages comes the nearest to being buried alive of anything I know of. The road improves in hardness as I proceed eastward, but the peculiar disadvantage of being a conspicuous and incomprehensible object on a populous level plain soon becomes manifest. Seeing the bicycle glistening in the sunlight as I ride along, horsemen come wildly galloping from villages miles away. Some of these wonder-stricken people endeavor to pilot me along branch trails leading to their villages but the main caravan trail is now too easily distinguishable for any little deceptions of this kind to succeed. Here, on the Alashgird plain, I first hear myself addressed as Hamshari, a term which now takes the place of Effendi for the next five hundred miles. Owing to the disgust engendered by unsavory quarters in the wretched Dele Baba village last night, I have determined upon seeking the friendly shelter of a weak shock again tonight, preferring the chances of being frozen out at midnight to the entomological possibilities of village hovels. Accordingly, near sunset, I repair to a village not far from the road for the purpose of obtaining something to eat before seeking out a rendezvous for the night. It turns out to be a Kurdish village of Malosman and the people are found to be so immeasurably superior in every particular to their kinsfolk of Dele Baba that I forthwith cancel my determination and accept their proffered hospitality. The Malos Manli are comparatively clean and comfortable, are reasonably well-dressed, seem well-to-do, and both men and women are, on the average, handsomer than the people of any village I have seen for days past almost all possess a conspicuously beautiful set of teeth, pleasant, smiling countenances, and good physique. They also seem to have, somehow, acquired easy, agreeable manners. The secret of the whole difference, I opine, is that, instead of being located among the inhospitable soil of barren hills, they are cultivating the productive soil of the Alashgird plain, and, being situated on the great Persian caravan trail, they find a ready market for their grain in supplying the caravans in winter. Their sheikh is a handsome and good-natured young fellow. Sporting white clothes trimmed profusely with red braid, he spends the evening in my company, 
examining the bicycle, revolver, telescopic pencil case, LAW badge, etc., and hands me his carved ivory case to select cigarettes from. It would have required considerable inducements to have trusted either my LAW badge or the Smith & Wesson in the custody of any of our unsavory acquaintances of last night, notwithstanding their great outward show of piety. There are no deep-drawn sighs of Allah, nor ostentatious praying among the malosmanly, but they bear the stamp of superior trustworthiness plainly on their faces and their bearing. There appears to be far more jocularity than religion among these prosperous villagers, a trait that probably owes its development to their apparent security from want. It is no newly discovered trait of human character to cease all prayers and supplications whenever the granary is overflowing with plenty, and to commence devotional exercises again whenever the supply runs short. This rule would hold good among the childlike natives here, even more so than it does among our more enlightened selves. I sally forth into the chilly atmosphere of early morning from Malosman, and wheel eastward over an excellent road for some miles. An obliging native, en route to the harvest field, turns his buffalo araba around and carts me over a bridgeless stream but several others have to be forded ere reaching Kirekkan, where I obtain breakfast. Here I am required to show my taskeri to the mudir, and the zaptia escorting me thither becomes greatly mystified over the circumstance that I am a Frank, and yet am wearing a Mussulman headband around my helmet, a new one I picked up on the road. This little fact appeals to him as something savoring of an attempt to disguise myself, and he grows amusingly mysterious while whisperingly bringing it to the mudir's notice. The habitual serenity and complacency of the corpulent mudir's mind, however, is not to be unduly disturbed by trifles, and the untutored zaptia's disposition to attach some significant meaning to it meets with nothing from his more enlightened superior but the silence of unconcern. More streams have to be forded ere I finally emerge onto higher ground. All along the alash plain, Ararat's glistening peak has been peeping over the mountain framework of the plain like a white beacon light showing above a dark rocky shore. But approaching toward the eastern extremity of the plain, my road hugs the base of the intervening hills and it temporarily disappears from view. In this portion of the country, Camels are frequently employed in bringing the harvest from field to village threshing floor. It is a curious sight to see these awkwardly moving animals walking along beneath tremendous loads of straw, nothing visible but their heads and legs. Sometimes the meandering course of the Euphrates, now the eastern fork and called the Murad Chai, brings it near the mountains and my road leads over bluffs immediately above it. The historic river seems well supplied with trout hereabouts. I can look down from the bluffs and observe speckled beauties sporting about it in its pellucid waters by the score. Toward noon, I fool away fifteen minutes trying to beguile one of them into swallowing a grasshopper and a bent pin but they are not the guileless creatures they seem to be when surveyed from the elevated bluff, so they steadily refuse whatever blandishments I offer. An hour later I reach the village of Daslish, inhabited by a mixed population of Turks and Persians. At a shop kept by one of the latter I obtain some bread and ghee, clarified butter, some tea and a handful of wormy raisins for dessert. For these articles, besides building a fire especially to prepare the tea, the unconscionable Persian charges the awful sum of two piastres, ten cents. Whereupon the Turks, who have been interested spectators of the whole nefarious proceeding, commence to abuse him roundly for overcharging a stranger unacquainted with the prices of the locality, calling him the son of a burnt father, and other names that Tinoje unpleasantly in the Persian air, as though it was a matter of pounds sterling. 
Beyond Dashlish, Ararat again becomes visible. The country immediately around is a ravine-riven plateau, covered with boulders. An hour after leaving Dashlish, while climbing the eastern slope of a ravine, four rough-looking footmen appear on the opposite side of the slope. They are following after me and shouting, Kardash! These people with their old swords and pistols conspicuously about them always raise suspicions of brigands and evil characters under such circumstances as these. So I continue on up the slope, without heeding their shouting until I observe two of them turn back. I then wait, out of curiosity, to see what they really want. They approach with broad grins of satisfaction at having overtaken me. They have run all the way from Dashlish in order to overtake me and see the bicycle. Having heard of it after I had left, I am now but a short distance from the Russian frontier on the north, and the first Turkish patrol is this afternoon patrolling the road. He takes a wondering interest in my wheel, but doesn't ask the oft-repeated question, Rus or Ingolis. It is presumed that he is too familiar with the Muscovite fizz to make any such question necessary. About four o'clock I overtake a jack-booted horseman, who straightway proceeds to try and make himself agreeable, as his flowing remarks are mostly unintelligible. To spare him from wasting the sweetness of his eloquence on the desert air around me, I reply, Turkchi binmus. Instead of checking the impetuous torrent of his remarks at hearing this, he canters companionably alongside and chatters more persistently than ever. Turk chi binmus, I repeat, becoming rather annoyed at his persistent garrulousness and his refusal to understand. This has the desired effect of reducing him to silence, but he canters doggedly behind, and, after a space, creeps up alongside again, and, pointing to a large stone building, which has now become visible at the base of a mountain on the other side of the Euphrates, timidly ventures upon the explanation that it is the Armenian Gregorian Monastery of Sap Aguanus, St. John. Finding me more favorably disposed to listen than before, he explains that he himself is an Armenian, is acquainted with the priests of the monastery, and is going to remain there overnight. He then proposes that I accompany him thither and do likewise. I am, of course, only too pleased at the prospect of experiencing something out of the common, and gladly avail myself of the opportunity. Moreover, monasteries and religious institutions in general have somehow always been pleasantly associated in my thoughts as inseparable accompaniments of orderliness and cleanliness, and I smile serenely to myself at the happy prospect of snowy sheets and scrupulously clean cooking. Crossing the Euphrates on a once substantial stone bridge, now in a sadly dilapidated condition, that was doubtless built when Armenian monasteries enjoyed palmier days than the present, we skirt the base of a compact mountain, and in a few minutes alight at the monastery village. Exit immediately all visions of cleanliness. The village is in no wise different from any other cluster of mud hovels round about, and the rag-bedecked, flea-bitten objects that come out to gaze at us, if such a thing were possible, compare unfavorably even with the Della Baba Kurds. There is apparent at once, however, a difference between the respective dispositions of the two peoples. The Kurds are inclined to be pig-headed and obtrusive, as though possessed of their full share of the spirit of self-assertion. The Sapoguanus people, on the contrary, act like beings utterly destitute of anything of the kind, cowering beneath one's look and shunning immediate contact, as though habitually overcome with a sense of their own inferiority. The two priests come out to see the bicycle ridden. They are stout, bushy-whiskered, greasy-looking old jokers, with small, twinkling black eyes, whose expression would seem to betoken anything rather than saintliness, and, 
Although the Euphrates flows hard by, they are evidently united in their enmity against soap and water. If in nothing else, in fact, judging from outward appearances, water is about the only thing concerning which they practice abstemiousness. The monastery itself is a massive structure of hewn stone, surrounded by a high wall looped hold for defense. Attached to the wall, inside is a long row of small rooms or cells, the habitations of the monks in more prosperous days. A few of them are occupied at present by the older men. At 5.30 p.m. the bell tolls for evening service, and I accompany my guide into the monastery. It is a large, empty-looking edifice of simple, massive architecture, and appears to have been built with a secondary purpose of withstanding a siege or an assault, and as a place of refuge for the people in troublous times. Containing, among other secular appliances, a large brick oven for baking bread. During the last war, the place was actually bombarded by the Russians in an effort to dislodge a body of Kurds who had taken possession of the monastery, and from behind its solid walls harassed the Russian troops advancing towards Erzurum. The patched-up holes made by the Russian shots are pointed out, as also some light earthworks thrown up on the Russian position across the river. In these degenerate days, one portion of the building is utilized as a storehouse for grain. Hundreds of pigeons are cooing and roosting on the crossbeams, making their place their permanent abode, passing in and out of narrow openings near the roof, and the whole interior is in a disgustingly filthy condition. Rude fresco representations of the different saints in the Gregorian calendar formally adorn the walls, and bright colored tiles embellish the approach to the altar. Nothing is distinguishable these days but the crumbling and half-obliterated evidences of past glories. Both priests and people seem hopelessly sunk in the quagmire of avariciousness and low cunning on the one hand, and of blind ignorance and superstition on the other. Clad in greasy and seedy-looking cowls, the priests go through a few nonsensical maneuvers, consisting chiefly of an ostentatious affectation of reverence toward an altar covered with tattered drapery. By never turning their backs toward it while they walk about, Bible in hand, mumbling and sighing, my self-constituted guide and myself comprise the whole congregation during the services. Whenever the priests have a particularly deep-fetched sigh or fall to mumbling their prayers on the double-quick, they invariably cast a furtive glance towards me to ascertain whether I am noticing the impenetrable depth of their holiness. They needn't be uneasy on that score, however. The most casual observer cannot fail to perceive that it is really and truly impenetrable, so impenetrable, in fact, that it will never be on earth, not even at the day of judgment. In about ten minutes the priests quit mumbling, bestow a pharisaical kiss on the tattered coverlet of their Bibles, graciously suffer my jack-booted companion to do likewise, as also two or three ragamuffins who have come sneaking in seemingly for that special purpose and then retreat hastily behind a patchwork curtain. The next minute they reappear in a cowless condition, their countenances wearing an expression of intense relief, as though happy at having gotten through with a disagreeable task that had been weighing heavily on their minds all day. We are invited to take supper with their reverences in their cell beneath the walls, which they occupy in common. The repast consists of yogurt and pilau, to which is added, by way of compliment to visitors, five salt fishes about the size of sardines. The most greasy-looking of the divines thoughtfully helps himself to a couple of the fishes as though they were a delicacy quite irresistible, leaving one apiece for us others. Having created a thirst with the salty fish, he then seizes what remains of the yogurt, pours water into it, mixes it thoroughly together with his unwashed hand, 
and gulps down a full quart of the swill with far greater gusto than mannerliness. Soon the priests commence eructating aloud, which appears to be a well-understood signal that the limit of their respective absorptive capacities are reached, for three hungry-eyed laymen who have been watching our repast with seemingly begrudging countenances now carry the wooden tray bodily off into a corner and ravenously devour the remnants. Everything about the cell is abnormally filthy, and I am glad when the inevitable cigarettes are ended and we retire to the quarters assigned us in the village. Here my companion produces from some mysterious corner of his clothing a pinch of tea and a few lumps of sugar. A villager quickly kindles a fire and cooks the tea, performing the services eagerly, in anticipation of coming in for a modest share of what to him is an unwonted luxury. Being rewarded with a tiny glassful of tea and a lump of sugar, he places the sweet morsel in his mouth and sucks the tea through it with noisy satisfaction, prolonging the presumably delightful sensation thereby produced to fully a couple of minutes. During this brief indulgence of his palate, a score of his ragged co-religionists stand around and regard him with mingled envy and covetousness. But for two whole minutes he occupies his proud eminence in the lap of comparative luxury, and between slow, lingering sucks at the tea, regards their envious attention with studied indifference. One can scarcely conceive of a more utterly wretched people than the monastic community of Sapoguanus. One would not be surprised to find them envying even the pariah curs of the country. The wind blows raw and chilly from off the snowy slopes of Ararat next morning, and the shivering half-clad wretches shuffle off towards the fields and pastures, with blue noses and unwilling faces humping their backs and shrinking within themselves, and wearing most lugubrious countenances, one naturally falls to wondering what they do in the winter. The independent villagers of the surrounding country have a tough enough time of it, worrying through the cheerless winters of a treeless and mountainous country, but they at least have no domestic authority to bay but their own personal and family necessities, and they consume the days huddled together in their unventilated hovels over a smoldering tzek fire. But these people seem but helpless dolts under the vassalage of a couple of crafty-looking, coarse-grained priests who regard them with less consideration than they do the monastery buffaloes. Eleven miles over a most rideable trail brings me to the large village of Diadin. Diadin is marked on my map as quite an important place, consequently I approach it with every assurance of obtaining a good breakfast. My inquiries for refreshments are met with importunities of bin bakalem from five hundred of the ragtag and bobtail of the frontier, the rowdiest and most inconsiderate mob imaginable. In their eagerness and impatience to see me ride, and their exasperating indifference to my own pressing wants. Some of them tell me bluntly there is no bread. Others, more considerate, hurry away and bring enough bread to feed a dozen people, and one fellow contributes a couple of onions. Pocketing the onions and some of the bread, I mount and ride away from the maddening crowd with whatever dispatch is possible, and retire into a secluded dell near the road, a mile from town, to eat my frugal breakfast in peace and quietness. While thus engaged, it is with veritable savage delight that I hear a company of horsemen go furiously galloping past. They are diadem people, endeavoring to overtake me for the kindly purpose of worrying me out of my senses, and to prevent me even eating a bite of bread unseasoned with their everlasting gabble. Although the road from Diadin eastward leads steadily upward, they fancy that nothing less than a wild, sweeping gallop will enable them to accomplish their fell purpose. I listen to their clattering hoofbeats dying away in the dreamy distance, with a grin of positively malicious satisfaction, 
hoping sincerely that they will keep galloping onward for the next twenty miles. No such happy consummation of my wishes occurs. However, a couple of miles up the ascent I find them hobnobbing with some Persian caravan men, and patiently awaiting my appearance, having learned from the Persians that I had not yet gone past. Mingled with the keen disappointment of overtaking them so quickly is the pleasure of witnessing the Persians' camels regaling themselves on a patch of juicy thistles of most luxuriant growth. The avidity with which they attack the great prickly vegetation and the expression of satisfaction utter and peculiar that characterizes a camel while munching a giant thistle stalk that protrudes two feet out of his mouth is simply indescribable. From this pass I descend into the Aras plain, and, behold, the gigantic form of Ararat rises up before me, seemingly but a few miles away. As a matter of fact, it is about twenty miles distance. From this pass I descend into the Aras plain, and, behold, the gigantic form of Ararat rises up before me seemingly but a few miles away as a matter of fact it is about twenty miles distant but with nothing intervening between myself and its tremendous proportions but the level plain the distance is deceptive no human habitations are visible save the now familiar black tents of kurdish tribesmen away off to the north and as i ride along i am overtaken by a sensation of being all alone in the company of an overshadowing and awe-inspiring presence. One's attention seems irresistibly attracted toward the mighty snow-crowned monarch, as though the immutable law of attraction were sensibly exerting itself to draw lesser bodies to it, and all other objects around seem dwarfed into insignificant proportions. One obtains a most comprehensive idea of Ararat 17,325 feet, when viewing it from the Aras plain, as it rises sheer from the plain and not from the shoulders of a range that constitutes of itself the greater part of the height, as do many mountain peaks. A few miles to the eastward is Little Ararat, an independent conical peak of 12,800 feet, without snow, but conspicuous as distinct from surrounding mountains. Its proportions are completely dwarfed and overshadowed by the nearness and bulkiness of its big brother. The Aras Plain is lava-strewn and uncultivated for a number of miles. The spongy, spreading feet of innumerable camels have worn paths in the hard lava deposits that makes the wheeling equal to English roads except for occasional stationary blocks of lava that the animals have systematically stepped over for centuries, and which not infrequently block the narrow trail and compel a dismount. Evidently, Ararat was once a volcano. The lofty peak, which now presents a wintry appearance even in the hottest summer weather, formerly belched forth lurid flames that lit up the surrounding country, and poured out fiery torrents of molten lava that stratified the abutting hills, and spread like an overwhelming flood over the Aras Plain. Abutting Ararat on the west are stratiform hills, the strata of which are plainly distinguishable from the Persian Trail and which, were their inclination continued, would strike Ararat at or near the summit. This would seem to indicate the layers to be representations of the mountain's former volcanic overflowings. I am sitting on a block of lava, making an outline sketch of Ararat, when a peasant happens along with a bullock load of cucumbers, which he is taking to the Kurdish camps. He is pretty badly scared at finding himself all alone on the Aras Plain, with such a nondescript and dangerous-looking object as a helmeted wheelman. And when I halt him with inquiries concerning the nature of his wares, 
He turns pale and becomes almost speechless with fright. He would empty his sacks as peace offering at my feet without venturing upon a remonstrance were he ordered to do so. And when I relieve him of but one solitary cucumber and pay him more than he would obtain for it among the Kurds, he becomes stupefied with astonishment. When he continues on his way, he hardly knows whether he is on his head or his feet. An hour later I arrive at Kazil Diza, the last village in Turkish territory, and an official station of considerable importance, where passports, caravan permits, etc., of everyone passing to or from Persia have to be examined. An officer here provides me with refreshments, and while generously permitting the population to come in and enjoy the extraordinary spectacle of seeing me fed, he thoughtfully stations a man with a stick to keep them at a respectful distance. A later hour in the afternoon finds me trundling up a long acclivity leading to the summit of a low mountain ridge. Arriving at the summit, I stand on the boundary line between the dominions of the Sultan and the Shah, and I pause a minute to take a brief retrospective glance. The cyclometer, affixed to the bicycle at Constantinople, now registers within a fraction of 1,000 miles. It has been on a whole an arduous thousand miles, but those who in the foregoing pages have followed me through the strange and varied experiences of the journey will agree with me when I say that it has proved more interesting than arduous after all. I need not here express any blunt opinions of the different people encountered. It is enough that my observations concerning them have been jotted down, as I have mingled with them and their characteristics from day to day. Almost without exception, they have treated me the best they knew how. It is only natural that some should know how better than others. Bidding farewell, then, to the land of the Crescent and the home of the unspeakable Osmanli, I wheel down a gentle slope into a mountain environed area of cultivated fields, where Persian peasants are busy gathering their harvest. The strange apparition observed descending from the summit of the boundary attracts universal attention. I can hear them calling out to each other, and can see horsemen come wildly galloping from every direction. In a few minutes the road in my immediate vicinity is alive with twenty prancing steeds. Some are bestrode by men who, from the superior quality of their clothes and the gaudy trappings of their horses, are evidently in good circumstances. Others by wild-looking bare-legged bipeds, whose horses' trappings consist of nothing but a bridle. The transformation brought about by crossing the mountain ridge is novel and complete. The fez, so omnipresent throughout the Ottoman dominions, has disappeared as if by magic. The better-class Persians wear tall, brimless black hats of astrakhan lamb's wool. Some of the peasantry wear an unlovely, close-fitting skull-cap of thick gray felt that looks wonderfully like a bull clapped on top of their heads. Others sport a huge woolly headdress like the Romanians. This latter imparts to them a fierce, warlike appearance that the meek-eyed Persian riot, tiller of the soil, is far from feeling. The national garment is a sort of frock coat gathered at the waist and with a skirt of ample fullness, reaching nearly to the knees. Among the wealthier class, the material of this garment is usually cloth of a solid dark color, and among the riots or peasantry of calico or any cheap fabric they can obtain. Loose-fitting pantaloons of European pattern and sometimes top boots with tops ridiculously ample in their looseness characterize the nether garments of the better classes. The riots go mostly bare-legged in summer and wear loose, slipper-like footgear. The soles of both boots and shoes are frequently pointed and made to turn up and inwards after the fashion in England centuries ago. End of section 37
Recording by Paul Richards. Section 38 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Richards. Nightfall overtakes me as, after traveling several miles of variable road, I commence following a winding trail down into the valley of a tributary of the Araskis towards Ovakjik, where resides the Pasha Khan, to whom I have a letter. But the crescent-shaped moon sheds abroad a silvery glimmer that exerts a softening influence upon the mountains, outlined against the ever-arching dome, from whence here and there a star begins to twinkle. It is one of those beautiful, calm autumn evenings when all nature seems hushed in peaceful slumbers, when the stars seem to first peep cautiously from the impenetrable depths of their hiding place, and then to commence blinking benignantly and approvingly upon the world, and when the moon looks almost as though fair Luna has been especially decorating herself to embellish a scene that without her lovely presence would be incomplete, such is my first autumn evening beneath the cloudless skies of Persia. Soon the village of Ovajik is reached, and some peasants guide me to the residence of the Pasha Khan. The servant who presents my letter of introduction fills the untutored mind of his master with wonderment concerning what the peasants have told him about the bicycle. The Pasha Khan makes his appearance without having taken the trouble to open the envelope. He is a dull-faced, unintellectual-looking personage, and without any preliminary palaver he says, Bin Bakalem, in a dictatorial tone of voice. Bakalem yoli lazim bakalem saba, I reply, for it is too dark to ride on unknown ground this evening. Bin Bakalem, repeats the Pasha Khan, even more dictatorial than before ordering a servant to bring a tallow candle so that I can have no excuse. There appears to be such a total absence of all consideration for myself that I am not disposed to regard very favorably or patiently the obtrusive meddlesomeness of two younger men, whom I afterward discovered to be sons of the Pasha Khan, who seem almost inclined to take the bicycle out of my charge altogether. In their excessive impatience and inordinate inquisitiveness to examine everything about it, one of them, thinking the cyclometer to be a watch, puts his ear down to see if he can hear it tick, and then persists in fingering it about, to the imminent danger of the tally pin. After telling him several times not to meddle with it, and receiving overbearing gestures in reply, I deliberately throw him backward into an irrigating ditch. A gleam of intelligence overspreads the stolid countenance of the Pasha Khan at seeing his offspring floundering about on his back in the mud and water, and he gives utterance to a chuckle of delight. The discomfited young man betrays nothing of the spirit of resentment upon recovering himself from the ditch, and the other son involuntarily retreats as though afraid his turn was coming next. The servant now arrives with the lighted candle, and the Pasha Khan leads the way into his garden, where there is a wide brick paved walk. The house occupies one side of the garden. The other three sides are enclosed by a high mud wall. After riding a few times along the brick paved walk, and promising to do better in the morning, I naturally expect to be taken into the house. Instead of which, the Pasha Khan orders the people to show me the way to the caravanserai. Arriving at the caravanserai, and finding myself thus thrown unexpectedly upon my own resources, I inquire of some bystanders where I can obtain ekmek. Some of them want to know how many liras I will give for ekmek. When it is reflected that a lira is nearly five dollars, one realizes from this something of the unconscionable possibilities of the Persian commercial mind. 
While this question is being mooted, a figure appears in the doorway, towards which the people, one and all, respectfully salam and give way. It is the great Pasha Khan, and he has bethought himself to open my letter of introduction, and having perused it and discovered who it was from and all about me, he now comes and squats down in the most friendly manner by my side for a minute, as though to remove any unfavorable impressions his inhospitable action in sending me here might have had, and then bids me accompany him back to his residence. After permitting him to eat a sufficiency of humble pie in the shape of coaxing to atone for his former incivility, I agree to his proposal and accompany him back. Tea is at once provided, the now very friendly Pasha Khan putting extra lumps of sugar in my glass with his own hands and stirring it up. Bread and cheese comes in with the tea, and under the mistaken impression that this constitutes the Persian evening meal, I eat sufficient to satisfy my hunger. While thus partaking freely of the bread and cheese, I do not fail to notice that the others partake very sparingly, and that they seem to be rather astonished because I am not following their example. Being chiefly interested in satisfying my appetite, however, their silent observations have no effect save to further mystify my understanding of the Persian character. The secret of all this soon reveals itself in the form of an ample repast of savory chicken palau, brought in immediately afterward, and while the Pasha Khan and his two sons proceed to do full justice to this highly acceptable dish, I have to content myself with nibbling at a piece of chicken and ruminating on the unhappy and ludicrous mistake of having satisfied my hunger with dry bread and cheese. Thus does one pay the penalty of being unacquainted with the domestic customs of a country when first entering upon its experiences. There seems to be no material difference between the social position of the women here and in Turkey. They eat their meals by themselves and occupy entirely separate apartments, which are unapproachable to members of the opposite sex, save their husbands. The Pasha Khan of Ovajik, however, seems to be a kind, indulgent husband and father, requesting me next morning to ride up and down the brick-paved walk for the benefit of his wives and daughters. In the seclusion of their own wall premises, the Persian females are evidently not so particular about concealing their features, and I obtained a glimpse of some very pretty faces, oval faces with large, dreamy black eyes and a flush of warm sunset on brownish cheeks. The indoor costume of Persian women is but an inconsiderable improvement upon the costume of our ancestress in the Garden of Eden, and over this they hastily don a flimsy shawl-like garment to come out and see me ride. They are always much less concerned about concealing their nether extremities than about their faces, and, as they seem but little concerned about anything in this occasion save the bicycle, after riding for them I have to congratulate myself that, so far as sightseeing is concerned, the ladies leave me rather under obligations than otherwise. After supper the Pasha Khan's falconer brings in several fine falcons for my inspection and in reply to questions concerning one with his eyelids tied up in what appears to be a cruel manner, I am told that this is the customary way of breaking the spirits of the young falcons and rendering them tractable and submissive. The eyelids are pierced with a hole. A silk thread is then fastened to each eyelid and the ends tied together over the head, sufficiently tight to prevent them opening their eyes. Falconing is considered the chief outdoor sport of the Persian nobility, but the average Persian is altogether too indolent for outdoor sport, and the keeping of falcons is fashionable, because regarded as a sign of rank and nobility rather than for sport. In the morning the Pasha Khan is wonderfully agreeable, and appears anxious to atone as far as possible for the little incivility of yesterday evening and to remove any unfavorable impressions I may perchance entertain of him on that account before I leave. 
His two sons and a couple of soldiers accompany me on horseback some distance up the valley. The valley is studded with villages, and at the second one we halt at the residence of a gentleman named Abbas Kulakan and partake of tea and light refreshments in his garden. Here I learn that the Pasha Khan has carried his good intentions to the extent of having made arrangements to provide me armed escort from point to point. How far ahead this well-meaning arrangement is to extend, I am unable to understand. Neither do I care to find out, being already pretty well convinced that the escort will prove an insufferable nuisance to be gotten rid of at the first favorable opportunity. Abbas Kula Khan now joins the company until we arrive at the summit of a knoll, commanding an extensive view of my road ahead, so they can stand and watch me when they all bid me farewell, save the soldier who is to accompany me further on. As we shake hands, the young man whom I pushed into the irrigating ditch points to a similar receptacle nearby and shakes his head with amusing solemnity. Whether this is expressive of his sorrow that I should have pushed him in, or that he should have annoyed me to the extent of having deserved it, I cannot say, probably the latter. My escort, though a soldier, is dressed but little different from the better class villagers. He is an almond-eyed individual, with more of the Tartar cast of countenance than the Persian. Besides the short Persian sword, he is armed with a Martini Henry rifle of the 1862 pattern. Numbers of these rifles, having found their way into the hands of Turks, Kurds, and Persians since the Russo-Turkish War. My predictions concerning his turning out an insupportable nuisance are not suffered to remain long unverified, for he appears to consider it his chief duty to gallop ahead and notify the villagers of my approach and to work them up to the highest expectations concerning my marvelous appearance. The result of all this is a swelling of his own importance at having so wonderful a person under his protection, and my own transformation from an unostentatious traveler to something akin to a free circus for crowds of bare-legged riots. I soon discover that, with characteristic Persian truthfulness, he has likewise been spreading the interesting report that I am journeying in this extraordinary manner to carry a message from the Ingilis Shah to the Shah in Shah of Iran. The Persians know their own country as Iran, thereby increasing his own importance and the wonderment of the people concerning myself. The Persian villages, so far, are little different from the Turkish, but such valuable property as melon gardens, vineyards, etc., instead of being presided over by the watchmen, are usually surrounded by substantial mud walls ten or twelve feet high. The villagers, being less improvident and altogether more thoughtful of number one than the Turks, are on the whole a trifle less ragged, but that is saying very little indeed, and their condition is anything but enviable. During the summer they fare comparatively well, needing but little clothing, and they are happy and contented in the absence of actual suffering. They are perfectly satisfied with a diet of bread and fruit and cucumbers, rarely tasting meat of any kind. But fuel is as scarce as in Asia Minor, and like the Turks and Armenians, in winter they have resource to a peculiar and economical arrangement to keep themselves warm. Placing a pan of burning tzek beneath a low table, the whole family huddle around it, covering the table and themselves, save, of course, their heads, up with quilts. Facing each other in this ridiculous manner, they chat and while away the dreary days of winter. At the third village after leaving the sons of the Pasha Khan, my Tartar-eyed escort, with much garrulous injunction to his successor, delivers me over to another soldier, himself returning back. This is my favorable opportunity. And soon after leaving the village, I bid my valiant protector return. The man seems totally unable to comprehend why I should order him to leave me, and makes an elaborate display of his pantomimic abilities to impress upon me the information that the country ahead is full of very bad Kurds. 
who will kill and rob me if I venture among them unprotected by a soldier. The expressive action of drawing the finger across the throat appears to be the favorite method of signifying personal danger among all these people. But I already understand that the Persians live in deadly fear of the nomad Kurds. Consequently, his warnings, although evidently sincere, fall on biased ears, and I peremptorily order him to depart. The Tabriz trail is now easily followed without a guide, and with a sense of perfect freedom and unrestraint that is destroyed by having a horseman cantering alongside one, I push ahead, finding the roads variable and passing through several villages during the day. The chief concern of the riots is to detain me until they can bring the resident Khan to see me ride, evidently from a servile desire to cater to his pleasure. They gather around me and prevent my departure until he arrives. An appeal to the revolver will invariably secure my release, but one naturally gets ashamed of threatening people's lives, even under the exasperating circumstances of a forcible detention. Once today, I managed to outwit them beautifully, pretending acquiescence in their proposition of waiting till the arrival of their Khan I propose mounting and riding a few yards for their own edification while waiting. In their eagerness to see, they readily fall into the trap, and the next minute sees me flying down the road with a swarm of bare-legged riots in full chase after me, yelling for me to stop. Fortunately, they have no horses handy, but some of these lanky fellows can run like deer almost and nothing but an excellent piece of road enables me to outdistance my pursuers. Wily as the Persians are, compared to the Osmanlis, one could play this game on them quite frequently, owing to their eagerness to see the bicycle ridden, but it is seldom that the road is sufficiently smooth to justify the attempt. I was gratified to learn from the Persian consul at Erzurum that my stock of Turkish would answer me as far as Tehran, the people west of the capital speaking a dialect known as Tabriz Turkish. Still, I find quite a difference. Almost every Persian points to the bicycle and says, Bu nidimi nidir, this, what is it? And it is several days ere I have an opportunity of finding out exactly what they mean. They are also exceedingly prolific in using the enduring term of Kardash when accosting me. The distance is now reckoned by Farsax, roughly four miles, instead of ours, but although the Farsak is a more tangible and comprehensive measurement than the Turkish hour, in reality it is almost as unreliable to go by. Towards evening I ascend into a more mountainous region, inhabited exclusively by nomad Kurds. From points of vantage, their tents are observable, clustered here and there at the base of the mountains. Descending into a grassy valley or depression, I find myself in close proximity to several different camps, and eagerly avail myself of the opportunity to pass a night among them. I am now in the heart of northern Kurdistan, which embraces both Persian and Turkish territory, and the occasion is most opportune for seeing something of these wild nomads in their own mountain pastures. The green sward is rideable, and I dismount before the sheikh's tent in the presence of a highly interested and interesting audience. The half-wild dogs make themselves equally interesting in another and a less desirable sense as I approach, but the men pelt them with stones, and when I dismount they conduct me and the bicycle at once, into the tent of their chieftain. The sheikh's tent is capacious enough to shelter a regiment almost, and it is divided into compartments similar to a previous description. The sheikh is a big, burly fellow of about forty-five, wearing a turban the size of a half-bushel measure, and dressed pretty much like a well-to-do Turk. As a matter of fact, the Kurds admire the Osmanlis and despise the Persians. The bicycle is reclined against a carpet partition, and after the customary interchange of questions, a splendid fellow, who must be six feet six inches tall and broad-shouldered in proportion, squats himself cross-legged beside me, 
and proceeds to make himself agreeable, rolling me cigarettes, asking questions, and curiously investigating anything about me that strikes him as peculiar. I show them, among other things, a cabinet photograph of myself in all the glory of needle-pointed mustache and dress parade apparel. After a critical examination and a brief conference among themselves, they pronounce me an English Pasha. I then hand the sheikh a set of sketches, but they are not sufficiently civilized to appreciate the sketches. They hold them upside down and sideways, and not being able to make anything out of them, the sheikh holds them in his hand and looks quite embarrassed, like a person in possession of something he doesn't know what to do with. Noticing that the women are regarding these proceedings with much interest from behind a low partition, and not having yet become reconciled to the Mohammedan idea of women habitually ignored and overlooked, I ventured upon taking the photograph to them. They seem much confused at finding themselves the object of direct attention, and they appear several degrees wilder than the men, so far as comprehending such a product of civilization as a photograph is an indication. It requires more material objects than sketches and photos to meet the appreciation of these semi-civilized children of the desert. They bring me their guns and spears to look at and pronounce upon, and then my stalwart entertainer grows inquisitive about my revolver. First extracting the cartridges to prevent accident, I hand it to him, and he takes it for the sheikh's inspection. The sheikh examines the handsome little Smith and Wesson long and wistfully, and then toys with it several minutes apparently reluctant about having to return it. Finally, he asked me to give him a cartridge and let him go out and test its accuracy. I am getting a trifle uneasy at his evident covetedness of the revolver, and in this request I see my opportunity of giving him to understand that it would be a useless weapon for him to possess, by telling him I have but a few cartridges and that others are not procurable in Kurdistan or neighboring countries. Recognizing immediately its uselessness to him under such circumstances, he then returns it without remark. Whether he would have confiscated it without this timely explanation, it is difficult to say. Shortly after the evening meal, an incident occurs which causes considerable amusement. Everything being unusually quiet, one sharp-eyed youth happens to hear the obtrusive ticking of my waterbury and strikes a listening attitude, at which everybody else likewise begins listening. The tick-tick is plainly discernible to everybody in the compartment, and they become highly interested and amused, and commence looking at me for an explanation. With a view to humoring the spirit of amusement thus awakened, I likewise smile but affect ignorance and innocence concerning the origin of the mysterious ticking, and strike a listening attitude as well as the others. Presuming upon our interchange of familiarity, our six-foot sixer then commences searching about my clothing for the watch, but being hidden away in a pantaloon fob and minus a chain, it proves beyond his power of discovery. Nevertheless, by bending his head down and listening, he ascertains and announces it to be somewhere about my person. The waterberry is then produced, and the loudness of its ticking awakes the wonder and admiration of the Kurds, even to a greater extent than the Turks. During the evening the inevitable question of use, Osmanli, and English crops up, and I win unanimous murmurs of approval by laying my forefingers together and stating that the English and the Osmanli are Kardash. I show them my Turkish Teskeri, upon which several of them bestow fervent kisses, and when, by means of placing several stones here and there, I explain to them how, in 1877, the hated Muscov occupied different Muslim cities one after the other, and was prevented by the English from occupying their dearly beloved Stamboul itself, their admiration knows no bounds. Along the trail, not over a mile from camp, a large Persian caravan 
has been halting during the day. Late in the evening, loud shouting and firing of guns announces them as prepared to start on their night's journey. It is customary when going through this part of Kurdistan for the caravan men to fire guns and make as much noise as possible in order to impress the Kurds with exaggerated ideas concerning their strength and number. Everybody in the sheikh's tent thoroughly understands the meaning of the noisy demonstration and the men exchange significant smiles. The firing and the shouting produce a truly magical effect upon a bloodthirsty youngster of ten or twelve summers. He becomes wildly hilarious, gambling about the tent and rolling over and kicking up his heels. He then goes to the sheikh, points to me, and draws his finger across his throat, intimating that he would like the privilege of cutting somebody's throat, and why not let him cut mine? The sheikh and others laugh at this, but instead of chiding him for his tragical demonstration, they favor him with the same admiring glances that grown people bestow upon precocious youngsters the world over. Under these circumstances of abject fear on the one hand, an inbred propensity for violence and plunder on the other, it is really surprising to find the Kurds in Persian territory behaving themselves as well as they do. Quilts are provided for me, and I occupy the same compartment of the tent in common with several of the younger men. In the morning before departing, I am regaled with bread and rich new cream, and when leaving the tent, I pause a minute to watch the busy scene in the female department. Some are churning butter in sheepskin churns, which are suspended from poles and jerked back and forth. Others are weaving carpets, preparing curds for cheese, baking bread, and otherwise industriously employed. I depart from the Kurdish camp, thoroughly satisfied with my experience of their hospitality, but the cerulean waist-scarf bestowed upon me by our Hungarian friend Egali at Belgrade no longer adds its embellishments to my personal adornments. Whenever a favorable opportunity presents, certain young men, belonging to the noble army of hangers-on about the sheikh's apartments, invariably glide inside and importune the guest from Frangistan for any article of his clothing that excites the admiration of their semi-civilized minds. This scarf, they were doubtless penetrating enough to observe, form no necessary part of my wardrobe, and a dozen times in the evening, and again in the morning, I was worried to part with it, so I finally presented it to one of them. He hastily hid it away among his clothes and disappeared, as though fearful, either that the sheikh might see it and make him return it, or that one of the chieftain's favorites might take a fancy to it and summarily appropriate it to his own use. Not more than five miles eastward from the camp, while trundling over a stretch of stony ground, I am accosted by a couple of Kurdian shepherds, but as the country immediately around is wild and unfrequented, save by Kurds, and knowing something of their little weaknesses towards travelers under tempting, one-sided conditions, I deem it advisable to pay as little heed to them as possible. Seeing that I have no intention of halting, they come running up and undertake to forcibly detain me by seizing hold of the bicycle, at the same time making no pretense of concealing their eager curiosity concerning the probable contents of my luggage. Naturally disapproving of this arbitrary conduct, I push them roughly away with a growl more like the voice of a wild animal than of human beings. One draws his sword, and the other picks up a thick, knob stick that he had dropped, in order to better pinch and sound my packages, without giving them time to reveal whether they seriously intend attacking me, or only to try intimidation, I have them nicely covered with the Smith and Wesson. They seem to comprehend in a moment 
that I have them at a disadvantage, and they hurriedly retreat a short distance, executing a series of gyral antics as though expecting me to fire at their legs. They are accompanied by two dogs, tawny-coated monsters, larger than the largest mastiffs, who now proceed to make things lively and interesting around myself and the bicycle. Keeping the revolver in my hand, and threatening to shoot their dogs if they don't call them away, I continue to progress towards where the stony ground terminates, in favor of smooth camel paths about a hundred yards further on. At this juncture I notice several other gentle shepherds coming racing down from the adjacent knolls, but whether to assist their comrades in catching and robbing me, or to prevent a conflict between us, will always remain an uncertainty. I am afraid, however, that with the advantage on their side, the Kurdish herdsmen rarely trouble themselves about any such uncongenial task as peacemaking. Reaching the smooth ground before any of the newcomers overtake me, I mount and speed away, followed by wild yells from a dozen Kurdish throats and chased by a dozen of their dogs. Upon sober second thought, when well away from the vicinity, I conclude this to have been a rather ticklish incident. Had they attacked me, in the absence of anything else to defend myself with, I should have been compelled to shoot them. The nearest Persian village is about ten miles distant. The absence of anything like continuously rideable road would have made it impossible to outdistance their horsemen and a Persian village would have afforded small security against a party of enraged Kurds, after all. The first village I arrived at today, I again attempted the skedaddling dodge on them that proved so successful on one occasion yesterday, but I am foiled by a rocky jump-off in the road today. The road is not so favorable for spurting as yesterday and the racing riots grab me amid much boisterous merriment ere I overcome the obstruction. They take particular care not to give me another chance until the arrival of the Khan. The country hereabouts consists of gravelly, undulating plateaus between the mountains, and well-worn camel paths afford some excellent wheeling. Near midday, while laboriously ascending a long, but not altogether unrideable ascent, I meet a couple of mounted soldiers. They obstruct my road and proceed to deliver themselves of voluble Tabriz Turkish, by which I understand that they are the advance guard of a party in which there is a Ferengi, the Persian term for an Occidental. While talking with them, I am somewhat taken by surprise at seeing a lady on horseback, and two children in a kajave, mule panier, appear over the slope, accompanied by about a dozen Persians. If I am surprised, the lady herself not unnaturally evinces even greater astonishment at the apparition of a lone wheelman here on the caravan roads of Persia. Of course, we are mutually delighted. With the assistance of her servant, the lady alights from the saddle and introduces herself as Mrs. E., the wife of one of the Persian missionaries. Her husband has lately returned home, and she is on the way to join him. The Persians accompanying her comprise her own servants, some soldiers procured of the governor of Tabriz by the English consul to escort her as far as the Turkish border, and a couple of unattached travelers keeping with the party for company and society. A mule driver has charge of pack mules carrying boxes containing, among other things, her husband's library. During the course of ten minutes' conversation, the lady informs me that she is compelled to travel in this manner the whole distance to Trebizond owing to the practical impossibility of passing through Russian territory with the library. Were it not for this, a comparatively short and easy journey would take them to Tiflis, from which point there would be steam communication with Europe. 
Ere the poor lady gets to Trebizond, she will be likely to reflect that a government so civilized as the Tsar's might relax its gloomy laws sufficiently to allow the fixing of official seals to a box of books, and permit its transportation through the country, on condition, if they will, that it should not be opened in transit. Surely there would be no danger of the people's minds being enlightened, not even a little bit, by coming in contact with a library tightly boxed and sealed. At the frontier an escort of Turkish Zaptias will take the place of the Persian soldiers, and at Erzurum the missionaries will, of course, render her every assistance to Trebizond. But it is not without feelings of anxiety for the health of a lady traveling in this rough manner, unaccompanied by her natural protector, that I reflect on the discomfort she must necessarily put up with between here and Erzurum. She seems in good spirits, however, and says that meeting me here in this extraordinary manner is the most romantic incident in her whole experiences of missionary life in Persia. Like many another, she says, she can scarcely conceive it possible that I am traveling without attendance and without being able to speak the languages. One of the unattached travelers gives me a note of introduction to Muhammad Ali Khan, the governor of Piri, a suburban village of Khoi, which I expect to reach some time this afternoon. End of chapter 18 of Around the World on a Bicycle Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens Recording by Paul Richards Section 39 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 19. Persia and the Tabriz Caravan Trail, Part 1. A short trundle to the summit of a sloping pass, and then a winding descent of several miles brings me to a position commanding a view of an extensive valley that looks out from this distance as lovely as a dreaming vision of paradise. An hour later, and I am bowling along beneath overhanging peach and mulberry trees, following a volunteer horseman to Muhammad Ali Khan's garden. Before reaching the garden, a gang of bare-legged laborers engaged in patching up a mud wall favor me with a fusillade of stones, one of which caresses me on the ankle and makes me limp like a Greenwich pensioner when I dismount a minute or two afterward. This is their peculiar way of complimenting a lone Ferengi. Muhammad Ali Khan is found to be rather a moon-faced individual under thirty, who together with his subordinate officials are occupying tents in a large garden. Here, during the summer, they dispense justice to applicants for the same within their jurisdiction, and transact such other official business as is brought before them. In Persia, the distribution of justice consists chiefly in the officials ruthlessly looting the applicants of everything lootable, and the weightiest task of the officials is intriguing together against the pocket of the luckless white who ventures upon seeking equity at their hands. A sorrowful-visaged husbandman is evidently experiencing the easy simplicity of Persian civil justice as I enter the garden. He wears the mournful expression of a man conscious of being irretrievably doomed, while the festive Khan and his equally festive Munshibashi, chief secretary, are laying their wicked heads together and whispering mysteriously. Fifty paces away from everybody, ever and anon, looking suspiciously around as though fearful of the presence of eavesdroppers. After duly binning, 
a young man called Abdullah, who seems to be at the beck and call of everybody, brings forth the samovar, and we drink the customary tea of good fellowship, after which they examine such of my modest effects as take their fancy. The Munshibashi, as becomes a man of education, is quite infatuated with my pocket map of Persia. The fact that Persia occupies so great a space on the map in comparison with the small portions of adjoining countries visible around the edges makes a powerful appeal to his national vanity, and he regards me with increased affection every time I trace out for him the comprehensive boundary line of his native Iran. After nightfall we repair to the principal tent, and Mohammed Ali Khan and his secretary consume the evening hours in the joyous occupation of alternately smoking the kalian, a Persian water pipe not unlike the Turkish nargile, except that it has a straight stem instead of a coiled tube, and swallowing glasses of raw arak every few minutes. They furthermore amuse themselves by trying to induce me to follow their noble example, and in poking fun at another young man because his conscientious scruples regarding the Mohammedan injunction against intoxicants forbids him indulging with them. About eight o'clock the Khan becomes a trifle sentimental and very patriotic, producing a pair of silver-mounted horse pistols from a corner of the tent and waving them theatrically about. He proclaims aloud his mighty devotion to the Shah. At nine o'clock, Abdullah brings in the supper. The Khan's vertebra has become too limp and willowy to enable him to sit upright, and he has become too indifferent to such coarse, unspiritual things as stewed chicken and musk melons to care about eating any, while the Munshibashi's affection for me on account of the map has become so overwhelming that he deliberately empties all the chicken onto my sheet of bread, leaving none whatever for himself and the phenomenal young person with the conscientious scruples. When bedtime arrives, it requires the united exertions of Abdullah and the phenomenal young man to partially undress Muhammad Ali Khan, and drag him to his couch on the floor, the Khan being limp as a dish-rag and a moderately bulky person. The Munshibashi, as becomes an individual of lesser rank and superior mental attainments, is not quite so helpless as his official superior, but on retiring he humorously reposes his feet on the pillow and his head on nothing but the bare floor of the tent, and stubbornly refuses to permit Abdullah to alter either his pillow or his position. The phenomenal young man and myself likewise seek our respective pile of quilts. Abdullah removes the lamp, draws a curtain over the entrance of the tent, and retires. The Persians, as representing the Shiite division of the Mohammedan religion, consider themselves by long odds the holiest people on the earth far holier than the Turks, whom they religiously despise as Sunnites, and unworthy to loose the latchets of their shoes. The Koran strictly enjoins upon them great moderation in the use of intoxicating drinks, yet certain of the Persian nobility are drinking this raw intoxicant by the quart daily. When asked why they don't use it in moderation, they reply, what is the good of drinking arak unless one drinks enough to become drunk and happy? Following this brilliant idea, many of them get drunk and happy regularly every evening. They likewise frequently consume as much as a pint before each meal to create a false appetite and make themselves feel boozy while eating. In the morning the Munshibashi with a soldier for escort accompanies me on horseback to Khoi, which is but about seven miles distance over a perfectly level road. Sad to say, the Munshibashi, besides his yearning affection for fiery, untamed Iraq, 
is a confirmed opium smoker, and after last night's debauch for supper and hitting the pipe this morning for breakfast, he doesn't feel very dashing in the saddle. Consequently, I have to accommodate myself to his pace. It is the slowest seven miles ever ridden on the road by a wheelman, I think. A funeral procession is a lively, rattling affair beside our onward progress toward the mud battlements of Coy. But there is no help for it. Whenever I venture to the fore a little, the dreamy-eyed Munshibashi regards me with a gaze of mild reproachfulness and sings out in a gently chide the erring tone of voice, Kardash, Kardash, meaning, if we are brothers, why do you seem to want to leave me? Human nature could scarcely be proof against an appeal wherein endearment and reproach are so beautifully and harmoniously blended, and it always brings me back to a level with his horse. Reaching the suburbs of Coy, I am initiated into a new departure, new to myself at this time, of Persian sanctimoniousness. Halting at a fountain to obtain a drink, the soldier shapes himself for pouring the water out of the earthenware drinking vessel into my hands. Supposing this to be merely an indication of the Persian's own method of drinking, I motion my preference for drinking out of the jar itself. The soldier looks appealingly toward the Munshibashi, who tells him to let me drink, and then orders him to smash the jar. It then dawns upon my unenlightened mind that being a Ferengi I should have known better than to have allowed my unhallowed lips to a drinking vessel at a public fountain defiling it by so doing, so that it must be smashed in order that the sons of the true prophet may not unwittingly drink from it afterward and themselves become defiled. The Munshibashi pilots me to the residence of a certain wealthy citizen outside the city walls. This person, a mild-mannered, purring-voiced man, is seated in a room with a couple of Sayuds, or descendants of the Prophet. They are helping themselves from a large platter of the finest pears, peaches, and egg plums I ever saw anywhere. The room is carpeted with costly rugs and carpets, in which one's feet sink perceptibly at every step. The walls and ceiling are artistically stuccoed, and the doors and windows are gay with stained glass. Abandoning myself to the guidance of the Munshibashi, I ride around the garden walks, show them the bicycle, revolver, maps of Persia, etc. Like the Munshibashi, they become deeply interested in the map, finding much amusement and satisfaction in having me point out the location of different Persian cities seemingly regarding my ability to do so as evidence of exceeding cleverness and erudition. The untravelled Persian of the northern provinces regard Tehran as the grand idea of a large and important city. If there is any place in the whole world larger and more important, they think it may perhaps be Stamboul. The fact that Stamboul is not on my map while Tehran is they regard as conclusive proof of the superiority of their own capital. The Munshibashi's chief purpose in accompanying me hither has been to introduce me to the attention of the Hoikim. Although the pronunciation is a little different from Hakim, I attribute this to local brogue, and have been surmising this personage to be some doctor who, perhaps, Having graduated at a Frangistan medical college, the Munshibashi thinks will be able to converse with me. After partaking of fruit and tea, we continue on our way to the nearest gateway of the city proper, Koi being surrounded by a ditch and battlemented mud wall. Arriving at a large public enclosure, my guide sends in a letter, 
and shortly afterward delivers me over to some soldiers, who forthwith conduct me into the presence of not a doctor but Ali Khan, the governor of the city, an officer who hereabouts rejoices in the title of the Hoi Kim. The governor proves to be a man of superior intelligence. He has been Persian ambassador to France some time ago, and understands French fairly well. Consequently we manage to understand each other after a fashion, although he has never before seen a bicycle, his knowledge of the mechanical ingenuity of the Ferengis causes him to regard it with more intelligence than an untravelled native, and to better comprehend my journey and its object. Assisted by a dozen mullahs, priests, and officials in flowing gowns and henna-tinted beards and fingernails, the governor is transacting official business and he invites me to come into the council chamber and be seated. In a few minutes the noontide meal is announced. The governor invites me to dine with them, and leads the way into the dining room, followed by his councillors, who form in line behind him according to their rank. The dining room is a large, airy apartment, opening into an extensive garden, a bountiful repast is spread on yellow checkered tablecloths on the carpeted floor. The governor squats cross-legged at one end. The stately-looking wiseacres in flowing gowns range themselves along each side in a similar attitude, with much solemnity and show of dignity. They, at least so I fancy, evidently are anything but rejoiced at the prospect of eating with an infidel Ferengi. The governor, being a far more enlightened and consequently less bigoted personage, looks about him a trifle embarrassed, as if searching for some place where he can seat me in a position of becoming honour without offending the prejudices of his sanctimonious counsellors. Noting this, I at once come to his relief by taking the position farthest from him, attempting to imitate them in their cross-legged attitude. My unhappy attempt to sit in this uncomfortable attitude, uncomfortable at least to anybody unaccustomed to it, provokes a smile from his excellency, and he straightway orders an attendant to fetch in a chair and a small table. The councillors look on in silence, but they are evidently too deeply impressed with their own dignity and holiness to commit themselves to any such display of levity as a smile. A portion of each dish is placed upon my table, together with a traveller's combination knife, fork, and spoon, a relic, doubtless, of the governor's Parisian experience. His Excellency, Having waited and kept the councillors waiting until these preparations are finished, motions for me to commence eating, and then begins himself. The repast consists of boiled mutton, rice pilau with curry, mutton chops, hard-boiled eggs with lettuce, a pastry of sweetened rice flour, musk melons, watermelons, several kinds of fruit, and for beverage glasses of iced sherbet. Of all the company, I alone use knife, fork, and plates. Before each Persian is laid a broad sheet of bread. Bending their heads over this, they scoop up small handfuls of pilau, and toss it dexterously into their mouths, scattering particles missing the expectantly opened receptacle fall back on the bread. This handy sheet of bread is used as a plate for placing a chop or anything else on, as a table napkin for wiping fingertips between courses, and now and then a piece is pulled off and eaten. When the meal is finished, an attendant waits on each guest with a brazen bowl and ewer of water and a towel. 
After the meal is over, the governor is no longer handicapped by the religious prejudices of the mollas, and leaving them he invites me into the garden to see his two little boys go through their gymnastic exercises. They are clever little fellows of about seven and nine, respectively, with large black eyes and clear olive complexions. All the time we are watching them, the governor's face is wreathed in a fond, parental smile. The exercises consist chiefly in climbing a thick rope dangling from a crossbeam. After seeing me ride the bicycle, the governor wants me to try my hand at gymnastics, but being nothing of a gymnast, I respectfully beg to be excused. While thus enjoying a pleasant hour in the garden, a series of resounding thwacks are heard somewhere nearby and looking around some intervening shrubs, I observe a couple of farashes bastinadoing a culprit. Seeing me more interested in this novel method of administering justice than in looking at the youngsters trying to climb ropes, the governor leads the way thither. The man, evidently a riot, is lying on his back. His feet are lashed together, and held souls uppermost by means of a horizontal pole, while the farashes briskly belabour them with willow sticks. The soles of the riot's feet are hard and thick as rhinoceros hide, almost from habitually walking barefooted, and under these conditions his punishment is evidently anything but severe. The flagellation goes merrily and uninterruptedly forward until fifty sticks about five feet long and thicker than a person's thumb are broken over his feet without eliciting any signals of distress from the horny-hoofed riot, except an occasional sorrowful groan of Allah. He is then loosed and limps painfully away, but it looks like a rather hypocritical limp. After all, fifty sticks, by the by, is a comparatively light punishment, several hundred sometimes being broken at a single punishment. Upon taking my leave, the governor kindly details a couple of soldiers to show me to the best caravanserai, and to remain and protect me from the worry and annoyance of the crowds until my departure from the city. Arriving at the caravanserai, my valiant protectors undertake to keep the following crowd from entering the courtyard. The crowd refuses to see the justice of this arbitrary proceeding, and a regular pitched battle ensues in the gateway. The caravanserai jis reinforce the soldiers, and by laying on vigorously with thick sticks, they finally put the rabble to flight. They then close the caravanserai gates until the excitement has subsided. Khoi is a city of perhaps 50,000 inhabitants, and among them all there is no one able to speak a word of English. Contemplating the surging mass of woolly-hatted Persians from the Balakana, balcony, our word is taken from the Persian, of the caravanserai, and hearing nothing but unintelligible language, I detect myself unconsciously recalling the lines, Oh, it was pitiful, in a whole city full. It is the first large city I have visited without finding somebody capable of speaking at least a few words of my own language. Locking the bicycle up, I repair to the bazaar, my watchful and zealous attendants making the dust fly from the shoulders of such unlucky whites, whose eager inquisitiveness to obtain a good close look brings them within the reach of their handy staves. We are followed by immense crowds, a Ferengi being a rara avis in Khoi, and the fame of the wonderful Aspi I, horse of iron, has spread like wildfire through the city. In the bazaar I obtain Russian silver money, which is the chief currency of the country as far east as Zhenjian. 
Partly to escape from the worrying crowds and partly to ascertain the way out next morning, as I intend making an early start, I get the soldiers to take me outside the city wall and show me the Tabriz road. A new caravanserai is in process of construction just outside the Tabriz gate, and I become an interested spectator of the Persian mode of building the walls of a house. These of the new caravanserai are nearly four feet thick. Parallel walls of mud bricks are built up, leaving an interspace of two feet or thereabouts. This is filled with stiff, well-worked mud, which is dumped in by buckets full and continually trampled by barefooted laborers. Harder bricks are used for the doorways and windows. The bricklayer uses mud for mortar and his hands for a trowel. He works without either level or plumb line and keeps up a doleful, melancholy chant from morning to night. The mortar is handed to him by an assistant by handsful. Every workman is smeared and spattered with mud from head to foot, as though glorying in covering themselves with the trademark of their calling. Strolling away from the busy builders, we encounter a man, the water boy of the gang, bringing a three-gallon pitcher of water from a spring half a mile away. Being thirsty, the soldiers shout for him to bring the pitcher. Scarcely conceiving it possible that these humble mud daubers would be so wretchedly sanctimonious, I drink from the jar, much to the disgust of the poor water carrier, who forthwith empties the remainder away and returns with hurried trot to the spring for a fresh supply. He would doubtless have smashed the vessel had it been smaller and of lesser value. Naturally, I feel a trifle conscience-stricken at having caused him so much trouble, for he is a rather elderly man. But the soldiers display no sympathy for him whatever, apparently regarding a humble water-carrier as a person of small consequence anyhow, and they laugh heartily at seeing him trotting briskly back half a mile for another load. Had he taken the first water after a Ferengi had drank from it, and allowed his fellow workmen to unwittingly partake of the same, it would probably have fared badly with the old fellow had they found it afterward. Returning cityward, we meet our friend, the Munshibashi, looking me up. He is accompanied by a dozen better-class Persians, scattering friends and acquaintances of his, whom he has collected during the day, chiefly to show them my map of Persia. The mechanical beauty of the bicycle, and the apparent victory over the laws of equilibrium in riding it being in the opinion of the scholarly Munshibashi, quite overshadowed by a map which shows Tehran and Khoi, and doesn't show Stamboul, and which shows the whole broad expanse of Persia, and only small portions of other countries. This latter fact seems to have made a very deep impression upon the Munshibashi's mind. It appears to have filled him with the unalterable conviction that all other countries are insignificant compared with Persia. In his own mind, this patriotic person has always believed this to be the case, but he is overjoyed at finding his belief verified, as he fondly imagines, by the map of a Ferengi. Returning to the caravanserai, we find the courtyard crowded with people, attracted by the fame of the bicycle. The Munshibashi straightway ascends to the Balakhana, tenderly unfolds my map, and displays it for the inspection of the gaping multitude below. While five hundred pairs of eyes gaze wonderingly upon it, without having the slightest conception of what they are looking at, he proudly traces with his finger the outlines of Persia. It is one of the most amusing scenes imaginable. The Munshibashi and myself, 
surrounded by his little company of friends, occupying the Balakana, proudly displaying to a mixed crowd of fully five hundred people a shilling map as a thing to be wondered at and admired. After the departure of the Munshibashi and his friends, by invitation I pay a visit of curiosity to a company of dervishes. They themselves pronounce it Darwish, accompanying one of the caravanserai rooms. There are eight of them lolling about in one small room. Their appearance is disgusting and yet interesting. They are all but naked in deference to the hot weather and to obtain a little relief from the lively tenants of their clothing. Prominent among their effects are panther or leopard skins, which they use as cloaks, small steel battle-axes, and huge spiked clubs. Their whole appearance is most striking and extraordinary. Their long black hair is dangling about their naked shoulders. They have the wild, haggard countenances of men whose lives are being spent in debauchery and excesses. Nevertheless, most of them have a decidedly intellectual expression. The Persian dervishes are a strange and interesting people. They spend their whole lives wandering from one end of the country to another, subsisting entirely by mendicancy, yet their cry instead of a beggar's supplication for charity is, Hook, hook, my right, my right. They affect the most wildly picturesque and eccentric costumes, often wearing nothing whatever but white cotton drawers and a leopard or panther skin thrown carelessly about their shoulders, beside which they carry a huge spiked club or steel battle-axe and an arms receiver. This latter is usually made of an oval gourd polished and suspended on small brass chains. The better-class Persians have little respect for these wandering fakirs, but their wild, eccentric appearance makes a deep impression upon the simple-hearted villagers, and the dervishes, whose wits are sharpened by constant knocking about, live mostly by imposing on their good nature and credulity. A couple of these worthies, arriving at a small village, affect their wildest and most grotesque appearance and proceed to walk with stately majestic tread through the streets gracefully brandishing their clubs or battle-axes gazing fixedly at vacancy and reciting aloud from the koran with a peculiar and impressive intonation they then walk about the village holding out their arms receiver and shouting hook ya hook hook ya hook Half afraid of incurring their displeasure, few of the villagers refuse to contribute a copper or portable cooked provisions. Most dervishes are addicted to the intemperate use of opium. Bang, a preparation of Indian hemp, arak and other baleful intoxicants, generally indulging to excess whenever they have collected sufficient money. They are likewise credited with all manner of debauchery. It is this that accounts for their pale, haggard appearance. The following quotation from In the Land of the Lion and the Sun, and which is translated from the Persian, is eloquently descriptive of the general appearance of the dervish. The dervish had the dullard air, the maddened look, the vacant stare, that bang and contemplation give. He moved, but did not seem to live. His gaze was savage and yet sad, what we should call stark, staring mad. All down his back, his tangled hair flowed wild, unkempt. His head was bare. A leopard skin was over him flung. Around his neck huge beads were hung, and in his hand, ah, there's the rub, he carried a portentous club. After visiting the dervishes, I spend an hour in an adjacent chai khan, drinking tea with my escort, 
and treating them to sundry well-deserved kalyans. Among the rabble collected about the doorway is a half-witted youngster of about ten or twelve summers, with a suit of clothes consisting of a waist string and a piece of rag about the size of an ordinary pen-wiper. He is the unfortunate possessor of a stomach disproportionately large, and which intrudes itself upon other people's notice like a prize pumpkin at an agricultural fair. This youth's chief occupation appears to be feeding melon rinds to a pet sheep belonging to the Chai Khan, and playing a resonant tattoo on his abnormally obtrusive paunch with the palms of his hands. This produces a hollow, echoing sound like striking an inflated bladder with a stuffed club, and considering that the youth also introduces a novel and peculiar squint into the performance, it is a remarkably edifying spectacle. Supper time coming around, the soldiers show the way to an eating place where we sup off delicious bazaar kebabs one of the most tasteful preparations of mutton one could well imagine. The mutton is minced to the consistency of paste, and properly seasoned. It is then spread over flat iron skewers and grilled over a glowing charcoal fire. When nicely browned, they are laid on a broad, pliable sheet of bread in lieu of a plate, and the skewers withdrawn leaving before the customer a dozen long, flat fingers of nicely browned kebabs, reposing side by side on the cake of wheat and bread, a most appeasing and digestible dish. Returning to the caravanserai, I dismiss my faithful soldiers with a suitable present, for which they loudly implore the blessing of Allah upon my head, and for the third or fourth time impress upon the caravanserajes the necessity of making my comfort for the night his special consideration. They fill that humble individual's mind with grandiloquent ideas of my personal importance by dwelling impressively on the circumstance of my having eaten with the governor, a fact they likewise have lost no opportunity of heralding throughout the bazaar during the afternoon. The caravanserai G spreads quilts and a pillow for me on the open balachana, and I at once prepare for sleep. A gentle-eyed and youthful Sayud, wearing an enormous white turban and a flowing gown, glides up to my couch and begins plying me with questions. The soldiers, noticing this as they are about leaving the courtyard, favour him with a torrent of imprecations for venturing to disturb my repose. A score of others yell fiercely at him in emulation of the soldiers, causing the dreamy-eyed youth to hastily scuttle away again. Nothing is now to be heard all around but the evening prayers of the caravanserai guests. Listening to the multitudinous cries of Allah il Allah around me, I fall asleep. About midnight I happen to wake again. Everything is quiet. The stars are shining brightly down into the courtyard, and a small grease lamp is flickering on the floor near my head, placed there by the caravanserai G after I had fallen asleep. The past day has been one full of interesting experiences. From the time of leaving the garden of Mohammed Ali Khan, this morning in company with the Munshibashi, until lulled to sleep three hours ago by the deep-voiced prayers of fanatical Mohammedans, the day has proved a series of surprises, and I seem more than ever to have been the sport and plaything of fortune. However, if the fickle goddess never used anybody worse than she has used me today, there would be little cause for complaining." as though to belie their general reputation of sanctimoniousness. A tall, stately Sayud voluntarily poses as my guide and protector en route through the awakening bazaar toward the Tabriz gate next morning. 
cuffing obtrusive youngsters right and left, and chiding grown-up people whenever their inordinate curiosity appeals to him as being aggressive and impolite. One can only account for this strange condescension on the part of this holy man by attributing it to the marvellous civilising and levelling influence of the bicycle. Arriving outside the gate, the crowd of followers are well repaid for their trouble by watching my progress for a couple of miles down a broad, straight roadway, admirably kept and shaded with thrifty chenars or plane trees. Wheeling down this pleasant avenue, I encounter mule trains, the animals festooned with strings of merrily jingling bells, and camels gaily caparisoned, with huge nodding tassels on their heads and pack saddles, and deep-toned bells of sheet iron swinging at their throats and sides. Likewise the omnipresent donkey heavily laden with all manner of village produce for the coy market. My road after leaving the avenue winds around the end of projecting hills, and for a dozen miles traverses a gravelly plain that ascends with a scarcely perceptible gradient to the summit of a ridge. It then descends by a precipitous trail into the valley of Lake Urumia. Following along the northern shore of the lake, I find fairly level roads, but nothing approaching continuous wheeling, owing to washouts and small streams leading from a range of mountains nearby to the left between which and the briny waters of the lake my route leads. Lake Urumia is somewhere near the size of Salt Lake, Utah, and its waters are so heavily impregnated with saline matter that one can lie down on the surface and indulge in a quiet, comfortable snooze. At least this is what I am told by a missionary at Tabriz, who says he has tried it himself and even allowing for the fact that missionaries are but human after all, and this gentleman hails originally from somewhere out west. There is no reason for supposing the statement at all exaggerated. Had I heard of this beforehand, I should certainly have gone far enough out of my course to try the experiment of being literally rocked on the cradle of the deep. Near midday, I make a short circuit to the north to investigate the edible possibilities of a village nestling in a cul-de-sac of the mountain foothills. The resident Khan turns out to be a regular jovial blade, sadly partial to the flowing bowl. When I arrive he is perseveringly working himself up to the proper pitch of booziness for enjoying his noontide repast by means of copious potations of arak. He introduces himself as Hassan Khan, offers me arak, and cordially invites me to dine with him. After dinner, when examining my revolver, map, etc., the Khan greatly admires a photograph of myself as a peculiar proof of Ferengi skill in producing a person's physiognomy and blandly asks me to make him one of himself, doubtless thinking that a person capable of riding on a wheel is likewise possessed of miraculous all-around abilities. End of section 39「Section 40 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 19. Persia and the Tabriz Caravan Trail, Part 2. The Khan consumes not less than a pint of raw arak during the dinner hour, and not unnaturally finds himself at the end a trifle funny and venturesome. When preparing to take my departure, 
he proposes that I give him a ride on the bicycle. Nothing loath to humour him a little in return for his hospitality, I assist him to mount and wheel him around for a few minutes, to the unconcealed delight of the whole population, who gather about to see the astonishing spectacle of their Khan riding on the Ferengi's wonderful Aspi Ahuan. The Khan, being short and pudgy, is unable to reach the pedals, and the confidence-inspiring fumes of Arak lead him to announce to the assembled villagers that if his legs were only a little longer he could certainly go it alone, a statement that evidently fills the simple-minded Riots with admiration for the Khan's allegedly new-discovered abilities. The road continues level, but somewhat loose and sandy. The scenery around becomes strikingly beautiful, calling up thoughts of Arabian Nights entertainments, and the genie and troubadours of Persian song. The bright, blue waters of Lake Urumia stretch away southward to where the dim outlines of mountains a hundred miles away mark the southern shore. Rocky islets at a lesser distance, and consequently more pronounced in character and contour, rear their jagged and picturesque forms sheer from the azure surface of the liquid mirror, the face of which is unruffled by a single ripple and unspecked by a single animate or inanimate object. The beach is thickly encrusted with salt, white and glistening in the sunshine. The shoreland is mingled sand and clay of a deep red color, thus presenting the striking and beautiful phenomena of a lake shore painted red, white, and blue by the inimitable hand of nature. A range of rugged gray mountains run parallel with the shore, but a few miles away crystal streams come bubbling lakeward over pebble-bedded channels from sources high up the mountain slopes. Villages, hidden amid groves of spreading jujubes and graceful chenars, nestle here and there in the rocky gateways of ravines. Orchards and vineyards are scattered about the plain. They are imprisoned within gloomy mud walls, but like living creatures struggling for their liberty, the fruit-laden branches extend beyond their prison walls, and the graceful tendrils of the vines find their way through the sun-cracks and fissures of decay, and trail over the top as though trying to cover with nature's charitable veil the unsightly works of man, and all is arched over with the cloudless Persian sky. Beaming the roads of this picturesque region in search of victims, is a most persistent and pugnacious species of fly, rollicking as the blue bottle and the veritable double of the green-head horsefly of the western prairies. He combines the dash and impetuosity of the one with the ferocity and persistence of the other, but he is happily possessed of one redeeming feature not possessed by either of the above-mentioned and well-known insects of the western world. When either of these settles himself affectionately on the end of a person's nose, and the person, smarting under the indignity, hits himself viciously on that helpless and unoffending portion of his person, as a general thing it doesn't hurt the fly, simply because the fly doesn't wait long enough to be hurt. But the Lake Urumia fly is a comparatively guileless insect, and quietly remains where he alights until it suits one's convenience to forcibly remove him. For this redeeming quality I bespeak for him the warmest encomiums of fly-harassed humans everywhere. Dusk is settling down over the broad expanse of lake, plain, and mountain, when I encounter a number of villagers taking donkey-loads of fruit and almonds from an orchard to their village. They cordially invite me to accompany them and accept their hospitality for the night. They are travelling toward a large area of walled orchards, but a short distance to the north, 
and I naturally expect to find their village located among them. So not knowing how far ahead the next village may be, I gladly accept their kindly invitation and follow along behind. It gets dusky, then duskier, then dark. The stars come peeping out thicker and thicker, and still I am trundling with these people slowly along up the dry and stone-strewn channel of springtime freshets, expecting every minute to reach their village, only to be as often disappointed for over an hour, during which we travel out of my proper course perhaps four miles. Finally, after crossing several little streams, or rather one stream several times, we arrive at our destination, and I am installed as the guest of a leading villager, behind a sort of open porch attached to the house. Here, as usual, I quickly become the centre of attraction for a wandering and admiring audience of half-naked villagers. The villager whose guest I become brings forth bread and cheese. Some bring me grapes, others newly gathered almonds, and then they squat around in the dim religious light of primitive grease lamps and watch me feed, with the same wondering interest and the same unconcealed delight with which youthful Londoners at the zoological gardens regard a pet monkey devouring their offerings of nuts and ginger snaps. I scarcely know what to make of these particular villagers. They seem strangely childlike and unsophisticated, and moreover perfectly delighted at my unexpected presence in their midst. It is doubtful whether their unimportant little village among the foothills was ever before visited by a Ferengi. Consequently, I am to them a rara avis to be petted and admired. I am inclined to think them a village of Yazids, or devil worshippers. The Yazids believe that Allah, being by nature kind and merciful, would not injure anybody under any circumstances. Consequently, there is nothing to be gained by worshipping him. Shaitan, Satan, on the contrary, has both the power and the inclination to do people harm. Therefore they think it politic to cultivate his good will and to pursue a policy of conciliation toward him by worshipping him and revering his name. Thus they treat the name of Satan with even greater reverence than Christians and Mohammedans treat the name of God. Independent of their hospitable treatment of myself, these villagers seem but little advanced in their personal habits above mere animals. The women are half-naked, and seem possessed of little more sense of shame than our original ancestors before the fall. There is great talk of Kardash among them in reference to myself. They are advocating hospitality of a nature altogether too profound for the consideration of a modest and discriminating Ferengi. Hospitable intentions that I deem it advisable to dissipate at once by affecting deep, dense ignorance of what they are discussing. In the morning they search the village over to find the wherewithal to prepare me some tea before my departure. Eight miles from the village I discover that four miles forward yesterday evening, instead of backward, would have brought me to a village containing a caravanserai. I naturally feel a trifle chagrined at the mistake of having journeyed eight unnecessary miles, but am perhaps amply repaid by learning something of the utter simplicity of the villagers before their character becomes influenced by intercourse with more enlightened people. My course now leads over a stony plain. The wheeling is reasonably good, and I gradually draw away from the shores of Lake Urumia. Melon gardens and vineyards are frequently found here and there across the plain. The only entrance to the garden is a hole about three feet by four in the high mud wall, and this is closed by a wooden door 
an armhole is generally found in the wall to enable the owner to reach the fastening from the outside. Investigating one of these fastenings at a certain vineyard, I discover a lock so primitive that it must have been invented by prehistoric man. A flat wooden bar or bolt is drawn into a mortise-like receptacle of the wall, open at the top. The man then daubs a handful of wet clay over it. In a few minutes the clay hardens and the door is fast. This is not a burglar-proof lock, certainly, and is only depended upon for a fastening during the temporary absence of the owner in the daytime. During the summer the owner and family not infrequently live in the garden altogether. During the forenoon the bicycle is the innocent cause of two people being thrown from the backs of their respective steeds. One is a man carelessly sitting sidewise on his donkey. The meek-eyed jackass suddenly makes a pivot of his hind feet and wheels round, and the rider's legs as suddenly shoot upward. He frantically grips his fiery, untamed steed around the neck as he finds himself overbalanced, and comes up with a broad grin and an irrepressible chuckle of merriment over the unwonted spirit displayed by his meek and humble charger, that probably had never scared at anything before in all its life. The other case is unfortunately a lady whose horse literally springs from beneath her, treating her to a clean tumble. The poor lady sings out, Allah, rather snappishly at finding herself on the ground, so snappishly that it leaves little room for doubt of its being an imprecation, but her rude, unsympathetic attendants laugh right merrily at seeing her floundering about in the sand. Fortunately, she is uninjured. Although Turkish and Persian ladies ride a la Amazon, a position that is popularly supposed to be several times more secure than side saddles, it is a noticeable fact that they seem perfectly helpless and come to grief the moment their steed shies at anything or commences capering about with anything like violence. On a portion of road that is unridable from sand, I am captured by a rowdyish company of donkey drivers returning with empty fruit baskets from Tabriz. They will not be convinced that the road is unsuitable and absolutely refuse to let me go without seeing the bicycle ridden. After detaining me until patience on my part ceases to be a virtue, and apparently as determined for their purpose as ever, I am finally compelled to produce the convincing argument with five chambers and rifled barrel. These crowds of donkeymen seem inclined to be rather lawless, and scarcely a day passes lately but what this same eloquent argument has to be advanced in the interest of individual liberty. Fortunately, the mere sight of a revolver in the hands of a Ferengi has the magical effect of transforming the roughest and most overbearing gang of riots into peaceful retiring citizens. The plain I am now traversing is a broad, grey-looking area surrounded by mountains, and stretching away eastward from Lake Urumia for seventy-five miles. It presents the same peculiar aspect of Persian scenery nearly everywhere, a general verdureless and unproductive country, with the barren surface here and there relieved by small oases of cultivated fields and orchards, the villages being built solely of mud, and consequently of the same colour as the general surface, are undistinguishable from a distance unless rendered conspicuous by trees. Labouring under a slightly mistaken impression concerning the distance to Tabriz, I push ahead in the expectation of reaching there tonight. The plain becomes generally more cultivated. The caravan routes from different directions come to a focus on broad trails leading into the largest city in Persia, and which is the great centre of distribution for European goods arriving by caravan to Trebizond. Coming to a large, scattering village some time in the afternoon, 
I trundle leisurely through the lanes enclosed between lofty and unsightly mud walls, thinking I have reached the suburbs of Tabriz. Finding my mistake upon emerging on the open plain again, I am yet again deceived by another spreading village, and about six o'clock find myself wheeling eastward across an uncultivated stretch of uncertain dimensions. The broad caravan trail is worn by the traffic of centuries considerably below the level of the general surface, and consists of a number of narrow parallel trails along which swarms of donkeys laden with produce from tributary villages daily plod, besides the mule and camel caravans from a greater distance. These narrow beaten paths afford excellent wheeling, and I bowl along quite briskly. As one approaches Tabriz, the country is found traversed by an intricate network of irrigating ditches, some of them works of considerable magnitude. The embankments on either side of the road are frequently high enough to obscure a horseman. These works are almost as old as the hills themselves, for the cultivation of the Tabriz plain has remained practically an unchanged system for three thousand years as though, like the ancient laws of the Medes and Persians, it also were made unchangeable. About dusk I fall in with another riotous crowd of homeward-bound fruit-carriers, who, not satisfied at seeing me ride past, want to stop me. One of them rushes up behind, grabs my package attached to the rear baggage-carrier, and nearly causes an overthrow. Frightening him off, I spurt ahead, barely escaping two or three donkey cudgels hurled at me in pure wantonness, born of the courage inspired by a majority of twenty to one. There is no remedy for these unpleasant occurrences, except travelling under escort, and the avoiding serious trouble or accident becomes a matter for everyday congratulation. At eighteen miles from the last village, it becomes too dark to remain in the saddle without danger of headers, and a short trundle brings me, not to Tabriz even now, but to another village eight miles nearer. Here there is a large caravanserai. Near the entrance is a hole in the wall, sort of a shop, wherein I espy a man presiding over a tempting assortment of cantaloupes, grapes and pears. The whirligig of fortune has favoured me today with tea, blotting paper ekmek, and grapes for breakfast, later on two small watermelons, and at two p.m. blotting paper ekmek and an infinitesimal quantity of yart, now called mast. It is unnecessary to add that I arrive in this village with an appetite that will countenance no unnecessary delay. Two splendid ripe cantaloupes, several fine bunches of grapes and some pears are devoured immediately, with a reckless disregard of consequences, justifiable only on the grounds of semi-starvation and a temporary barbarism born of surrounding circumstances. After this savage attack on the Mevaji's stock, I learn that the village contains a small chai khan. Repairing thither, I stretch myself on the divan for an hour's repose, and afterward partake of tea, bread, and peaches. At bedtime the kanji makes me up a couch on the divan, locks the door inside, blows out the light, and then afraid to occupy the same building with such a dangerous-looking individual as myself, climbs to the roof through a hole in the wall. Eager villagers carry both myself and wheel across a bridgeless stream upon resuming my journey to Tabriz the next morning, though a trifle deep with dust and sand, and in an hour I am threading the suburban lanes of the city. Along these eight miles I certainly pass not less than five hundred pack-donkeys en route to the Tabriz market with everything, from baskets of the choicest fruit in the world, to huge bundles of prickly camel-thorn, and sacks of tezek for fuel. 
No animals in all the world, I should think, stand in more need of the kindly offices of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals than the thousands of miserable donkeys engaged in supplying Tabriz with fuel. Their brutal drivers seem utterly callous and indifferent to the pitiful sufferings of these patient toilers. Numbers of instances are observed this morning where the rough, ill-fitting breech-straps and ropes have literally seesawed their way through the skin and deep into the flesh, and are still rasping deeper and deeper every day, no attempt whatever being made to remedy this evil. On the contrary, their pitiless drivers urge them on by prodding the raw sores with sharpened sticks, and by belaboring them unceasingly with an instrument of torture in the shape of whips with six inches of ordinary trace chain for a lash. As if the noble army of Persian donkey drivers were not satisfied with the refinement of physical cruelty to which they have attained, they add insult to injury by talking constantly to their donkeys while driving them along, and accusing them of all the crimes in the calendar, and of every kind of disreputable action. Fancy the bitter sense of humiliation that must overcome the proud, haughty spirit of a mouse-coloured jackass at being prodded in an open wound with a sharp stick, and hearing himself at the same time thus insultingly addressed. O thou son of a burnt father and murderer of thine own mother, would that I myself had died rather than my father should have lived to see me drive such a brute as thou art. Yet this sort of talk is habitually indulged in by the barbarous drivers. While young, the donkey's nostrils are slit open clear up to the bridge-bone, this is popularly supposed among the Persians to be an improvement upon nature, in that it gives them greater freedom of respiration, instead of the well-known clucking sound used among ourselves as a persuasive, the Persian makes a sound not unlike the bleating of a sheep. A stranger, being within hearing and out of sight of a gang of donkey drivers in a hurry to reach their destination, would be more likely to imagine himself in the vicinity of a flock of sheep than anything else. As is usually the case, a volunteer guide bobs serenely up immediately I enter the city, and I follow confidently along, thinking he is piloting me to the English consulate, as I have requested. Instead of this, he steers me into the custom house, and turns me over to the officials. These worthy gentlemen, after asking me to ride around the custom-house yard, pretend to become altogether mystified about what they ought to do with the bicycle, and in the absence of any precedent to govern themselves by, finally conclude among themselves that the proper thing would be to confiscate it. Obtaining a guide to show me to the residence of Mr. Abbott, the English Consul-General, that energetic representative of Her Majesty's government smiles audibly at the thoughts of their mystification, and then writes them a letter couched in terms of humorous reproachfulness, asking them what in the name of Allah and the Prophet they mean by confiscating a traveller's horse, his carriage, his camel, his everything on legs and wheels consolidated into the beautiful vehicle with which he is journeying to Tehran, to see the Shah, and all around the world to see everybody and everything, ending by telling them that he never in all his consular experiences heard of a proceeding so utterly atrocious. He sends the letter by the consulate dragoman, who accompanies me back to the custom house. The officers at once see and acknowledge their mistake, but meanwhile they have been examining the bicycle and some of them appear to have fallen violently in love with it. They yield it up, but it is with apparent reluctance, and one of the leading officials takes me into the stable, and showing me several splendid horses, begs me to take my choice from among them and leave the bicycle behind. Mr. and Mrs. Abbott cordially invite me to become their guest while staying at Tabriz. Today is Thursday and although my original purpose was only to remain here a couple of days, 
the innovation from roughing it on the road to roast duck for dinner and breakfast in one's own room of a morning coupled with warnings against travelling on the sabbath and invitations to dinner from the american missionaries proves a sufficient inducement for me to conclude to stay till monday satisfied at the prospect of reaching tehran in good season it is now something less than four hundred miles to tehran with the assurance of better roads than i have yet had in persia for the greater portion of the distance besides this the route is now a regular post route with shaparkhanas post houses at distances of four to five farsaks apart on friday night tabriz experienced two slight shocks of an earthquake and in the morning mr abbott points out several fissures in the masonry of the consulate caused by previous visitations of the same undesirable nature the earthquakes here seem to resemble the earthquakes of california in that they come reasonably mild and often the place likewise awakens memories of the golden state in another and more appreciative particular nowhere save perhaps in california does one find such delicious grapes peaches and pears as at ancient taurus a speciality for which it has been justly celebrated from time immemorial on saturday i take dinner with mr oldfather one of the missionaries and in the evening we all pay a visit to mr whipple and family the consulate link boy lighting the way before us with a huge cylindrical lantern of transparent oiled muslin called a farnoose these lanterns are always carried after night before people of wealth or social consequence varying in size according to the person's idea of their own social importance the size of the farnoose is supposed to be an index of the social position of the person or family so that one can judge something of what sort of people are coming down the street even on the darkest night whenever the attendant link boy heaves in sight with the farnoose some of these social indicators are the size of a portland cement barrel even in persia it is rather a smile provoking thought to think what tremendous farnooses would be seen lighting up the streets on gloomy evenings were this same custom prevalent among ourselves few of us but what could call to memory people whose farnooses would be little smaller than brewery mash tubs and which would have to be carried between six foot link boys on a pole Amir i Nazan, the valiat or heir apparent to the throne, and at present nominal governor of Tabriz, has seen a tricycle in Tehran, one having been imported some time ago by an English gentleman in the Shah's service. But the fame of the bicycle excites his curiosity, and he sends an officer round to the consulate to examine and report upon the difference between bicycle and tricycle and also to discover and explain the modus operandi of maintaining one's balance on two wheels the officer returns with the report that my machine won't even stand up without somebody holding it and that nobody but a ferengi who is in league with shaitan could possibly hope to ride it perhaps it is this alarming report and the fear of exciting the prejudices of the mullahs and fanatics about him by having anything to do with a person reported on trustworthy authority to be in league with his satanic majesty that prevents the prince from requesting me to ride before him in tabriz but i have the pleasure of meeting him at haji aga on the evening of the first day out mr whipple kindly makes out an itinerary of the villages and chaparkanas i shall pass on the journey to tehran the superintendent of the Tabriz station of the Indo-European Telegraph Company voluntarily telegraphs to the agents at Mayana and Zenjan when to expect me, and also to Tehran. Mrs. Abbott fills my coat pockets with roast chicken, and thus equipped and prepared, at nine o'clock on Monday morning I am ready for the home stretch of the season, before going into winter quarters. 
the Turkish consul general, a corpulent gentleman whose avoir du poids I mentally jot down at four hundred pounds, comes around with several others to see me take a farewell spin on the bricked pavements of the consulate garden. Like all persons of four hundred pounds weight, the effendi is a good-natured, jocose individual, and causes no end of merriment by pretending to be anxious to take a spin on the bicycle himself, whereas it requires no inconsiderable exertion on his part to waddle from his own residence hard by into the consulate. Three soldiers are detailed from the consulate staff to escort me through the city. En route through the streets the pressure of the rabble forces one unlucky individual into one of the dangerous, narrow holes that abound in the streets, up to his neck. The crowd yell with delight at seeing him tumble in, and nobody stops to render him any assistance or to ascertain whether he is seriously hurt. Soon a poor old riot on a donkey happens amid the confusion to cross immediately in front of the bicycle. Whack, whack, whack come the ready staves of the zealous and vigilant soldiers across the shoulders of the offender. The crowd howls with renewed delight at this, and several hilarious hobbledehoys endeavour to shove one of their companions in the place vacated by the belaboured riot, in the hope that he likewise will come in for the visitation of the soldiers' o'erwilling staves. The broad suburban road where the people have been fondly expecting to see the bicycle light out in earnest for Tehran at a marvellous rate of speed is found to be nothing less than a bed of loose sand and stones, churned up by the narrow hoofs of multitudinous donkeys. Quite a number of better-class Persians accompany me some distance further on horseback. When taking their departure, a gentleman on a splendid Arab charger shakes hands and says, Goodbye, my dear, which apparently is all the English he knows. He has evidently kept his eyes and ears open when happening about the English consulate, and the happy thought striking him at the moment he repeats, parrot-like, this term of endearment, all unsuspicious of the ridiculousness of its application in the present case. For several miles the road winds tortuously over a range of low, stony hills, the surface being generally loose and unridable. The water supply of Tabriz is conducted from these hills by an ancient system of canats, or underground water ditches. Occasionally one comes to a sloping cavern leading down to the water. On descending to the depth of from twenty to forty feet, a small, rapidly coursing stream of delicious cold water is found, well rewarding the thirsty traveller for his trouble. Sometimes these cavernous openings are simply sloping bricked archways provided with steps. The course of these subterranean waterways can always be traced their entire length by uniform mounds of earth, piled up at short intervals on the surface. Each mound represents the excavations from a perpendicular shaft, at the bottom of which the crystal water can be seen coursing along toward the city. They are merely manholes for the purpose of readily cleaning out the channel of the canart. The water is conducted underground, chiefly to avoid the waste by evaporation and absorption in surface ditches. These canarts are very extensive affairs in many places. The long rows of surface mounds are visible stretching for mile after mile across the plain as far as eye can penetrate or until, losing themselves among the foothills of some distant mountain chain, they were excavated in the palmy days of the Persian Empire to bring pure mountain streams to the city fountains and to irrigate the thirsty plain. It is in the interest of self-preservation that the Persians now keep them from falling into decay. At noon, while seated on a grassy knoll discussing the before-mentioned contents of my pockets, I am favoured with a free exhibition of what a physical misunderstanding is like among the Persian riots. 
two companies of katirjis happened to get into an altercation about something, and from words it gradually develops into blows. Not blows of the fist, for they know nothing of fisticuffs, but they belabor each other vigorously with their long, thick, donkey persuaders, sticks that are anything but small and willowy. It is an amusing spectacle, and seated on the commanding knoll, nibbling drumsticks and wishbones, I can almost fancy myself a Roman of old eating peanuts and watching a gladiatorial contest in the amphitheatre. The similitude, however, is not at all striking, for thick as their quarter-staffs, the Persian riots don't punish each other very severely. Whenever one of them works himself up into a fighting pitch, he commences belaboring one of the others on the back, apparently always striking so that the blow produces a maximum of noise with a minimum of punishment. The person thus attacked never ventures to strike back, but retreats under the blows until his assailant's rage becomes spent and he desists. Meanwhile the war of words goes merrily forward. Perchance in a few minutes the person recently attacked suddenly becomes possessed of a certain amount of rage-inspired courage, and he in turn commences a vigorous assault upon somebody, probably his late assailant. This worthy, having become a little cooler, has mysteriously lost his late pugnacity, and now likewise retreats without once attempting to raise his own stick in self-defence. The lower and commercial-class Persians are pretty quarrelsome among themselves, but they quarrel chiefly with their tongues. When they fight without sticks, it is an ear-pulling, clothes-tugging, wrestling sort of a scuffle, which continues without greater injury than a torn garment, until they become exhausted if pretty evenly matched, or until separated by bystanders. They never, never hurt each other, unless they are intoxicated, when they sometimes use their short swords. There is no intoxication except in private drinking parties. End of section 40。section 41 of Around the World on a Bicycle Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 20. Tabriz to Tehran. The wheeling improves in the afternoon, and alongside my road, runs a bit of civilization in the shape of the splendid iron poles of the Indo-European Telegraph Company. Half a dozen times this afternoon I become the imaginary enemy of a couple of cavalrymen travelling in the same direction as myself. They swoop down upon me from the rear at a charging gallop, valiantly whooping and brandishing their Martini Henrys, when they arrive within a few yards of my rear wheel, they swerve off on either side and rein their fiery chargers up, allowing me to forge ahead. They amuse themselves by repeating this interesting performance over and over again. Being usually a good rider, the dash and courage of the Persian cavalryman is something extraordinary in time of peace. No more brilliant and intrepid cavalry charge on a small scale could be well imagined than I have witnessed several times this afternoon. But upon the outbreak of serious hostilities, the average warrior in the Shah's service suddenly becomes filled with a wild pathetic yearning after the peaceful and honourable calling of a Katirji, an uncontrollable desire to become a humble, contented tiller of the soil, or handyman about a Chai Khan, anything, in fact, of a strictly peaceful character. 
Were I a hostile trooper with a red jacket and a general warlike appearance, and the bicycle a machine gun, though our whooping, charging cavalrymen were twenty instead of two, they would charge only once, and that would be with their horses' crimson dyed tails streaming in the breeze toward me. The Shah's soldiers are gentle, unwarlike creatures at heart. There are probably no soldiers in the whole world that would acquit themselves less creditably in a pitched battle. They are, nevertheless, not without certain soldierly qualities. Well adapted to their country, the cavalrymen are very good riders, and although the infantry does not present a very encouraging appearance on the parade ground, they would meander across five hundred miles of country on half rations of blotting paper ekmek without any vigorous remonstrance, and wait uncomplainingly for their pay until the middle of next year. About five o'clock I arrive at Haji Aga, a large village forty miles from Tabriz. Here, as soon as it is ascertained that I intend remaining overnight, I am actually beset by rival Kanjis who commence jabbering and gesticulating about the merits of their respective establishments, like hotel runners in the United States. Of course, they are several degrees less rude and boisterous, and more considerate of one's personal inclinations than their prototypes in America, but they furnish yet another proof that there is nothing new under the sun. Haji Aga is a village of Sayuds, or descendants of the prophets, these and the mullahs being the most bigoted class in Persia. When I drop into the Chai Khan for a glass or two of tea, the sanctimonious old joker with henna-tinted beard and fingernails, presiding over the samovar, rolls up his eyes in holy horror at the thoughts of waiting upon an unhallowed Ferengi, and it requires considerable pressure from the younger and less fanatical men to overcome his disinclination. He probably breaks the glass I drank from after my departure. About dusk, the Valiat and his courtiers arrive on horseback from Tabriz. The prince immediately seeks my quarters at the Khan, and after examining the bicycle, wants me to take it out and ride. It is getting rather dark, however, so I put him off till morning. He remains and smokes cigarettes with me for half an hour, and then retires to the residence of the local Khan for the night. The prince seems an amiable, easy-going sort of a person. While in my company, his countenance is wreathed in a pleasant smile continually, and I fancy he habitually wears that same expression. His youthful courtiers seem frivolous young bloods, putting in most of the half hour in showing me their accomplishments in the way of making floating rings of their cigarette smoke. Later in the evening I stroll around to the Chai Khan again. It is the gossiping place of the village, and I find our sanctimonious Sayuds indulging in uncomplimentary comments regarding the Valiat's conduct in hobnobbing with the Ferengi. How bigoted these Persians are, and yet how utterly destitute of principle and moral character. In the morning, the prince sends me an invitation to come and drink tea with them before starting out. He bears the same perennial smile as yesterday evening, Although he is generally understood to be completely under the influence of the fanatical and bigoted Sayuds and Molas, who are strictly opposed to the Ferengi and the Ferengi's idea of progress and civilization, he seems withal an amiable, well-disposed young man, whom one could scarce help liking personally, amid feeling sorry at the troubles in store for him ahead. He has an elder brother, the Zil S. Sultan, now governor of the southern provinces. But not being the son of a royal princess, the Shah has nominated Amir I. Nazan as his successor to the throne. 
The zeal es sultan, although of a somewhat cruel disposition, has proved himself a far more capable and energetic person than the valiat, and makes no secret of the fact that he intends disputing the succession with his brother, by force of arms if necessary, at the Shah's demise. He has, so at least it is currently reported, had his sword-blade engraved with the grim inscription, This is for the Valiat's head, and has jocularly notified his inoffensive brother of the fact. The zeal as sultan belongs to the party of progress, wrecks little of the opinions of priests and fanatics, is fond of Englishmen and European improvements, and keeps a kennel of English bulldogs. Should he become Shah of Persia, Baron Reuter's grand scheme of railways and commercial regeneration which was foiled by the fanaticism of the Sayuds and Mollahs soon after the Shah's visit to England, may yet come to something, and the railroad rails now rusting in the swamps of the Caspian littoral may, after all, form part of a railway between the seaboard and the capital. The road for a short distance east of Haji Aga is splendid wheeling, and the prince and his courtiers accompany me for some two miles, finding much amusement in racing with me whenever the road permits of spurting. The country now develops into undulating upland, uncultivated and stone-strewn, except where an occasional stream affording irrigating facilities has rendered possible the permanent maintenance of a mud village and a circumscribed area of wheat-fields, melon-gardens, and vineyards. No sooner does one find himself launched upon the comparatively well-travelled post-route than a difference becomes manifest in the character of the people. Commercially speaking, the Persian is considerably more of a Jew than the Jew himself, and along a route frequented by travellers, the person possessing some little knowledge of the thievish ways of the country and of current prices, besides having plenty of small change, finds these advantages a matter for congratulation almost every hour of the day. The proprietor of a wretched little mud hovel, solemnly presiding over a few thin sheets of bread, a jar of rancid hirsute butter, and a dozen half-ripe melons, affects a glum, sorrowful expression to think that he should happen to be without small change, and consequently obliged to accept the ham sherry's fifty kopeck piece for provisions of one-tenth the value. But the mysterious frequency of this same state of affairs, and accompanying sorrowful expression, taken in connection with the actual plenitude of small change in Persia, awakens suspicions even in the mind of the most confiding and uninitiated person. A peculiar system of commercial mendicancy obtains among the proprietors of melon and cucumber gardens alongside the road of this particular part of the country. Observing a likely-looking traveller approaching, they come running to him with a melon or cucumber that they know to be utterly worthless and beg the traveller to accept it as a present. Delighted, perhaps, with their apparent simple-hearted hospitality, and moreover sufficiently thirsty to appreciate the gift of a melon, the unsuspecting wayfarer tenders the crafty proprietor of the garden a suitable present of money in return, and accepts the proffered gift. Upon cutting it open, he finds the melon unfit for anything, and it gradually dawns upon him that he has just grown a trifle wiser concerning the inbred cunningness and utter dishonesty of the Persians than he was before. Ere the day is ended, the same game will probably be attempted a dozen times. In addition to these artful customers, one occasionally comes across small colonies of lepers who, being compelled to isolate themselves from their fellows, 
have taken up their abode in rude hovels or caves by the roadside, and sally forth in all their hideousness to beset the traveller with piteous cries for assistance. Some of these poor lepers are loathsome in appearance to the last degree. Their scanty coverings of rags and tatters conceals nothing of the ravages of their dread disease. Some sit at the entrance to their hovels, stretching out their hands and piteously appealing for alms. Others drop down exhausted in the road while endeavouring to run and overtake the passer-by. There is nothing deceptive about these wretched outcasts. Their condition is only too glaringly apparent. Towards sundown, I arrive at Turkomanchai, a large village where in 1828 was drawn up the treaty of peace between Persia and Russia, which transferred the remaining Persian territory of the Caucasus into the capacious maw of the northern bear. It is currently reported that after depriving the Persians of their rights to the navigation of the Caspian Sea, the Tsar coolly gave his amiable friend, the Shah, a practical lesson concerning the irony of fortune by presenting him with a yacht. Seeking the guidance of a native to the caravanserai, this quick-witted individual leads the way through tortuous alleyways to the other end of the village and pilots me to the camp of a tea caravan, pitched on the outskirts. Thinking I had requested to be guided to a caravan, the caravan men direct me to the Shaparkana, where accommodations of the usual rude nature are provided. Sending into the village for eggs, sugar, and tea, the Shaparkana keeper and the stablemen produce a battered samovar, and after frying my supper they prepare tea. They are poor, ragged fellows, but they seem light-hearted and contented. The siren song of the steaming samovar seems to awaken in their semi-civilized breasts a sympathetic response, and they fall to singing and making merry over tiny glasses of sweetened tea, quite as naturally as sailors in a seaport groggery, or Germans over a keg of lager. Jolly, happy-go-lucky fellows, though they outwardly appear. They prove no exception, however, to the general run of their countrymen in the manner of petty dishonesty. Though I gave them money enough to purchase twice the quantity of provisions they brought back, besides promising them the customary small present before leaving, in the morning they make a further attempt on my purse under pretense of purchasing more butter to cook the remainder of the eggs. These are trifling matters to discuss, but they serve to show the wide difference between the character of the peasant classes in Persia and Turkey. The Shaparkana usually consists of a walled enclosure containing stabling for a large number of horses and quarters for the stablemen and station keeper. The quickest mode of travelling in Persia is by Shapar, or in other words on horseback, obtaining fresh horses at each Shaparkana. The country east of Turkomanchai consists of rough, uninteresting upland, with nothing to vary the monotony of the journey, until noon when after wheeling five farsaks I reach the town of Miana celebrated throughout the Shah's dominions for a certain poisonous bug which inhabits the mud walls of the houses and is reputed to bite the inhabitants while they are sleeping. The bite is said to produce violent and prolonged fever and to be even dangerous to life. It is customary to warn travellers against remaining overnight at Miana and of course I have not by any means been forgotten. Like most of these alleged dreadful things, it is found, upon close investigation, to be a big bogey with just sufficient truthfulness about it to play upon the imaginative minds of the people. The Miana bugbear, 
would, I think, be a more appropriate name than Miana Bug. The people here seem inclined to be rather rowdyish in their reception of a Ferengi without an escort. While trundling through the bazaar toward the telegraph station, I become the unhappy target for covertly thrown melon rinds and other unwelcome missiles, for which there appears no remedy except the friendly shelter of the station. This is just outside the town, and before the gate is reached, stones are exchanged for melon rinds, but fortunately without any serious damage being done. Mr. F., a young German operator, has charge of the control station here, and welcomes me most cordially to share his comfortable quarters, urging me to remain with him several days. I gladly accept his hospitality till tomorrow morning. Mr. F. has a brother who has recently become a Mussulman, and married a couple of Persian wives. He is also residing temporarily at Miana. He soon comes around to the telegraph station, and turns out to be a wild, harem-scarum sort of person, who regards his transformation into a Mussulman and the setting up of a harem of his own as anything but a serious affair. As a reward for embracing the Mohammedan religion and becoming a Persian subject, the Shah has given him a sum of money and a position in the Tabriz Mint, besides bestowing upon him the sounding title of Mirza Abdul Karim Khan. It seems that inducements of a like substantial nature are held out to any Ferengi of known respectability who formally embraces the Shiite branch of the Mohammedan religion and becomes a Persian subject. A rare chance for chronic ne'er-do-wells among ourselves, one would think. This novel and festive convert to Islam readily gives me a mental peep behind the scenes of Persian domestic life and would unhesitatingly have granted me a peep in person had such a thing been possible. Imagine the ordinary costume of an opera bouffe artist, shorn of all regard for the difference between real indecency and the suggestiveness of indelicacy permissible behind the footlights, and we have the everyday costume of the Persian harem. In the dreamy eventide, the lord of the harem usually betakes himself to that characteristic institution of the East, and proceeds to drive dull care away by smoking the kalyan and watching an exhibition of the Terpsichorean talent of his wives or slaves. This does not consist of dancing, such as we are accustomed to understand the art, but of grateful posturing and bodily contortions spinning round like a corifi, with hand aloft and snapping their fingers or clashing tiny brass cymbals, standing with feet motionless and wriggling the joints, or bending backward until their loose, flowing tresses touch the ground. Persians able to afford the luxury have their women's apartment walled with mirrors, placed at appropriate angles, so that when enjoying these exhibitions of his wife's abilities, he finds himself not merely in the presence of three or six wives, as the case may be, but surrounded on all sides by scores of airy fairy nymphs, and amid the dreamy fumes and soothing bubble-bubbling of his kalyan, can imagine himself the happy, or one would naturally think unhappy, possessor, of a hundred. The effect of this mirror-work arrangement can be better imagined than described. You haven't got one of those mirrored rooms, have you? I inquire, beginning to get a trifle inquisitive and perhaps rather impertinent. You couldn't manage to smuggle a fellow inside, disguised as a sayud, or nicht replies Mirza Abdul Karim Khan, laughing. I haven't bothered about a mirror chamber yet, because I only remain here for another month. 
but if you happen to come to Tabriz any time after I get settled down there, look me up, and I'll hello. Here comes Prince Asabdullah to see your velocipede. Fateh Ali Shah, the grandfather of the present monarch, had some seventy-two sons, besides no lack of daughters. As the son of a prince inherits his father's title in Persia, the numerous descendants of Fateh Ali Shah are scattered all over the empire, and royal princes bob serenely up in every town of any consequence in the country. They are frequently found occupying some snug, but not always lucrative post under the government. Prince Asabdullah has learned telegraphy and has charge of the government control station here, drawing a salary considerably less than the agent of the English company's line. The Persian government telegraph line consists of one wire strung on tumble-down wooden poles. It is erected alongside the splendid English line of triple wires and substantial iron poles, and the control stations are built adjacent to the English stations, as though the Persians were rather timid about their own abilities as telegraphists, and preferred to nestle, as it were, under the protecting shadow of the English line. Prince Asabdullah has an elder brother who is governor of Miana, and who comes round to see the bicycle during the afternoon. They both seem pleasant and agreeable fellows. When the heat of the day has given place to cooler eventide, and the moon comes peeping over the lofty Koflan Ku mountains nearby to the eastward, we proceed to a large fruit garden on the outskirts of the town, and sitting on the roof of a building, indulge in luscious purple grapes as large as walnuts, and pears that melt away in the mouth. Mirza Abdul Karim Khan plays a German accordion, and Prince Asabdullah sings a Persian love song. The leafy branches of popular groves are whispering in response to a gentle breeze, and playing hide-and-seek across the golden face of the moon and the mountains have assumed a shadowy, indistinct appearance. It is a scene of transcendental loveliness, characteristic of a Persian moonlit night. Afterward, we repair to Mirza Abdul Kirim Khan's house to smoke the kalyan and drink tea. His favorite wife, whom he has taught to respond to the purely Frangistan name of Iozi, replenishes and lights the kalyan, giving it a few preliminary puffs herself by way of getting it under headway, before handing it to her husband, and then serves us with glasses of sweetened tea from the samovar. In deference to her Ferengi brother-in-law and myself, Iozi has donned a gauzy shroud over the above-mentioned indoor costume of the Persian female. She is a beautiful dancer, says her husband admiringly. I wish it were possible for you to see her dance this evening, but it isn't. Eosi herself wouldn't mind, but it would be pretty certain to leak out, and Miana being a rather fanatical place, my life wouldn't be worth that much. And the Khan carelessly snapped his fingers. Supper is brought up to the telegraph station. Prince Asabdullah is invited, and comes round with his servant bearing a number of cucumbers and a bottle of Iraq. The prince, being a genuine Mohammedan, is forbidden by his religion to indulge. Consequently, he consumes the fiery Iraq in preference to some light and harmless native wine. Such is the perversity of human nature. Two princes and a Khan are cantering, not cantering, alongside the bicycle as I pull out eastward from Miana. They accompany me to the foothills approaching the Koflan Ku Pass, and wishing me a pleasant journey, turn their horses' heads homeward again. Reaching the pass proper, I find it to be an exceedingly steep trundle, but quite easy climbing compared with a score of mountain passes in Asia Minor, 
for the surface is reasonably smooth, and toward the summit is an ancient stone causeway. A new and delightful experience awaits me upon the summit of the pass. The view to the westward is a revelation of mountain scenery altogether new and novel in my experience, which can now scarcely be called unvaried. I seem to be elevated entirely above the surface of the earth, and gazing down through transparent, ethereal depths upon a scene of ever-changing beauty. Fleecy cloudlets are floating lazily over the valley far below my position, producing on the landscape a panoramic scene of constantly changing shadows. Through the ethery depths, so wonderfully transparent, the billowy grey foothills, the meandering streams fringed with green, and Miana, with its blue-domed mosques and emerald gardens, present a phantasmagorical appearance, as though they themselves were floating about in the lower strata of space, and undergoing constant transformation. Perched on an apparently inaccessible crag to the north is an ancient robber stronghold commanding the pass. It is a natural fortress requiring but a few finishing touches by man to render it impregnable in the days when the maintenance of robber strongholds were possible. Owing to its walls and battlements being chiefly erected by nature, the Persian peasantry call it the Peri Kazir, believing it to have been built by fairies. While ascending the eastern slope, I surprise a grey lizard almost as large as a rabbit, basking in the sunbeams. He briskly scuttles off into the rocks upon being disturbed. Crossing the Seyfid Rood on a dilapidated brickwork bridge, I cross another range of low hills, among which I notice an abundance of mica cropping above the surface, and then descend to a broad, level plain, extending eastward without any lofty elevation as far as eye can reach. On this shelterless plain I am overtaken by a furious equinoctial gale. It comes howling suddenly from the west, obscuring the recently vacated Kaflan Ku mountains behind an inky veil, filling the air with clouds of dust, and for some minutes rendering it necessary to lie down and fairly hang on to the ground to prevent being blown about. First it begins to rain, then to hail. Heaven's artillery echoes and reverberates in the Koflan Ku mountains, and rolls above the plain, seeming to shake the hailstones down like fruit from the branches of the clouds, and soon I am enveloped in a pelting, pitiless downpour of hailstones, plenty large enough to make themselves felt wherever they strike. To pitch my tent would have been impossible, owing to the wind and the suddenness of its appearance. In thirty minutes or less it is all over. The sun shines out warmly and dissipates the clouds, and converts the ground into an evaporator that envelops everything in steam. In an hour after it quits raining, the road is dry again, and across the plain it is for the most part excellent wheeling. About four o'clock, the considerable village of Sercham is reached. Here, as at Haji Agi, I at once become the bone of contention between rival kanjis wanting to secure me for a guest, on the supposition that I am going to remain overnight. Their anxiety is all unnecessary, however, for away off on the eastern horizon can be observed clusters of familiar black dots that awaken agreeable reflections of the night spent in the Kurdish camp between Ovajik and Khoi. I remain in Sercham long enough to eat a watermelon, ride against my will over rough ground to appease the crowd, and then pull out toward the Kurdish camps which are evidently situated near my proper course. It seems to have rained heavily in the mountains, and not rained at all east of Sercham, for during the next hour I am compelled to disrobe and ford several freshets coursing down ravines over beds that before the storm 
were inches deep in dust. The approaching slopes being still dusty, this little diversion causes me to thank fortune that I have been enabled to keep in advance of the regular rainy season, which commences a little later. Striking a cordish camp adjacent to the trail, I trundle toward one of the tents. Before reaching it, I am overhauled by a shepherd who hands me a handful of dried peaches from a wallet suspended from his waist. The evening air is cool with a suggestion of frostiness, and the occupants of the tent are found crouching around a smoking Tezek fire. They are ragged and of rather unprepossessing appearance, but being instinctively hospitable, they shuffle around to make me welcome at the fire. At first I almost fancy myself mistaken in thinking them cords, for there is nothing of the neatness and cleanliness of our late acquaintances about them. On the contrary, they are almost as repulsive as their sedentary relatives of Dele Baba, but a little questioning removes all doubt of their being cords. They are simply an ill-conditioned tribe, without any idea whatever of thrift or good management. They have evidently been to Tabriz or somewhere lately, and invested most of the proceeds of the season's shearing in three-year-old dried peaches that are hard enough to rattle like pebbles. Sacks full of these edibles are scattered all over the tent serving for seats, pillows, and general utility articles for the youngsters to roll about on, jump over, and throw around. Everybody in the camp seems to be chewing these peaches and throwing them about in sheer wantonness because they are plentiful. Every sack contains finger holes from which one and all help themselves ad libitum in wanton disregard of the future. Nearly everybody seems to be suffering from ophthalmia, which is aggravated by crouching over the densely smoking Tezek, and one miserable-looking old character is groaning and writhing with the pain of a severe stomach ache. By loafing lazily about the tent all day and chewing these flinty dried peaches, this hopeful old joker has well-nigh brought himself to the unhappy condition of the Yosemite Valley mule, who broke into the tent and consumed half a bushel of dried peaches. When the hunters returned to camp and were wondering what marauder had visited their tent and stolen their peaches, they heard a loud explosion behind the tent. Hastily going out, they discover the remnants of the luckless mule scattered about in all directions. Of course, I am appealed to for a remedy, and I am not sorry to have at last come across an applicant for my services as a Hakim, for whose ailment I can prescribe with some degree of confidence. To make assurance doubly sure, I give the sufferer a double dose, and in the morning have the satisfaction of finding him entirely relieved from his misery. There seems to be no order or sense of good manners whatever among these people. We have bread and half-stewed peaches for supper, and while they are cooking, ill-mannered youngsters are constantly fishing them from the kettles with weed stalks, meeting with no sort of reproof from their elders for so doing. When bedtime arrives, everybody seizes quilts, peach sacks, etc., and crawls wherever they can for warmth and comfort. Three men, two women, and several children occupy the same compartment as myself, and gaunt dogs are nosing hungrily about among us. About midnight there is a general hullabaloo among the dogs, and the clatter of horses' hooves is heard outside the tent. The occupants of the tent, including myself, spring up, wondering what all the disturbance is about. A group of horsemen are visible in the bright moonlight outside, and one of them has dismounted, and under the guidance of a shepherd is about entering the tent. 
seeing me spring up and being afraid lest perchance i might misinterpret their intentions and act accordingly he sings out in a soothing voice kardash hamsheri kardash kardash thus assuring me of their peaceful intentions these midnight visitors turn out to be a party of persian travellers from miana from which it would appear they have less fear of the cords here than in Kurdistan near the border. Having somehow found out my whereabouts, they have come to try and persuade me to leave the camp and join their company to Zenjan. Although my own unfavorable impressions of my entertainers are seconded by the visitors' reiterated assurances that these Kurds are bad people, I decline to accompany them knowing the folly of attempting to bicycle over these roads by moonlight in the company of horsemen who would be continually worrying me to ride no matter what the condition of the road after remaining in camp half an hour they take their departure end of section forty one Section 42 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 20, Part 2. To Breeze to Tehran. In the morning, I discover that my Mussulman hat band has mysteriously disappeared, and when preparing to depart, a miscellaneous collection of females gather about me, seize the bicycle, and with much boisterous hilarity refuse to let me depart until I have given each one of them some money. Their behavior is on the whole so outrageous that I appeal to my patient of yesterday evening, in whose bosom I fancy I may perchance have kindled a spark of gratitude, but the old reprobate no longer has the stomach ache, and he regards my unavailing efforts to break away from my hoidenesh tormentors with supreme indifference, as though there were nothing extraordinary in their conduct. The demeanor of these wild-eyed Kurdish females on this occasion fully convinces me that the stories concerning their barbarous conduct towards travelers captured on the road is not an exaggeration, for while preventing my departure they seem to take a rude, boisterous delight in worrying me on all sides, like a gang of puppies barking and harassing anything they fancy powerless to do them harm. After I have finally bribed my freedom from the woman, the men seize me and attempt to further detain me until they can send for their sheik to come from another camp miles away to see me ride. After waiting a reasonable time, out of respect for their having accommodated me with quarters for the night, and no signs of the sheik appearing, I determine to submit to their impudence no longer. They gather about me as before, but presenting my revolver and assuming an angry expression, I threaten instant destruction to the next one laying hands on either myself or the bicycle. They then give way with lowering brows and sullen growls of displeasure. My rough treatment on this occasion, compared with my former visit to a Kurdish camp, proves that there is as much difference between the several tribes of nomad Kurds as between their sedentary relatives of Delhi Baba and Malusulman, respectively. For their general reputation, it were better that I had spent the night in searching. A few miles from the camp, I am overtaken by four horsemen followed by several dogs and a pig. It proves to be the tardy sheik and his retainers, who have galloped several miles to catch me up. The sheik is a pleasant, intelligent fellow of thirty or thereabouts, and astonishes me by addressing me as Monsieur. They canter along for a mile or so, highly delighted, when the sheik cheerily sings out, Adieu, Monsieur, and they wheel about and return. Had their sheik been in the camp I stayed at, my treatment would undoubtedly have been different. I am at the time rather puzzled to account for so strange a sight as a pig galloping briskly behind the horses, taking no notice of the dogs which continually gamble about him, but I afterwards discovered that a pet pig, trained to follow horses, is not an unusual thing among the Persians and Persian cords. They are thin, wiry animals of a sandy color, and quite capable of following a horse for hours. They live in the stable with their equine companions, finding congenial occupation in rooting around for stray grains of barley. The horses and pig are said to become very much attached to each other. When on the road, the pig is wont to signify its disapproval of a too rapid pace by appealing squeaks and grunts, whereupon the horse responsibly slacks its speed to a more accommodating speed for its porcine companion. The road now winds tortuously along the base of some low gravel hills, and the wheeling perceptibly improves. 
Beyond the Nickby it strikes across the hilly country, and more trundling becomes necessary. At Nickby I manage to leave the inhabitants in a profound puzzle by replying that I am not a Ferengi, but an Englishman. This seems to mystify them not a little, and they commence inquiring among themselves for an explanation of the difference. They are probably inquiring yet. Fifty-eight miles are covered from the Cordish camp, and at three o'clock the blue-tiled domes of the Senjin mosques appear in sight. These blue-tiled domes are more characteristic of Persian mosques, which are usually built of bricks and have no lofty tapering minarets as in Turkey. The summons to prayer is called from the top of a wall or roof. When approaching the city gate, a half-crazy man becomes wildly excited at the spectacle of a man on a wheel, and, rushing up, seizes hold of the handle. As I spring from the saddle, he rapidly takes to his heels, finding that I am not pursuing him, he plucks up courage, and, timidly approaching, begs me to let him see me ride again. Zinjin is celebrated for the manufacture of copper vessels, and the rat-a-tat-tat of the workmen beating them out in the coppersmith's quarters is heard fully a mile outside the gate. The hammering is sometimes deafening while trundling through these quarters, and my progress through it is indicated by what might perhaps be termed a sympathetic wave of silence following me along, the din ceasing at my approach and commencing again through renewed vigor after I have passed. Monsieur F., a Levantine gentleman in charge of the station here, fairly outdoes himself in the practical interpretation of genuine old-fashioned hospitality, which brooks no sort of interference with the comfort of his guest, understanding the perpetual worry a person traveling in so extraordinary a manner must be subject to among an excessively inquisitive people like the Persians, he kindly takes upon himself the duty of protecting me from anything of the kind during the day I remain over as his guest, and so manages to secure me much appreciated rest and quiet. The governor of the city sends an officer around saying that himself and several prominent dignitaries would very much like to see the bicycle. Very good, replies Mr. F. The bicycle is here and Mr. Stevens will doubtless be pleased to receive His Excellency and the leading officials of Zenjin any time it suits their convenience to call, and will probably have no objection to showing them the bicycle. It is, perhaps, latest to explain that the governor doesn't show up. I, however, have an interesting visitor, in the person of the Sheikh ul Islam, head of religious affairs in Zinjin, a venerable-looking old party in flowing gown and monster turban, whose hands and flowing beard are dyed to a ruddy yellow with henna. The Sheikh ul Islam is considered the holiest person in Zinjin, and his appearance and demeanor does not in the least belie his reputation. Whatever may be his private opinion of himself, he makes far less display of sanctimoniousness than many of the common sayards, who usually gather their garments about them whenever they pass a Ferengi in the bazaar, for fear their clothing should become defiled by brushing against him. The Sheikh ul Islam fulfills one's idea of a gentle-bred, worthy-minded old patriarch. He examines the bicycle, and listens to the account of my journey with much curiosity and interest and bestows a flattering meed of praise on the wonderful ingenuity of the Ferengis, as exemplified in my wheel. From Zidjan eastward, the road gradually improves, and after a dozen miles develops into the finest wheeling yet encountered in Asia. The country is a gravelly plain between a mountain chain on the left, and a range of lesser hills to the right. Near noon I pass through Sultani, formerly a favorite country resort of the Persian monarchs. On the broad, grassy plain, during an autumn, the Shah was wont to find amusement in maneuvering his cavalry regiments, and for several months an encampment near Sultana became the headquarters of that arm of the service. The Shah's palace and the blue dome of a large mosque, now rapidly crumbling to decay, are visible many miles before reaching the village. The presence of the Shah and his court doesn't seem to have exerted much of a refining or civilizing influence on the common villagers. Otherwise, they have retrograded sadly towards barbarism ever since Sultana has ceased to be a favorite resort. They appear to regard the spectacle of a lone Ferengi meandering through their wretched village on a wheel as an opportunity for doing something aggressive for the cause of Islam not to be overlooked. I am followed by a hooting mob of bare-legged wretches, who forthwith proceed to make things lively and interesting, by pelting me with stones and clods of dirt. One of these wantonly aimed missiles catches me square between the shoulders, with a force that, had it struck me fairly on the back of the neck, would in all probability have knocked me clean out of the saddle. Unfortunately, several irrigating ditches crossing the road immediately ahead prevents escape by a spurt, and nothing remains but to dismount and proceed to make the best of it. There are only about fifty of them actively interested, and part of these being bare boys, they are anything but a formidable crowd of belligerents, if one could only get in among them with a stuffed club. They seem but little more than human vermin in their rags and nakedness, and like vermin, the greatest difficulty is to get hold of them. Seeing me dismount, they immediately take to their heels only to turn and commence throwing stones again at finding themselves unpursued. While I am retreating and actively dodging the shower of missiles, they gradually venture closer and closer until things become too warm and dangerous. I drop the bicycle and make a feint towards them. They then take to their heels to return to the attack again as before, when I again commence retreating. Finally, I try the experiment of a shot in the air, 
by way of notifying them of my ability to do them serious injury. This has the effect of keeping them at a more respectful distance, but they seem to understand that I am not intending serious shooting, and the more expert throwers manage to annoy me considerably until rideable ground is reached. Seeing me mount, they all come racing pell-mell after me, hurling stones, and howling insulting epithets after me as a Ferengi, but with smooth road ahead I am, of course, quickly beyond their reach. The villages east of Sultana are observed to be, almost without exception, surrounded by a high mud wall, a characteristic giving them the appearance of fortifications rather than mere agricultural villages. The original object of this was, doubtless, to secure themselves against surprises from wandering tribes, and as the Persians seldom think of changing anything, the custom is still maintained. Bushes are now occasionally observed near the roadside, from every twig of which a strip of rag is fluttering in the breeze. It is an ancient custom still kept up among the Persian peasantry when approaching any place they regard with reverence, as the ruined mosque and imperial palace of Sultana, to tear a strip of rag from their clothing and fasten it to some roadside bush. This is supposed to bring them good luck in their undertakings, and the bushes are literally covered with the variegated offerings of the superstitious riots. Where no bushes are handy, heaps of small stones are indicative of the same belief. Every time he approaches the well-known heap, the peasant picks up a pebble and adds it to the pile. Owing to a late start and a prevailing headwind, but forty-six miles are covered today, when about sundown I seek the accommodation of the Chaparkana at here. But, providing the road continues good, I promise myself to polish off the sixty miles between here and Kasvin tomorrow. The Karpakana sleeping apartments at here contain whitewashed walls and reed matting, and presents an appearance of neatness and cleanliness altogether foreign to these institutions previously patronized. Here, also, first occurs the innovation from Hasheri to Sahib, when addressing me in a respectful manner. It will be Sahib, from this point clear to, through, and beyond India. My various titles through the different countries thus far traversed have been Monsieur, Herr, Effendi, Hamsheri, and now Sahib. One naturally wonders what new surprises are in store ahead. A bountiful supper of scrambled eggs, tokimi morage, is obtained here, and the customary shakedown on the floor. After getting rid of the crowd, I seek my rude couch, and am soon in the land of unconsciousness. An hour afterwards I am wakened by the busy hum of conversation, and behold, in the dim light of a primitive lamp, I become conscious of several pairs of eyes immediately above me, peering with scrutinizing inquisitiveness into my face. Others are examining the bicycle standing against the wall of my head. Rising up, I found the Chapargahana crowded with caravan teamsters who, going past with a large camel caravan from the Caspian seaport of Esch, have heard of the bicycle and come flocking to my room. I can hear the unmelodious clanging of the big sheet iron bells as their long string of camels file slowly past the building. Daylight finds me again on the road, determined to make the best of early morning, ere the stiff easterly wind, which seems inclined to prevail of late, commences blowing great guns against me. A short distance out, I meet a string of some three hundred laden camels that have not yet halted after the night's march. Scores of large camel caravans have been encountered since leaving Esrom, but they have invariably been halting for the day. These camels regard the bicycle with a timid reserve, merely swerving a step or two off their course as I wheel past. They all seem about equally startled, so that my progress down the ranks simply causes a sort of gentle ripple along the line, as though each successive camel were playing a game of follow my leader. The road this morning is nearly perfect for wheeling, consisting of well-trodden camel paths over a hard graveled surface that of itself naturally makes excellent surface for cycling. There is no wind, and twenty-five miles are duly registered by the cyclometer when I halt to eat the breakfast of bread and a portion of yesterday evening's scrambled eggs which I have brought along. On Passeadun and approaching Kasvin, the plain widens to a considerable extent and becomes perfectly level. Apparent distances become deceptive, and objects at a distance assume weird, fantastic shapes. Beautiful mirages hold out their allurements from all directions. The somber walls of villages present the appearance of battlemented fortresses rising up from the mirror-like surface of silvery lakes, and orchards and groves seem shadowy indefinable objects floating motionless above the earth. The telegraph poles traversing the plain in a long straight line until lost to view in the hazy distance appear to be suspended in mid-air. Camels, horses, and all moving objects more than a mile away present the strange obstacle illusion of animals walking through the air many feet above the surface of the earth. Long lines of Kanat mounds traverse the plain in every direction, leading from the numerous villages to distant mountain chains. Descending one of the sloping cavernous entrances before mentioned, for a drink, I am rather surprised at observing numerous fishes disporting themselves in the water, which, on the comparatively level plain, flows but slowly. Perhaps they are an eyeless variety similar to those found in the Mammoth Cave of Kentucky. Still, they get a glimmering light from the numerous perpendicular shafts. 
Flocks of wild pigeons also frequent these underground watercourses, and the peasantry sometimes capture them by the hundreds with nets placed over the shafts. The canats are not bricked archways, but merely tunnels burrowed through the ground. Three miles of loose sand and stones have to be trundled through before reaching Kazvin. Nevertheless, my promised sixty miles are overcome, and I enter the city gate at two p.m. A trundle through several narrow crooked streets brings me to an inner gateway, emerging upon a broad, smooth avenue. A short ride down this brings me to a large enclosure containing the customs house offices and a fine brick caravanserai. Yet another prince appears here in the person of a customs house official. I readily grant the requested privilege of seeing me ride but the title of a Persian prince is no longer associated in my mind with greatness and importance. Princes in Persia are as plentiful as counts in Italy, or barons in Germany. Yet it rather shocks one's dreams of the splendor of oriental royalty to find princes manipulating the keys of a one-wire telegraph control station at a salary of about forty dollars a month, twenty-five tomans, or attending to the prosy duties of a small customs house. Caspine is important as being the halfway station between Tehran and the Caspian port of Esht, and on the highway of travel and commerce between northern Persia and Europe. Added importance is likewise derived from it being the terminus of a broad level road from the capital, and where travelers and the mail from Tehran have to be transferred from wheeled vehicles to the backs of horses for the passage over the rugged passage of the Elberg Mountains leading to the Caspian Slope, or vice versa when going the other way. Locking the bicycle up in a room of the caravanserai, I take a strolling peep at the nearest streets. A couple of the ludis, or professional buffoons, seeing me strolling leisurely about, come hurrying up, one is leading a baboon by a string around the neck, and the other is carrying a gourd drum. Reaching me, the man with the baboon commences making the most ludicrous grimaces and causes the baboon to caper wildly about by jerking the string, while the drummer proceeds to belabor the head of his drum, apparently with the single object of extracting as much noise from it as possible. Putting my fingers to my ears, I turn away. Ten minutes afterwards, I observe another similar combination making a beeline for my person. Waving them off, I continue on down the street, Soon afterwards, yet a third party attempts to secure me for an audience. It is the custom for these strolling buffoons to thus present themselves before persons on the street, and to visit houses wherever there is occasions for rejoicing, as at a wedding, or the birth of a son. The ludis are to Persians what Italian organ grinders are among ourselves. I fancy people give them money chiefly to get rid of their noise and annoyance, as we do to save ourselves from the soul-harrowing tones of a wheezy crank organ beneath the windows. Among the novel conveyances observed in the courtyard of the caravanserai, is a taktroan, a large sedan chair provided with shafts at either end, and carried between two mules or horses. Another is the before-mentioned gajabev, an arrangement not unlike a pair of canvas-covered dog kennels strapped across the back of an animal. These latter contrivances are chiefly used for carrying women and children. After riding around the courtyard several different times for crowds continually coming, I finally conclude that there must be a limit to this sort of a thing anyhow, and refuse to ride again. The newcomers linger around, however, until evening, in the hopes that an opportunity of seeing me ride may present itself. A number of them then contribute a handful of coppers, which they give to the proprietor of a tributary chachkan to offer me as an inducement to ride again. The wily Persians know full well that while a Ferengi would scorn to accept their handful of coppers, he would probably be sufficiently amused at the circumstances to reward their persistence by riding for nothing. Telling the grinning Khaji to pocket the coppers, I favor them with positively the last entertainment this evening. An hour later the Khaji meets me going towards the bazaar in search of something for supper. Inquiring the object of my search, he takes me back to his chachkan, points significantly to an iron kettle simmering on a small charcoal fire, and bids me to be seated. After waiting on a customer or two, and supplying me with tea, he quietly beckons me to the fire, removes the cover, and reveals a savory dish of stewed chicken and onions. This he generously shares with me a few minutes later, refusing to accept any payment. As there are exceptions to every rule, so it appears there are individuals, even among the Persian commercial classes, capable of generous and worthy impulses. True, the Khaji obtained more than the value of the supper and a handful of coppers, but gratitude is generally understood to be an unknown commodity among the subjects of the Shah. Soon the obstreperous cries of Allah Akbar, Allah Ila Allah, from the throats of numbers of the faithful perched among the Karbarasarnary steps, stable roof, and other conspicuous soul-inspiring places, announces the approach of bedtime. My room is actually found to contain a towel and an old toothbrush. The towel has evidently not been laundered for some time, and a public toothbrush is hardly a joy-inspiring object to contemplate. Nevertheless, there are evidences that the proprietor of a Karbarasarnary is possessed of vague, shadowy ideas of a Ferengi's requirements. After a person has dried his face with the slanting sunbeams of early morning, or with his pocket handkerchief for weeks, the bare possibility of soap, towels, etc., awakens agreeable reflections of coming comforts. At seven o'clock on the following morning, I pull out towards Turan, now but six chapar stations distant. 
running parallel with the road is the Elberg range of mountains a lofty chain separating the elevated plateau of central persia from the moist and wooded slopes of the caspian sea south of this great dividing ridge the country is an arid and barren waste a desert in fact save where irrigation redeems here and there a circumscribed area and the mountain slopes are gray and rocky crossing over to the northern side of the divide one immediately finds himself in a moist climate and a country green almost as the british isles with dense boxwood forests covering the slopes of the mountains and hiding the foothills beneath an impenetrable mantle of green the Ellsberg mountains are a portion of a great watershed of central asia extending from the himalayas up through afghanistan and persia into the caucasus and they perform very much the same office for the caspian slope of persia as the sierra nevadas do for the pacific slope of california insomuch as they cause the moisture-laden clouds rolling in from the sea to empty their burdens on the seaward slopes instead of penetrating further into the interior the road continues fair wheeling but nothing compared with the road between zijin and kasvin it is more of an artificial highway the persian government has been tinkering with it improving it considerably in some respects but leaving it somewhat lumpy and unfinished generally and in places it is unridable from sand and loose material on the surface it has the appreciable merit of levelness however and for persia it is a very creditable highway indeed. At four fasuks from Kasvin, I reached the Chaparkahana of Kawanda, where a breakfast is obtained of eggs and tea. These two things are among the most readily obtained refreshments in Persia. The country this morning is monotonous and uninteresting, being for the most part a stony, level plain, sparsely covered with gray camel-thorn shrubs. Occasionally one sees in the distance a camp of Ilions, one of the wandering tribes of Persia. Their tents are smaller and of an entirely different shape from the Kurdish tents, partaking more of the nature of square-built movable huts than tents. These camps are too far off my road to justify paying them a visit, especially as I shall probably have abundant opportunities before leaving the Shah's dominions. But I intercept a straggling party of them crossing the road. They have a more docile look about them than the Kurds, have more the general appearance of gypsies, and they dress but little different from the riots of surrounding villages. At Kishlok, where I obtain a dinner of bread and grapes, I find the cyclometer has registered a gain of 32 miles from Kasvin, it has scarcely been an easy thirty-two miles, for I am again confronted by a discouraging head-breeze. Reaching the Shah Abbas caravanassery of Yang Iman, all first-class caravanasseries are called Shah Abbas caravanasseries, in deference to so many having been built throughout Persia by that monarch. About five o'clock. I conclude to remain here overnight, having wheeled fifty-three miles. Yang Iman is a splendid large brick sarai, the finest I have seen yet in Persia. Many travelers are putting up here and the place presents quite a lively appearance. In the center of the courtyard is a large covered spring. Around this is a garden of rose bushes, pomegranate trees, and flowers. Surrounding the garden is a brick wall, and forming yet a larger square is a carasavanery building itself, consisting of a one-storied brick edifice partitioned off into small rooms. The building is only one room deep, and each room opens upon a sort of covered porch containing a fireplace where a fire can be made and provisions cooked. Attached to the caravanassery, usually beneath the massive and roomy arched gateway, is a tachkan and a small store where bread, eggs, butter, fruit, charcoal, etc., are to be obtained. The traveler hires a room which is destitute of all furniture, provides his own bedding and cooking utensils, purchases provisions and a sufficiency of charcoal, and proceeds to make himself comfortable. In a pinch, one can usually borrow a frying pan or kettle of some kind, and in such first-class caravanasseries as Yang Iman, there is sometimes one furnished room, carpeted and provided with bedding, reserved for the accommodation of travelers of importance. After the customary program of riding to allay the curiosity and excitement of the people, I obtained bread, fruit, eggs, butter to cook them in, and charcoal for a fire, the elements of a very good supper for a hungry traveler. Borrowing a handleless frying pan, I am setting about preparing my own supper when a respectable-looking Persian steps out from the crowd of curious onlookers and voluntarily takes this rather onerous duty out of my hands. Readily obtaining my consent, he quickly kindles a fire and scrambles and fries the eggs. While my volunteer cook is thus busily engaged, a company of distinguished travelers passing along the road halt to the Tachkan to smoke kalyan and drink tea. The caravanessary proprietor approaches me, and winking mysteriously, intimates that by going outside and riding for the edification of the new arrivals, I will be pretty certain to get a present of a kareen, about twenty cents. As he appears anxious to have me accommodate them, I accordingly go out and favor them with a few turns on a level place of ground outside. After they have departed, the proprietor covertly offers me a half kareen piece, in a manner so that everybody can observe him attempting to give me something, without seeing the amount. The wily Persian had doubtless solicited a present from the travelers for me, obtained perhaps a couple of kareens, and watching a favorable opportunity, offers me the half kareen piece. 
the wily ways of these people are several degrees more ingenious even than the dark ways and vain tricks of Bret Hart's heathen Chinese. Occupying one of the rooms are two young noblemen traveling with their mother to visit the governor of Zenja. After I have eaten my supper, they invite me to their apartments for the evening. Their mother has a samovar under full headway and a number of hard-boiled eggs. Her two hopeful sons are engaged in a drinking bout of arak. They are already wildly hilarious and indulging in brotherly embraces and doubtful love songs. Their fond mother regards them with approving smiles as they swallow glass after glass of the raw fiery spirit and become gradually more intoxicated and hilarious. Instead of checking their tippling, as a fond and prudent Ferengi mother would have done, this indulgent parent encourages them, rather than otherwise, and the more deeply intoxicated and hilariously happy the sons become, the happier seems the mother. About nine o'clock they fall to weaving tears of affection for each other and for myself, and degenerate into such maudlin sentimentality generally that I naturally become disgusted, accept a parting glass of tea, and bid them good evening. The caravan arsery assigns me the furnished chamber above referred to. The room is found to be well carpeted, contains a mattress and an abundance of flaming red quilts, and on a small table reposes a well-thumbed copy of the Koran with gilt lettering and illuminated pages. For these really comfortable quarters I am charged the trifling sum of one Koran. I am now within fifty miles of Tehran, my destination until springtime comes around again and enables me to continue on eastward towards the Pacific. The wheeling continues fair, and in the cool of early morning a good headway is made for several miles. As the sun peeps over a summit of a mountain spur jutting southward a short distance from the main Ellsberg range, a wall of air comes rushing from the east as though the sun were making strenuous exertions to usher in the commencement of another day with a triumphant toot. Multitudes of donkeys are encountered on the road, the omnipresent carriers of the Persian peasantry, taking produce to the Tehran market. The only wheeled vehicle encountered between Kasvin and Tehran is a heavily wheeled, cumbersome mail wagon, rattling briskly along behind four galloping horses driven abreast, and a newly imported carriage for some notable of the capital being dragged by hand, a distance of two hundred miles from Resht, by a company of soldiers. Pedaling laboriously against a stiff breeze, I round the jutting mountain spur about eleven o'clock, and the conical snow-crowned peak of Mount Demavend looms up like a beacon light from among the lesser heights of the Eberg Range about seventy-five miles ahead. Demavend is a perfect cone, some twenty thousand feet in height, and is reputed to be the highest point of land north of the Himalayas. From the projecting mountain spur, the road makes a beeline across the intervening plain to the capital. A large willow-fringed irrigating ditch now traverses the stony plain for some distance parallel with the road, supplying the caravanserai of Shahabad and several adjacent villages with water. Tehran itself, being situated on the level plain, and without the tall minarets that render Turkish cities conspicuous from a distance, leaves one undecided as to its precise location until within a few miles of the gate. It occupies a position a dozen or more miles south of the base of the Ellsberg Mountains, and is flanked on the east by another jutting spur. To the southward is an extensive plain sparsely dotted with villages and the walled gardens of the wealthy Tyrannes. At one o'clock on the afternoon of September 30th, the sentinels of the Kasvin Gate of the Shah's capital gaze with unutterable astonishment at the strange spectacle of a lone Ferengi riding towards them astride an airy wheel that glints and glitters in the bright Persian sunbeams. They look still more wonder-stricken and half inclined to think me some supernatural being as, without dismounting, I ride beneath the gaudily covered archway and down the suburban streets. A ride of a mile between dead mud walls and along an open business street, and I find myself surrounded by wandering soldiers and citizens in the great central top haven, or artillery square, and shortly afterwards in endeavoring to eradicate some of the dust and soil of travel in a room of a wretched apology for a hotel kept by a Frenchman, formerly a pastry cook to the Shah. My cyclometer has registered 1,576 miles from Ismant, from Liverpool to Constantinople, where I had no cyclometer, may be roughly estimated at 2,500 making a total from Liverpool to Tehran of 4,076 miles. In the evening, several young Englishmen belonging to the staff of the Indo-European Telegraph Company come round, and re-echoing my own above-mentioned sentiments concerning the hotel, generously invite me to become a member of their comfortable bachelor establishment during my stay in Tehran. How far do you reckon it from London to Tehran by your telegraph line? I inquire of them during our after-supper conversation. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 miles is the reply. What does your cyclometer say? End of section 42. Recording by Todd.